Chapter 21 Ivy Yeah, I remember this. Stone turned the sapphire over in his hands. It was so big, Ivy almost couldn't believe it was real. Violet and Daffodil sat on the bench behind her, wrapped in rough gray blankets, still shivering from the long walk back to Valor in the rain. Azalea had not wanted to let them take the sapphire, but Foxglove and Pine both thought they should show it to Stone, make sure it was part of the dragon's treasure, and then decide what to do with it. Foxglove stood by the door, her arms crossed, shifting uncomfortably from foot to foot. Heath never liked this gem, Stone said. He passed it to Ivy, who was startled by the weight of it in her hands. He said that holding it sometimes gave him strange waking nightmares of the dragons who torched our village. He said sometimes they would look at him as though they could see him. If it's the one thing that makes him feel anything about the dragon attack, that's probably why he left it behind. There was something odd about the sapphire, but it didn't feel menacing to Ivy. It had a kind of quiet vibration to it, as if it was reaching for something on another level of the universe. She cupped it between her hands and stared into its facets. So, if he moved the treasure, where else can we look? Violet asked. Stone shrugged. I have no idea. Sorry. Well, Foxglove said, as Violet and Daffodil got to their feet, if you think of anything, let us know. Violet rolled up the blankets and turned to hand them to Stone. With a brisk knock, the dragon slayer strolled through the front door. Violet threw the blankets at Ivy so fast that Ivy almost didn't catch them. They tumbled around her hands and she scrambled to bury the sapphire inside the folds of wool. Her heart was pounding. I hope he didn't see it. What's this? Her father said with a pleasant smile. A wing watcher party at my brother's house. Why wasn't I invited? Hi, Dad, she said, clutching the blankets to her chest. We were just stopping by to say hi to Uncle Stone. Heath's gaze traveled over Violet's innocent face, Daffodil's wide eyes, Foxglove's blank expression. Oh, he said. Why are you all... wet? It's raining, Violet answered. We were surprised by a storm while we were out skygazing, Foxglove reported. We came in the closest entrance. Ivy suggested that her uncle lived nearby and we could dry off here. Heath raised his eyebrows at her. You haven't dried off much, he observed. I was more concerned for the young recruits, Foxglove said. I've been caught in the rain before. I'll be fine. Holly, right? He said, pointing at her. Foxglove, sir, she said, as politely as always. Hmm, he said. Ivy, use one of those blankets on your hair. You are dripping all over your uncle's cave. And then get on home. I need to speak with my brother. Ivy took a nervous step toward the door. Stone was standing with his hands in his pockets, looking resigned to a conversation with Heath. He looked too morose to say anything helpful. We'll wash these and bring them back to you, Mr. Ivy's uncle, sir, Daffodil said, patting the pile of blankets in Ivy's arms. Thanks very much. Yes, thanks, Uncle Stone, Ivy said, relieved. She hurried to the door. Fox glove, the dragon slayer said, and a chill went through Ivy. She could hear the threat of anger under his pleasant tone, even though it was well buried. Perhaps it would be wise to confine the younger recruits, and yourself, to the tunnels for the foreseeable future. If you can't recognize when a storm is on its way, while you're literally staring at the sky, it seems you might all need a little more training. He stepped up behind Ivy and lifted a strand of her wet hair. We can't have the daughter of the dragon slayer getting sick, after all. Yes, sir, Foxglove said. She held the door as the three girls went through, nodded to the dragon slayer, and followed them out. Yikes, Daffodil said when they reached a safe distance. I thought that was the end of everything. I was starting to wonder if I'd have time to pack before we got thrown out of valor. I'm sorry, Ivy said. She didn't know how to shield her friends if her father's anger turned on them. 
Don't be, Foxglove said, looping one arm around Ivy's shoulder and squeezing her. You have nothing to be sorry about. We know more than we did at the beginning of the day. And we have something. She took the pile of blankets with the sapphire hidden inside. I'll find a place for this. And I guess I'll wash these. Daffodil, since you volunteered, if you'd like to come help me do that tomorrow, I would appreciate it. I will, Daffodil said. They split off from Foxglove at the next tunnel and headed back toward Ivy's cave. Violet still hadn't said a word since leaving Stone's cave. Violet, are you all right? Ivy asked. Just thinking, Violet said. Was he really mad about you getting a little wet? Or why did he order us confined to the caves? So Violet had noticed Heath's anger too. Do you think he suspects? Ivy whispered. If he saw the sapphire, he would have taken it from us, wouldn't he? I don't think it was about the treasure, Violet said thoughtfully. I think he didn't like seeing wing watchers with stone. Maybe he's worried his brother will try to steal his position as Lord of Valor. No way. Uncle Stone isn't at all interested in that, Ivy said. But the dragon slayer is clearly feeling threatened by something, said Violet. I think I'd better tell the wing watchers to be extra careful for a while. Even if they just roll their eyes at me and say, nobody is up to anything, Violet, buzz off, like they normally do. Do we have to be extra careful too? Daffodil asked with a dramatic sigh. I hate being extra careful. Have you literally ever tried, even once in your life? Violet asked. What about our plan? Ivy interjected. To fix everything. What do we do about it now? She didn't want to give up, especially now that she'd seen the village. If dragons were still doing that to other villages, she would do anything to get the treasure back and stop them. Well, Violet said, if seeing Pine in the old village spooked him into moving the treasure, it stands to reason he'd have moved it closer to him. Somewhere he could keep an eye on it all the time. She gestured at the tunnels around them. Somewhere down here. So we keep looking, Daffodil said. Don't worry, Ivy. We'll find it. It was several days before Ivy found herself alone at home again. Her father seemed to be lurking around more than usual, eyeing her with either suspicion or concern. He was short-tempered with her mother and grumbled about everything, the fish stew, the temperature of the cave, all the whining people kept doing about tunnels collapsing and vegetable shortages, like it was his fault the architects and gardeners were so lazy. Ivy noticed that he'd also added several men to his private guard, all of them brawny and surly and devoted to the dragon slayer. She saw a few wing watchers be summoned individually to his office, and she wondered whether that meant they were loyal to him or whether they were the ones he most suspected of fomenting rebellion. One day at breakfast, Ivy's father announced that he had to go on an inspection tour of the orchards. Something about pests eating all the fruit, he muttered. Don't know what they think I'm going to do about it. He snorted and looked at Ivy's mother. Wing watcher training is suspended for today, so a patrol can accompany us. So you should stay home with Ivy, Lark. Mother gave him a puzzled, dismayed look. But I have that meeting with the gardeners, she protested. We're working on a new solution to the sunlight problem. You'll have to miss it, he said, standing up. Ivy can stay home by herself, dear, she said. She's 14. She's almost a full wing watcher. Yes, I know, he said, frowning. Still, stay together for today. I'd feel safer if you did. I could go to Daffodils while Mother has her meeting, Ivy suggested. No, no, he said. You spend quite enough time with those girls. Both of you, here, and don't leave until I return. Heath, Mother protested but he was already striding out the door. She stared after him for a moment with a bewildered expression. Watching her, Ivy realized that there was something different about her mother's face, something missing. The dreamy look, she thought. The hero worship eyes she used to give dad all the time, same as most everyone in Valor. I haven't seen her look at him like that in a while. When did that change? 
She tried to think back to when the bedtime story stopped, or to some of the fights her parents had had in the last few years. Was it possible her mom had started noticing dad's lies too? Had she realized, somewhere along the way, that he was not as much of a hero as she'd first believed? Ivy knew her mother loved working on projects to improve valor. Now that she thought about it, those projects had been taking up a lot more of her time in the last few years, as though Lark was happy to stay busy and away from Heath. It's probably good for Mom to see him more clearly, she thought. But they're my parents. I still want them to love each other. No, what I really want, she admitted to herself, is for Dad to be the person that Mom and I thought he was. Her mother was still staring at the door, frowning in a puzzled way. Mom, why is Dad acting so weird? Ivy asked. He's got a lot on his mind, her mother said, looking down at the table. She started to clear the breakfast things, and Ivy stood up to help her. So do you, Ivy said gently. Your work on the gardens is really important, too. I do think it is. Her mother stopped and took a deep breath. Right now, your father is worried that something might happen to us. There's a man, a very powerful man, who's been trying for years to get your father to come work for him. Really? Ivy said. Who? What does he want Dad to do? Slay dragons, of course, her mother said ruefully. He's the lord of the indestructible city. Oh, wow, Ivy thought. She'd heard of the indestructible city, but she didn't know anything about its lord. What would it be like if they all moved there and Heath became a professional dragon slayer? Would he lead the lord's armies against the dragons? Dad would never work for anyone else. He likes being lord himself too much and he doesn't want to fight any more dragons. He'd rather hide from them. Anyway, the last couple of messengers have been more persistent than the ones before. Your father is worried about what they might do. I think he's afraid they might even kidnap one of us. Ivy wondered if that was exactly true, or whether that was her mother's own interpretation of Heath's concerns. I think he'd be more worried a kidnapper would ask for the treasure as ransom. Would he give it to them? In exchange for either of us. Not to mention all the unrest and valor, Lark sighed. So many angry people, all wanting your father to fix everything. Well, it would certainly help if he tried to fix something at least, Ivy thought. She glanced sideways at her mother as they washed the dishes. I think you should go to that meeting, Mom. If you're not there, the gardeners will only get more angry with Dad. But if you are, maybe you can help fix things. I promise I'll stay here with the door locked. Her mother pushed her hair out of her face, leaving a damp streak on her forehead. She gazed at the door, looking worried. I wouldn't be gone long, she said. It is pretty important. If I go, do you think we could keep it between ourselves? Of course, Mom. Ivy said, giving her a hug. Go save the vegetables. All right. Yes, I will. Thank you, Ivy. Her mother smiled and hurried off to change. Ivy finished cleaning up, wondering if this was the first time she'd ever seen her mother disobey one of her father's orders, or if it had happened before without her noticing. She hoped it wasn't a terrible mistake to encourage her mom to go. She hoped Dad wouldn't find out and be furious but it didn't seem fair that her mother had to miss a meeting she cared about just because he was feeling paranoid when Ivy could certainly look after herself. Almost as soon as her mother was gone, there was a knock on the door. Ivy checked the peephole, but she already knew it was Violet and Daffodil. I was just trying to figure out how to send a message to you, Ivy said, opening the door. No need, Daffodil said, sweeping in grandly. We've been watching and waiting for ages for them both to be gone. Everyone focus, Violet said. She had her hair back in a dark purple band of cloth and was wearing gray instead of her wing watcher uniform, but she still looked like she was ready to take over Commander Brooks' job the moment it was available. We're going to search every corner of this place, but we have to do it fast. I've already searched every corner, Ivy protested. I really have. 
We're doing it again, Violet said, striding purposefully toward the Dragon Slayer's office. Properly this time, was strongly implied. I need a snack first, Daffodil said. We'll catch up to you. Violet rolled her eyes and disappeared into the next cave. Guess what? Daffodil whispered to Ivy, pulling her into the kitchen. Forrest asked me to be his date to the Wing Watchers dance. Oh, wow, Ivy said. She'd completely forgotten about the Wing Watchers dance. Yay. Yay, right? That's exciting, isn't it? It is, Daffodil said, except that Violet will be a huge pain in the butt about it. She took an apple from the barrel in the corner and started cutting it into slices. You haven't told her? Obviously I will, Daffodil said, but I was thinking I'd wait until the very last minute, just to minimize the amount of time I have to spend hearing about how all boys are gross and he's the worst, and couldn't I do better, and so on forever and so forth. She took the plate of apple slices into Ivy's living room, but stopped short in the entrance way. Speaking of gross, she said, flourishing one hand at the tail barb on its pedestal. How do you live with that thing? I avoid it, Ivy admitted. I'll walk all the way around the tables to get past it. Daffodil's eyes suddenly went wide. So, she said slowly, hypothetically, when you were searching the whole place, did you avoid it then too? Ivy gasped. Of course she had. She hadn't even thought about it. She avoided it instinctively. She'd never once lifted the tapestry draped over the pedestal to see what was underneath. Violet, Daffodil shouted. A few moments later, they had folded the tapestry over the glass box and the tail barb, revealing the huge wooden cabinet that formed the pedestal. It was definitely a cabinet, because it had a door, but there was no keyhole. Instead, there was a series of tumblers embedded in the wood, with letters inscribed on them. It's a combination lock, Violet said. We have to line up the letters to spell the right word in order to get it open. Wait, Ivy said, as Daffodil reached for the first tumbler. Let me memorize what it is right now, so we can put it back the way it was before Dad comes home. She studied the letters, her heart beating wildly. What could it be? Violet mused. Four letters. Maybe a word that means something to him? Try Lark, Ivy suggested. My mom's name. Daffodil lined up Lark, but that didn't work. Slay, Violet suggested. Tail, Barb? They tried all three. No luck. What about something no one would expect? Daffodil said. Like book or love. Violet snorted, but she tried both of them. Shockingly, terrible guesses, she said, when neither worked. I am thinking outside the box, Violet, Daffodil said. Claw, Ivy said. Wing, fire. They tried every dragon-related word they could think of, and then all the treasure-related ones, like gold and gems and rich. Anyone might guess one of those, Violet said. It has to be something more specific to him, doesn't it? Oh, Ivy said softly. I know. Try Rose. She held her breath as Daffodil clicked the letters around. R-O-S-E. The lost sister who he must think about every time he saw his treasure. He must wonder if it had been worth it, losing her in exchange for this. Daffodil tugged on the door. It did not open. Whoa, she said, blinking up at Ivy and Violet. I really thought that would be it. That would be the perfect password. Like a sign that your dad does have a soul after all. Hey now, Ivy said. He has a soul. Sometimes he's really funny or does something thoughtful for mom. He's not completely evil. Try evil, Violet suggested. Violet, Ivy said, rolling her eyes but she was secretly relieved when that word didn't work either. Maybe I-V-S, Violet said. Like, all this will be Ivy's one day? That didn't work either. 
Ivy would have been enormously surprised if it had. She didn't think she was that present in her father's thoughts. Besides, he wouldn't think of the treasure as something that would belong to anyone else ever. The way he talked about it, the way he loved it, it was his, and he wouldn't ever give it up. Maybe try mine, she said. As in, this treasure is all mine. The letters clicked into place, and the cabinet door swung open. Yeesh, not to be judgy, Violet said, but that's an upsetting choice of password. Oh, my stars, Daffodil whispered, staring into the cabinet. Ivy crouched beside her and saw that it was packed, top to bottom, with piles of gold coins, gemstones, and a dragon carved from blue stone with emeralds for eyes. We found it, she said. Now quick, lock it up again. Can't I touch it? Daffodil said wistfully. No, Ivy's right, Violet agreed. Leave everything the way it was. Before we take the treasure, we need to work out the rest of the plan, Ivy said. How to give it back to the dragons. And survive, Violet finished. Chapter 22 Leaf Leaf yelled and fought and pounded on the dragon's claws, but the dragon only glanced down at him and made a low, chuckling kind of noise. Whoa. This one's face was totally different, kind of square and flat on top, and it was brown, the warm, tree-bark brown of Ren's eyes. Its eyes were brown, too, and more human than any other dragons he'd seen before. If it wasn't the silliest thought Leaf had ever had, he might say the dragon's eyes were twinkling at him. Also, the last two dragons had held Leaf tight and carelessly, like a squirmy, annoying carrot. This one carried him cupped in both hands, the way Wren used to carry baby rabbits out of the garden so no one would catch them and kill them. What the heck kind of dragon are you? Leaf shouted. I'm not scared of you. If you eat me... I will kick out your teeth and poke your guts and make you generally miserable. I'm going to be a dragon slayer, you hear me? It's my destiny, so you can't eat me, because that's not my destiny. So the brown dragon reached the top of the cliff and landed awkwardly on its back talons. Using its wings for balance, it crouched and opened its claws, setting Leaf down behind a boulder with astonishing gentleness. Leaf's legs almost gave out underneath him. He stared up at the dragon, blinking in confusion. It, it looked like it was smiling. Dragons don't smile, do they, Ren? Rumble, 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 the dragon said. It's talking to me. The dragon pointed off into the mountains, nudged Leaf gently with one claw, and then turned and flew back into the palace through the hole in the roof of the central hall. Leaf had to sit down. He covered his face with his hands and tried to think. Did that dragon just help me? Why didn't it eat me? What was it trying to say? It looked like it knew I was escaping. Like, that's what it wanted me to do. Why would a dragon help me escape? He couldn't figure it out. There was no reason for that dragon to catch him and then let him go. Did it really see him climbing, figure out that he needed help, and decide to lift him to the top of the cliff? It could have eaten him in a heartbeat. It should have eaten him. Surely any other dragon would have eaten him, or left him to fall and die. Was that dragon weird? Or are there actually lots of friendly, helpful dragons in the world, just living side by side with the murderous person-eating ones? He'd been sitting there for a little while, trying to wrap his head around this idea and recover from the climb and the shock when four dragons burst out of the roof hole nearby. They looked like the ones he'd seen before, one coppery and wreathed in smoke, one blue and scowling, and the kind brown one, plus one more, this one much bigger and red, with a burn scar on its face. Leaf hid in the shadow of the boulder as they soared into the sunlight and then away, back down over the cliff he'd been climbing. Kind brown one indeed. 
It probably just has indigestion today. That would explain the expression that looked like a smile. It was full, and its stomach hurt, so it let me go. Dragons can't be kind. They can't be sympathetic or helpful, and they can't possibly see us as anything but prey. Right? Wren? She was uncharacteristically silent, as though even the imaginary voice in his head was confused by the situation. Maybe the brown dragons were different from the others? Maybe they were vegetarians, or only ate crocodiles or something. I'll ask Rowan, he whispered to Wren. That's a good idea, right? That was a decision that would stop him from thinking in circles anymore, and one that would make him get up and go find his big sister. He was worried that his shoulders couldn't take any more climbing, but it turned out to be a lot easier to climb down into the palace than to climb out. There were columns along the top balcony that rose up to the roof, so once he shimmied onto one of those, he could slide down to the floor of the balcony fairly smoothly. The top level seemed to be deserted. He could hear dragons roaring in the distance and muttering from the levels below. But up here, each room was empty, looking as though the inhabitants had left in a hurry. It was very unsettling to stand on a balcony with no railing, looking out over a long drop to the distant ground. Leaf glanced over the edge and thought he saw a dead dragon lying at the bottom, but there were other dragons milling around down there, so he wasn't sure. He began the long walk through the tunnels, spiraling down and down through the palace. This is weird, Wren, he whispered. I drew these hallways so many times. I remember marking this throne room up here. He hesitated a few steps from the doorway. Something was in there stumbling around, knocking into things. It was kind of growl groaning, a noise of pain and rage combined. Leaf crept forward until he was close enough to peek inside. The dragon queen was in there alone, leaning over her throne, breathing heavily. Something was wrong with her face, from what he could see of it. Even in silhouette, it wasn't quite the right shape anymore. The blueprint hadn't noted how much gold there was in the throne room. It was all over the walls and floor and throne, like someone had painted it on in thick, wild strokes. Leaf thought it looked terrible, but he knew Rowan and Grove and Time would have loved it. The queen groaned again and collapsed in a heap on the floor before her throne. Someone attacked her, he guessed. Well, that's good. With what, I wonder? He could probably manage to stab her now, while she was unconscious and injured. Yes, stab her in the face, Wren suggested, with gruesome enthusiasm. Oh, now you have something to say? Well, I don't have a sword, he reminded her. And I think it would be pretty dishonorable to kill an unconscious dragon. The Wren in his head rolled her eyes. Dragons don't care about honor. You are such a moose breath. Some dragons might care about honor, he thought, remembering the brown dragon. Shush, I'm trying to be stealthy here. Leaf was about to race across the open space of the doorway when something moved in the sky outside. He crouched and froze as five sand dragons soared into the throne room, including the massively gigantic one who'd been with the queen the night before. That one pointed at the unconscious queen and growled in order. The other four went to pick her up, their wings and tails tangling as they figured out how to share her weight. And then the five sand dragons flew out again, carrying the queen of the mountain dragons with them. I was right, Leaf thought. The sand dragons must have attacked the mountain dragons. Well, at least someone is probably going to stab her in the face then. Wren said cheerfully. This might be a good time for a daring rescue, while everyone is going, Ack! Betrayal! Where is our queen? Yes, yes. Leaf darted across, ran down another curve of the balcony, and turned into a tunnel that, if he remembered right, led to the kitchens. He did remember right. The kitchens, unfortunately, were not deserted, but all the hustle and bustle of the previous night had been swallowed by a weird aura of disaster. 
Half-prepared food was scattered across the tables and countertops. A pig was burning on a spit over a fire, charred almost entirely black on one side. Dragons stood in small clusters around the huge room, talking to one another in hushed growls. Leaf edged along the wall, behind barrels and piles of animal skins. At one point, he nearly ran into a mouse as tall as his knee. It looked up at him, squeaked something indignant. This is my thieving ground, you scoundrel, the wren voice suggested, and stalked away with a cross expression. Soon he found the pit, which appeared to be unguarded. He couldn't see any rope nearby, but there was a nearly empty sack of potatoes half its size. If he pulled on one of the loose threads, yes, it spooled out into a long, winding puddle, nearly as thick as a regular human rope. He dragged it over to the grate, tied one end to the metal, and dropped the other down into the hole. He couldn't see the bottom very clearly, and he didn't dare call out to Rowan in case it caught the attention of the kitchen dragons. He just had to hope they'd see the rope and start climbing it. But they wouldn't fit through the holes in the grate, so he'd have to get the trapdoor open, and it was locked with a padlock. He shook it hopelessly for a moment. Was there anything he could use to pick it? Gribble? Leaf dropped the padlock and leaped back. A tiny, tiny dark red dragon with a long neck and sparkling eyes was staring at him from under the nearest table. It was the first dragon Leaf had ever seen who was smaller than him. Maybe I could fight that one, he thought ruefully. You promised to kill a dragon, Wren scolded him. That is barely a gecko. A gecko with very sharp teeth, Leaf pointed out. Brrr, the dragon chirped. It dropped its front half in an about-to-pounce position, looking like the wild dogs around Talisman as they tried to play with one another. Shh, Leaf whispered. Go away. Blurp, 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 the baby dragon yodeled. It cavorted around the grate, as if it was nervous to step on the holes. Blurp, rubble, frrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrr
He ran over and unlocked the padlock, dragging it aside. The trap door was too heavy to open all the way, but he was able to lever it up enough to brace with a few potatoes, and that left to crack just wide enough for Rowan, then Cranberry to crawl through. And then, right behind them, time. You survived, Leaf whispered in awe. I can't believe you survived, Time whispered back. Nor us, Cranberry chimed in. They sent us to the arena this morning, Leaf. We had to fight a blue dragon and a black dragon, and I came this close to stabbing the black one in the eye. Rowan was amazing. You should have seen her. Rowan enveloped Leaf in a fierce bear hug that went on remarkably long. Rowan was not a hugger. He couldn't remember any other time when she'd ever hugged him. On the other hand, he'd just saved her life, so it made sense that she'd be a little pleased about that. Cardinal, he asked over her shoulder. Arbutus, are they coming? Cranberry shook her head, twisting one of her braids around her fingers. They were in the arena too, she said. They didn't make it. It was the worst thing I've ever seen, Rowan said, finally releasing Leaf. She did look shaken, even more so than she had after the dragon mancers threatened Grove. But we're alive, he said. We're all right, Rowan. We can still escape. Come on, I think I remember where one of the entrances to the trash chute is from here. Leaf, Rowan said, gripping his shoulders. I have to tell you something. Her eyes were as serious as the day she'd told him about the dragon slayer. Now? Leaf asked. Couldn't we escape the palace full of hungry dragons first? Give us a moment, Rowan said to her friends. She tugged a leaf behind the potato sack and turned to face him, but in a weird way, like she couldn't quite hold eye contact with him. Her hands kept twitching, like she'd forgotten where to put them. Rowan? Leaf prompted her, when she didn't say anything for a moment. Last night, Rowan said in a rush. I realized that I might never see you again. I realized that you might die, or I might die, and you would never know the truth. The truth? Goosebumps trailed along Leaf's arms. What? What truth? About Wren. Rowan glanced into his eyes, and then back down at the flagstones. The kitchen felt much colder than a dragon kitchen should be. She wasn't just accidentally eaten by dragons, Leaf. She was sacrificed. Oh, dear, said the wren in Leaf's head. I don't think we're going to like this story. It was the dragon mancers, Rowan went on quickly. They said they had a vision, and she needed to be given to the dragons in order to protect the town. But it was my fault, Leaf. Your fault? Do you remember those books she stole from the dragon mancer's private collection? Leaf nodded. He remembered Wren sneaking off to read them and telling him how smart she would be when she'd finished them and how they had lots of boring parts. She was hiding them in my loft, Rowan went on, and reading them whenever mother and father were out. She didn't care if I knew she had them. And then mother found one while you guys were at school, and she was so mad, and she thought I'd taken it, so I told her it wasn't me. I, I told her it was Wren. Rowan rubbed her face with both hands. I thought she'd be normal punished, you know? The way she usually was. I mean, I knew it was bad, but I had no idea the dragon mancers would, that they'd decide she was so much trouble they had to get rid of her. For reading their books? Leaf said numbly. They fed a seven-year-old to the dragons for that? Such upstanding civilized people, Wren said. Thank goodness we have moral giants like that leading our village. I tried to stop them, Rowan said. When I found out what they were going to do, I yelled at our parents. I threw a few things, but I should have done more. They locked me in the cellar when they took her. I should have figured out a way to escape and help her. You would have. Leaf was still thinking about the punishment compared to the crime. Maybe they were trying to shut her up, he said. She must have read something in the books that they didn't want anyone to know. He racked his brain. Had she told him anything? He'd been eight, 
and not at all interested in the scribblings inside a moldy book. He remembered her saying there was a lot of math in it. That couldn't be right. That didn't sound like a secret at all. I'm sorry, Leaf, Rowan said. He looked up at her, and it suddenly hit him that she'd been lying to him for seven years. Her and Grove, they both had. Every time he talked about Wren, they had stuck to the lie. Rowan had let him blame the dragons. She had let him build his whole life around blaming the dragons, even though she knew all along who the real villains were. The dragon mancers, and mother and father, who let this happen. Did you ever really care about slaying dragons? He asked. Getting justice for Ren? Protecting the village? He took a deep breath. The kitchen smelled like onions and burnt pig and betrayal. Or did you only spend all that time training me because you wanted help to steal treasure? I mean, she kind of shrugged. Both? Two birds with one stone? It was still the dragons who ate her after all. We can be mad at them and at the dragon mancers, can't we? But you were using me, and the way I felt about losing Ren, he said. You let me hate the dragons because it made me more useful to you. His destiny was crumbling like sand around him. He wanted to press it all back together and be himself again, the person he'd imagined he'd be one day, slaying dragons and saving the world. Simple and uncomplicated. Bad guys with scales and claws over there, good guys who were human over here. No, Rowan cried. I thought I was helping you. I saw how upset you were. I wanted to give you a way to fight back. But against the wrong bad guy, Leaf cried. I could have spent all this time trying to stop the dragon mancers instead. They're the ones endangering the village. He took a step back. The room felt like it was expanding and contracting around him. That's why you believed they would sacrifice Grove. Because you know they've done it before. Were there others? Before Ren? I think so, Rowan said. I remember one of their apprentices being sacrificed when I was really little. They didn't say why. Just another vision. The dragons demanded it, all that. And you let me go work for them. Leaf said. He crouched, burying his face in his hands. All he could think of was little Wren and how she must have felt. Did she know that mother and father had let her be sacrificed? Did she think Leaf had known too? Did she think he didn't care? Did she go to the dragons feeling completely abandoned by everyone? Poor me, Wren whispered sadly. Time poked his head around the edge of the potato sack. You know, we could still go steal treasure, he whispered. Not a good moment, time, Rowan snapped. I'm just saying, now that we're free and inside the palace, if we're quiet and avoid the dragons, there's treasure everywhere. We have to bring something back to save Grove anyway, right? Leaf could sense Rowan glancing at him, but he didn't look up. He couldn't even imagine thinking about treasure right now. He didn't know what to do next. He couldn't go back to the village. He couldn't face his parents or the dragon mancers again, knowing what he knew. But what was he supposed to do with this handful of sand that used to be his great destiny? You're right, Time, Rowan said finally. We have to steal treasure to save Grove. We'll give the dragon mancers enough to free him, and then we can keep the rest for ourselves. Leaf snorted and stood up. That's not going to work, he said. The dragon mancers are murderers and thieves, and obviously, they'll kill to keep their secrets. If you go back to them, they'll still sacrifice Grove, and you as well. And no one is going to stop them, just like no one tried to save Wren. Rowan wrapped her arms around herself. You'd stop them, she said. I'm not going back to Talisman, Leaf said. You can steal treasure and walk back into the dragon mancer's trap yourselves, if that's what you really want to do. You don't need me for that. Leave? Cranberry said from behind him. You're not even going to help us steal the treasure? Time asked. I never wanted to steal treasure, Leave said. I came to kill a dragon, 
and instead, I learned that it's almost impossible. You also learned that some dragons might be good, and some sisters might be liars, and that maybe your whole destiny plan was wrong all along, Ren pointed out. Then where are you going to go? Cranberry asked, putting one hand on his arm. Leaf thought for a moment, but the answer had been ricocheting around his brain ever since he tried to stab the dragon and his sword bounced off. There was one person out there who was a real hero. One person who could tell Leaf the truth and help him find a destiny that would be worthy of Ren. He met Rowan's eyes. I'm going to find the dragon slayer. Part 3 Chapter 23 Ren It was amazing that Ren hadn't been eaten by a dragon yet. Or bitten by a scorpion. Or that she hadn't just fallen over on the sand and let the sun burn her into bleached white bones. She had certainly been walking through the big, hot, horrible desert long enough for any of those things to have happened. First, she had tried to follow the army and Sky to their fight with the ice dragons. They had gone west from the dragon city, so she went west, even though she lost sight of their flashing wings within minutes. But she remembered the vague maps she'd studied. The ice kingdom was this way and north. If she kept going, she'd reach it, eventually. Maybe she could rescue Sky while all the dragons were distracted with their battle. She didn't know how many days later it was, but she had just reached a stretch of rocky ground that wasn't sand anymore when she looked up to see the whole battalion flying back south again. What? she shouted as they whipped past without noticing her. I just got here. She thought she caught a glimpse of Sky flying with them, but she was sure she recognized that arrogant giant who was leading them and his stupid bellowing laugh. She ran after them as long as she could, but soon they banked east and sailed into the clouds, and no matter how fast she ran, they were quickly out of sight. Arr! She screamed, grabbing tufts of the thin, spiky grass from between the rocks and tearing it up but she didn't have time to be furious. She guessed they were angling back toward the Dragon City, so that was where she had to go too. It's good news, she muttered to herself, stamping through the sand in the middle of the chilly desert night. Sky will be easier to rescue from the city than from the sand palace. Also, she knew where the city was, and she could get there by following the coast until she reached the river. She had no idea where the palace was, out in the vast desert somewhere, presumably. But when she reached the city, there was no sign of the obnoxious general, or his army, or Sky. Ren spent a couple of nights sneaking around and eavesdropping until she confirmed her worst fear. They'd landed here for a day and then flown off to the palace. In the Dragon City, she felt like one of the mice that used to invade her parents' kitchen, vanishing into the walls the moment the torches were lit leaving little tracks through the flour and holes nibbled out of the bread. It was easy to find food and restock her supplies. Everything the dragons ate was so big, they wouldn't even notice if she took a fig here, a quarter of a biscuit there. But what she could not seem to find was a map to the queen's palace, or any kind of map of the whole desert kingdom. She wasn't sure if she was looking in the wrong places, or whether the sand dragons didn't bother to have one because they figured anyone could just fly over the desert and find it easily. Should she stay and keep looking for a map? Or should she march out into the desert and hope she ran into the palace eventually? Days were passing, and poor Sky needed help, and she felt a kind of agony in her chest when she thought about it. But it wouldn't help him if she got lost in the desert and died out there. Rushing off was what she wanted to do, but it wasn't the smartest plan. If only I had wings, I could fly there in a heartbeat. Around the fifth time Ren had that thought, it was followed suddenly by another. What if I got wings? What if I kidnapped a dragon? She was hiding in the attic of a storehouse, where she'd been sleeping during the day on one of the grain sacks. She crawled over to the window and looked down at the dragons hurrying through the streets below. 
what if I could get a dragon alone and convince it to take me to the palace? That would give her speed and a map, in a sense, assuming she found someone who knew how to get there. So how do I convince one? With something sharp and pointy? Skye would tell her to ask nicely. He'd be quite sure that any dragon would love to help her out. He'd have to be reminded about the part where most of them would rather eat her for lunch. But there must be others like Skye. Dragons with hearts. Dragons who might listen for a moment before munching on me. I just have to find one. That night, she stole a weapon, just in case. It was probably a practice sword or a dagger for a dragonette. For most dragons, it would be tiny. But for her, it was the size of a real sword and rather heavy. It took her half the night to figure out a way to tie it to her back so she could pull it out quickly if she needed it, but it would also be mostly out of the way. And then she started stalking dragons. She couldn't approach one in the center of the city, even at night. If she found one alone, it would only take one yell for it to summon a whole bunch of friends. She was up for threatening one dragon by itself, not a large group. So she worked her way to the outskirts, looking for relatively deserted spaces and hapless solitary dragons. Two days later, she found her mark. The best part about him was that he was clearly trying to avoid attention. The second best thing was that he was reading a scroll when she spotted him, which seemed like a good sign. A dragon who was a reader was probably smart and thoughtful and not the sort of fellow who would gobble a person before hearing what they had to say. Ren had been exploring an alley that led out of the city, past some abandoned houses with sad little black and yellow flags fluttering out front. Her theory was that the dragons who had lived here had gone off to war and not come back. The alley opened into a courtyard, shaded by fruit trees and smelling of lemons. Under one of the trees, a black dragon was curled up, reading a scroll. Ren crouched behind a planter and watched him for a while. She hadn't seen any other black dragons in the city. In fact, she'd hardly seen any at all in her travels with Skye. She guessed there was a group of them living somewhere secret, but she'd studied her map and wasn't sure where. This one had a pouch around his neck and a scattering of silver scales that twinkled under his wings like stars. Occasionally, he'd look up from the scroll and check the sky, then sigh and go back to reading. Ren wondered if she was just imagining that he looked lonely. Maybe he'd also lost his best friend somewhere. She heard a dragon approaching along the alley, so she swung herself into the planter and then up the tree to hide among the bright yellow lemons and glossy dark green leaves. The black dragon heard the footsteps too. He rolled up his scroll and did an interesting fade back into the shadows where he closed his wings, hiding the silver scales, and stood so still in a dark spot that even Wren could barely see him, despite having her eyes fixed on him. He's being careful. Whoever he's waiting for, he wants to make sure this is the right dragon before showing himself. A sand dragon hurried into the courtyard. She kept looking left and right and up, as though someone might pounce on her from anywhere. She had a sly, furtive way of moving and a few frostbite scars along her tail. The black dragon emerged from the shadows and bowed his head slightly to acknowledge her. Here, she said thrusting a small scroll into the black dragon's talons. New assignment. Hello to you too, he said. He broke the seal on the scroll and unrolled it. We are not here for chit-chat, she hissed. If you have any questions, send them the usual way. But you shouldn't. They said it's pretty straightforward. The black dragon was staring at the scroll, as though it had personally disappointed him. This is... Quite a serious assignment, he said. Are they sure that's what they want? It must be, she snapped. I'm just the messenger. And you're just the, she said a word that Ren had never heard before. Let's both do our jobs and not be annoying about it. Wait, he said, as she turned to go. Have you heard anything about where the dragonettes might be heading next? 
Ice Kingdom is the rumor, she said. Two, some things. Down, one left to meet, I guess. Maybe they'll freeze to death and save you some trouble. She chuckled and slithered away before the black dragon could ask anything else. He sat down slowly, studying the message. Ren was pretty sure she recognized his expression. That was the face Sky made when he'd been told to do something, and he was trying to figure out a clever way around it. Like if she said, Sky, stop giving our best nuts to the chipmunks. I need them to survive the winter too. And then he'd make that face, and she'd have to clarify that he could also not give them to any squirrels, and in fact, to please not give away any of the food she'd gathered to animals with adorable, pathetic eyes. Poor Sky. She wondered what he was doing right that moment, and whether there were any chipmunks or snails wherever he was. I have to act now. This is the dragon I want, and he's completely alone here. Just be brave, Ren. He probably won't eat you immediately. Talk fast, be convincing, and if that doesn't work, be scary. Here goes nothing. She slid down from the tree and marched across the courtyard up to the dragon's feet. The black dragon glanced up from the scroll and leaped back at the sight of her, but he didn't immediately bite her head off, so this was already going very well. Listen up, she growled in dragon. I need your help. The black dragon's eyes went very, very wide. He slowly pivoted his head around to check behind him for another dragon. Stop that, she barked. Look at me. It's me. I'm the one speaking dragon. He swiveled his head all the way back to stare at her. I'm in a hurry, she said. Take me to the desert palace. Please, she added, thinking of how Sky would have asked. He'd made a special point of teaching her that particular word in dragon. This is impossible. Scavengers don't speak dragon, the dragon said, in his rather elegant voice. His accent was different from Skye's, and a little harder to follow. Obviously, I do, she snapped. Scavengers, he explained, as though she might be a misinformed hallucination. Generally go squeak, 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 and then fall over and die, in my experience. Well, of the two of us here, who do you think knows more about scavengers? She asked, using the dragon word for humans. Listen, I don't have time to fall over and die. My friend is in trouble, and I need you to take me to him. If your friend was taken to the desert palace, the black dragon said, actually looking sympathetic, he has already been eaten by now. My friend is a dragon, Ren shouted making him jump. So, unless there are cannibals there, he's still alive, but trapped, and wondering where I am. She didn't know the word for cannibals and dragon, so some of that probably got lost in translation. See, that doesn't make sense either, he said. A dragon, who's friends with a scavenger. Doubtful. He picked up the date cake he'd been eating and studied it suspiciously. What was in this. You can pretend you're imagining me if it'll make you feel better, Ren said, as long as you still take me to the palace. But then you'll get eaten, he pointed out, which would be quite a shame if you're the only scavenger in the world smart enough to speak dragon. Ren wasn't sure whether to agree that she was or argue that she might not be. She didn't remember any other humans from her village who would have even bothered to try, and Undauntable would have laughed at the suggestion. Maybe Leaf? She'd managed to stop thinking about her brother quite so often after the first year away from him, but sometimes he still popped up in her head. Do you have a name? The black dragon asked curiously. I once knew a dragon with a scavenger pet named Rover, but it didn't last very long. Not his fault. His friends were bad at remembering the difference between snacks and pets. Has your dragon named you? No, I'm not a pet, and I already had a name, Ren said crossly. It's Ren. What's yours? He said something that she couldn't quite figure out. 
She tilted her head at him. What? He said it again, a string of growls that sounded like two words strung together, but with the meanings a little muddled. Provider of corpses? Ren guessed in her own language. That can't be right. Plague carrier? Who would name their child that? Even a dragon child? She thought for a moment, running the sounds around in her head. Murder basket? She blurted. Wait, murder basket? Is your name really murder basket? She tried to repeat the sounds back to him, and he looked mildly offended. No, he said. Grumble, growl, gurgle, gruff. Murder basket, Ren said. Yeah, that's definitely what you said. Okay. She switched to dragon again. Mr. Murder Basket, could you please take me to the desert palace right now? I promise not to blame you if I get eaten. Oh, no, no, he said warily. I really can't. I'm actually rather busy at the moment. He held up the message scroll, looking for some dragons, on a bit of a mission. I'd be in quite some trouble if I took a detour to assist a hallucination. So, sorry. He tried to edge away from her. This is important, Ren yelled, making him jump again. Come on. It will take you, what, less than half a day to get me there? It will take me 400 years to walk there, apparently, based on the evidence so far and the fact that I have no idea where it is. Murder basket. Listen, a dragon's life is at stake. Ooh, he grumbled, rubbing his head. I had no idea scavengers could be so loud. Isn't a dragon's life more important than your mission? She said. Besides, you don't even want to do your assignment. I can tell. That's true, he said, with a slightly alarmed look. But you probably know that, because you only exist in my head anyway. What's the dragon word for a voice in your head that tells you what to do? Ren asked. He said something, and she echoed it back until she got it right. There you go, she said. That's me. Your conscience, and I'm telling you, don't do your assignment. Whatever you don't like about it, your instinct is right. Instead, you should fly me to the desert palace so I can rescue my friend. Murder Basket broke the date cake in half and inspected the inside of it for a minute. Would it help if I pulled this out? Ren said, brandishing her new sword with a flourish. It's very sharp. She jabbed at one of his claws and accidentally stabbed the membrane between them. Ow! He roared, leaping back. A small drop of blood welled up, and he pressed another claw to it, giving her a wounded look. Sorry, she said. Sorry, it's really heavy, and I still haven't gotten... You know what? No, I'm not sorry. That's what happens when you defy me, murder basket. She pointed the sword at him. Take me to the desert palace now. You know, I've never understood what happened to Queen... Something, he said. But now I see that scavengers are tiny, ferocious, mean little monsters, and it all makes sense. He examined his injury. I'm really not imagining you, am I? Nope, she said. Extremely real. Also, in a hurry. Well, put your violence away first, he said, pointing at the sword. She slid it into the sheath on her back. He wrinkled his snout for a moment, and then he said, All right, I can take you to the desert palace, but I feel like I should warn you then most of the dragons there won't be nearly as charming or patient as I am. I don't care, Ren said. I wasn't planning on having a tea party with them. I'm going to rescue Skye. Murder Basket held out one leg for her to climb up. It was super strange, climbing scales that were black instead of pale orange. Murder Basket was bigger and more wiry than Skye, and it took Ren a few awkward scrambles to find a spot that felt safe on his shoulder clinging to his neck spines. While she scrabbled around, the dragon tucked his scrolls into the pouch around his neck and finished his date cake. He brushed the crumbs off his talons and twisted his neck around to look at her. All settled, 
he said. This feels very odd. I had a monkey climb on me once while I was on a mission in the kingdom of the sea, but it was lighter and a lot less bossy than you. Maybe you just weren't listening to it carefully enough, she suggested. You're very sure you want to go to the palace, he asked. I can think of some dragons who would love to study you. Horrifying, Ren said. No, thank you. To the palace. To the palace, he agreed. He leaped into the sky and Ren held on tight, watching the dragon city drop away below her. Hang on, Sky. I'll be there soon. Chapter 24 Ivy What if we ride out there in the middle of the night, Daffodil suggested, while all the dragons are definitely sleeping, and we leave the treasure in a pile at the front door of the palace with a note that says, We're really sorry about this. Please stop eating us. And then we ride home very fast. Ivy leaned all the way back until she was flat on her branch and looked up at the sky. Blue and clear beyond the trees, rimmed with gold where the sun was rising over the mountains. The ripples of sunshine through the leaves, the sounds of birds and squirrels, the smell of green things, anything but cold stone and dirt walls. She was so happy to be outside again at last. It had taken forever for her father to relax his rules. She didn't understand all the reasons why he finally had, but she thought it was partly because her mother had helped fix the gardening problem and the grounded wing watchers had shored up one of the collapsed tunnels, so the citizens of Valor had stopped grumbling quite so much. There hadn't been any more messages from the lord of the indestructible city. And then four new baby foals were born, and they were adorable, and now that was most of what everyone was talking about instead of complaining which made the dragon slayer happy. And once the dragon slayer was happy, Ivy and her friends had been allowed back on missions. Back to sky gazing at least, but she'd take it. Foxglove was outside again too, helping keep watch while a few builders worked on concealing one of the entrances a little better. Daffodil, Violet said patiently, although Ivy knew her patient voice was actually her drive daffodil insane voice. First, there will be dragons guarding the palace, even in the middle of the night. Second, we'd have to get ourselves and the treasure and three horses out of valor without being noticed. And third, dragons can't read. Well, our choices are A, leave a note, or B, explain it to them ourselves, Daffodil argued. And I'm not up for talking to dragons. That is a much worse plan than mine. No one is saying we should talk to the dragons, Violet said. Even Ivy, who loves them the way normal people love treasure, or family, or cheese, isn't ridiculous enough to want to talk to a dragon. Imagine if we could, though, Ivy thought dreamily. What would they say to us? What do dragons think about? What are their stories about? Do they know anything about us? Ivy, Violet said sternly. Reassure me that you are not thinking right now about talking to a dragon. I'm just wondering what they'd say, Ivy admitted. Daffodil laughed, and Violet made a despairing sound. A sea dragon could tell us what's at the bottom of the ocean, Ivy said. An ice dragon could tell us what a polar bear tastes like, and they could all tell us what it feels like to fly. Sometimes... I feel like you're unclear on the basic reality of dragons, Violet said. Perhaps I should remind you about the giant teeth, and the fire breathing, and the claws, but mostly the teeth. I know, I know, Ivy said. I'm going up a bit higher. They were in one of the tallest trees. It poked out above the rest of the forest canopy. If she climbed up there, she'd be able to see the sky all the way to the mountains and maybe some faraway dragons. She heard Daffodil and Violet scrambling to follow her up. This was another thing she'd missed about being outside. There weren't nearly enough interesting things to climb in Valor. According to her Uncle Stone, Rose had been a natural climber too. Ivy liked thinking about that. She wasn't as mischievous or brave as Rose, 
but they still had things in common, like climbing and drawing. She climbed until she found a high section of branches, fairly well hidden by greenery, and then settled in on one side of the trunk. Daffodil beat Violet to the branch on the other side and made a little ha noise. Violet sat down just below them with her nose in the air, acting as though that was where she'd planned to sit all along. What if we left it in the desert, Ivy said, thinking aloud, just outside the forest, near the old village, and we drew big arrows in the sand pointing to it so they could see it from the sky. Someone might come along and steal it before the dragons found it, Violet pointed out. Including the wrong dragons, Daffodil agreed. I mean, I assume there are dragons who shouldn't get the treasure, right? Like, it came from the sand dragons, so it should go back to them? So if the mountain dragons took it, that would be bad? Unless that meant the sand dragons would start attacking the mountain dragons instead of us, Violet said, adjusting the green wrap around her hair. They might not realize the mountain dragons stole it, though, Ivy said. All right, so not that. She parted the leaves in front of her. Oh, look, she cried, her voice dropping to a whisper even though the dragons were miles away. Three glorious dragons soared down from the higher peaks, shimmering crimson and orange, like living flames darting across the blue sky. The sun lit up their enormous wings, as the three dragons spiraled up to the clouds and then plummeted down toward the forest. I'm suddenly feeling a little visible up here, Daffodil whispered. We're all right, Ivy whispered back. Just don't move. Once, in her training with Foxglove, they had been up this high, and a dragon had flown past close enough for the wind to rip leaves off their tree and throw them in her face. But it hadn't noticed them. If her friends kept still, they should all be fine. Ivy watched the dragon swing lazily closer and closer. Their gaze was trained on the ground. Probably hunting, she thought. Suddenly, one of them whipped around and dove into the trees. A moment later, it roared, a sound like all the walls of the village collapsing in at once. It burst out of the trees, lashing its tail, and Ivy saw that its talons were empty. With another roar, it seized one of the trees, ripped it out of the ground, and tossed it across the forest. Then it dove again. What has it found? Ivy wondered. A deer? A bear? It wouldn't try that hard for something small like a rabbit, right? She peered down through the branches and saw a boy dart between the trees. A person, she thought, her heart pounding. Who is that? He wasn't coming from the direction of Valor. Had he been out hunting and gotten separated from his group? But he also wasn't wearing the brown of a hunting apprentice or the green of a wing watcher in training. Is he one of the banished? She leaned farther out, trying to get a better look at him. Ivy, Daffodil whispered. Do you see him? Ivy whispered back. Daffodil gave a little nod. Her gaze was trained on the shape racing through the forest below them. The boy vaulted over a fallen log and crouched on the other side, digging himself into the leaves. That's never going to work, Ivy thought. She had a clearer view of him now, thin but muscular, and browner than her, like he'd spent a lot more time in the sun than she ever had. His tangled dark hair was snarled with leaves, and there were rips and holes all over his clothes. He looked her age, or perhaps a bit older, she was pretty sure she'd never seen him before. He's from somewhere else, she thought. Maybe somewhere far away. Maybe he's seen a sea dragon. And now I'm going to watch him get eaten, she thought, with a terrible lurch in her stomach. The dragon was on the ground and slithering through the trees, twisting its head in an unsettling way as it searched for its prey. Its red-gold scales glittered like dragonfly wings. It was getting closer and closer to the boy's hiding place. Don't move, said Foxglove's voice in her head. Do not leave this tree for anything. Stay in place until we return. Just watch. That's all you're allowed to do. But she couldn't let someone die right in front of her. She slowly 
carefully slid her hand into her pack. She had an apple in there that was supposed to be lunch for all three of them. Violet looked up at her and shook her head slightly. Don't do anything stupid, her face said loud and clear. Ivy tried to make a face back that said, saving someone isn't stupid, Violet. But she wasn't sure her eyebrows were communicating that very precisely. She waited until the dragon was facing away from her, and then she threw the apple as hard as she could into the forest, away from the boy and the entrance to Valor. The dragon's head snapped up, and it bolted after the sound. Ivy swung around and slithered down the tree, burning her hands on the bark and scraping her knees. Daffodil was already in motion, too, dropping from branch to branch. She heard Violet make a sound like, Arr! and follow them. The boy was on his feet when Ivy hit the ground. He spun and stared at her with wary brown eyes. The dragon was crashing through the bracken somewhere off in the forest to their right. Hopefully all the noise it was making would mask the sound of their escape. Come on, Ivy whispered, beckoning. The four of them ran through the trees, keeping low. The sound of wing beats overhead had faded away, so the other two dragons must have moved on to hunt elsewhere. The closest entrance to Valor was the one Foxglove was guarding, a dark hole in the side of a hill. It was risky to go that way. She didn't want the dragon to see them going in. But Ivy knew that Foxglove would want them to go straight to her, and it was the fastest way to get everyone underground. The dragon let out a frustrated roar behind them. Ivy grabbed the boy's hand and put on a burst of speed. To her surprise, he kept up easily, even though he must have been running for a while before she saw him. He was fast, and he didn't even seem tired yet. Daffodil ran ahead to shove the workers inside, but they had heard the dragon and were already gone. The entrance was now well hidden by a net structure woven with branches and leaves. When they reached it, Foxglove was waiting to drag them inside. Safe, shadowy darkness closed around them. Foxglove lit one of the lanterns and raised her eyebrows disapprovingly. Mountain dragon, in the woods, Ivy gasped to Foxglove. Tried to eat him. She pointed at the boy, then rested her hands on her knees, catching her breath. Daffodil lay down on the floor with a thump, and Violet collapsed beside her, leaning against the cave wall. Has anyone ever told you three that you are very bad at following directions? Foxglove demanded, such as stay in this tree, or never run from a dragon. Remember that? Lesson number one? I tried to stop them, Violet said. Dragon, Ivy cried again, wounded. Him, nearly eaten. We were, it was very heroic, Daffodil supplied from her prone position. You should have seen Ivy. She was brave as anything. I mean, if you had to guess which one of us would leap out of a tree to save a stranger from a dragon, wouldn't you have guessed me? But it wasn't me. I was too scared. It was totally Ivy. I wasn't scared, Violet interjected. I was being sensible and following orders, unlike these two. Well, I thought Ivy was amazing, Daffodil said loyally. They did save my life, the boy said. I'm so sorry to have endangered yours, he said to Ivy. I'm supposed to be the one saving people. You can have the next turn, she joked, and he smiled at her. He had a smile that looked rarely used, as if it only slipped out when he really meant it. I am grateful to them, really, he said to Foxglove. I was recently very nearly eaten by dragons, and it's terrifying. Ivy really wanted to hear more about that, but Daffodil sat up and said, What's your name? Why were you out in the woods by yourself? I'm Leaf, he said blowing his hair out of his eyes. I come from a village in the mountains called Talisman. Travelers told me I might find the dragon slayer near here. The dragon slayer? Ivy said. Her heart sank. Is he hoping my father can save his village? They'd had a few visitors like this before, who had traveled across the continent to plead desperately for the help of a man who could slay dragons. A dragon is terrorizing my family, my people, my home. Please, Dragon Slayer, 
Come kill it for us. Her father's usual response was to send them away, with a promise that he would follow in a few weeks. Sometimes he left Valor with a lot of fuss and pomp, then returned triumphantly to claim that he'd chased off the dragon, but Ivy was sure he never really went to the beleaguered villages. Those poor people, waiting and waiting for a hero who never comes. What do you want with the dragon slayer? Violet asked Leaf. Leaf picked a twig out of his hair, looking oddly lost. It's complicated, he said. I guess the short version is, I've always wanted to kill a dragon. I was hoping the dragon slayer could teach me how. Ivy could feel her friend's eyes on her, knowing how she would react. Always wanted to kill a dragon. What kind of life dream was that? Maybe he had a reason. Maybe he came from one of those desperate villages, but instead of asking the dragon slayer to come save them, he wanted to learn to save them himself. Or maybe he's dreaming of treasure. Maybe he's just another idiot like my dad, willing to set the world on fire to get rich. She hesitated. He didn't look like a selfish, treasure-hungry dragon murderer. His eyes were too sad. She wanted to trust him, but maybe that was the after effects of saving someone's life. I don't think anyone's ever asked him that, she said slowly. I can't promise what he'll say, but let's go see him and find out. Chapter 25 Leaf Leaf couldn't believe he'd finally found it. Valor, home of the Dragon Slayer. It was real, and he was here at last. Somehow, he'd never pictured it underground. The name Valor made him think of a towering city on a hill, facing down the dragons with no fear. But the citizens of Valor lived like moles. He supposed it was safer that way, but it was still unexpected. His heart beat nervously as he followed his rescuers through the tunnels. He'd never been to another human village beyond Talisman. A traveling family had given him directions to Valor and a message for the Dragon Slayer, and he'd only stayed with them for a night. He'd never been surrounded by this many strangers before. Leaf, you daft blueberry, Wren scolded him in his head. You survived a giant palace full of dragons. I think you can handle a bunch of strange humans. I mean, at least they probably won't try to eat you. Well, if any of them did, it would most likely be Violet. She was the tall one, with the short hair and the assessing look. She kept studying him from head to toe, like she was taking notes for a test, except he'd be the one who had to take it. Next to her was Daffodil, who kept jumping up to touch the ceiling tunnel, making her ponytail bounce. She stayed close to the other two, especially Violet, and her hands were constantly moving as she talked, which she did a lot. And then there was Ivy, the one who'd distracted the dragon and brought him into valor. She had a friendly smile and long dark hair, which had been tied up when he first saw her, but had fallen loose while they were running. She also had an interesting way of keeping an eye on her friends all the time, as if she was waiting for them to bump off course so she could steer them straight. She fell back to walk beside him and started pointing out the sights and geography of Valor. They went through a giant central hall where announcements and banishments happen, Ivy said, but he didn't register the word banishment until much later. He was too distracted by all the people who strolled the tunnels as though this were any ordinary village. In fact, the biggest difference between here and Talisman was the fact that the villagers didn't keep glancing up at the sky shivering with fear at every sound that might be a wing beat or a dragon roar or a warning bell. Everyone here seems so calm. See, there is an advantage to living underground, he thought, and the wren in his head made a scoffing noise. Why isn't anyone else wearing green, like you guys? Leaf asked Ivy. We are wing watchers, Ivy said happily. This is our uniform. But we're not the only ones. See, there's Moth. He's another. She waved to a boy walking by with a basket of yarn. What do wing watchers do? Leaf noticed a beam of sunlight coming into one of the caves through a small hole near the ceiling. 
Another wing watcher was crouched on a ledge, looking out at the sky. We study dragons, she said, and we watch for them when people are outside, and we guard the entrances to make sure no one leads them to us. His stomach plummeted. Are you like dragon mancers? He asked nervously. I don't know what that is, she said, tilting her head at him. They have visions about what the dragons want and how to appease them, he said. At least they say they do, but they're liars. She raised her eyebrows. Um, no, that's not what wing watchers are like at all. Sorry, he said. I'm sure you're not. Why do you want to kill a dragon so much? She asked. He looked down at his feet and kicked a rock out of their path. My sister was eaten by dragons seven years ago, he said. I tried to avenge her, but it turns out slaying dragons is actually really hard. Oh, she said. I'm so sorry. That sounds awful. Yeah, he said. You know, it's weird. I always say it that way, but I know more about it now, and I still haven't said the worst part out loud. He took a deep breath. She wasn't accidentally eaten. The dragon mancers sacrificed her. What? Ivy cried. Leaf, that's terrible. He nodded. And now I don't know what to do. I feel like all I've wanted for so long is justice for Ren. But am I even doing it the right way anymore? Would she want me to go after the dragon mancers instead? Yes, the wren in his head said snippily. Obviously. But how would I even do that? He asked. They run talisman. Everyone listens to them. And I'm not going to stab them with a sword. Maybe you should, wren muttered. I could never do that, he told her again. I'm not a murderer, even if they deserve it. So, I guess for now, I'm trying to stick with my original plan, he said to Ivy. Go after the dragons and protect future kids like Ren. If I can learn how. Hmm, she said, winding a lock of hair around her finger. Have you ever thought maybe going after the dragons would make things more dangerous for future kids? He tilted his head at her. What? How? Surely fewer dragons equals less danger. Unless the survivors get really mad and vengeful, Ivy pointed out. They don't particularly like their family members getting killed either, right? Leaf tried to imagine angrier, more vengeful dragons. A dragon like him, who was heartbroken over losing someone to the humans. Could dragons be heartbroken? Did they love their families? Not like humans did, surely but maybe some did, like the brown dragon who'd helped him, or the baby and its caretaker in the kitchen. What if he accidentally killed a dragon like that? How would he know? Maybe the dragon slayer would know. He'd be able to tell Leaf how to slay the right dragons the right way. Well, here we are, Ivy said. Where the famous dragon slayer lives. Violet and Daffodil were waiting by a door in the tunnel. Ivy unlocked it and they all went inside. Leaf was startled by how enormous the dragon slayer's caves were. They were almost as big as a room in the dragon palace, and furnished with beautiful things. Of course, Leaf remembered. He's probably the richest man in the world. That was something else he'd never thought about, the treasure the dragon slayer had stolen from the queen. But he wasn't like Rowan and Time and Cranberry, Leaf told himself. He was fighting to save his people, wasn't he? Or is that just how Rowan told me the story, so I'd want to be like him? He felt uneasy for the first time since entering Valor. Dad, Ivy called. There's someone here to see you. Leaf blinked at her. Dad? Oh yeah, Daffodil said. The dragon slayer is Ivy's father. She threw herself down on one of the large green and gold pillows along the walls of the living room. Leaf saw something in a glass box on a pedestal in the center of the room, but it was misshapen and ugly, out of place among the rest of the beautiful decor. He wanted to take a closer look, 
but he didn't want the dragon slayer to find him poking around in his things. He decided to stay where he was, standing with his hands behind him, ready for inspection. Is it my new hat? A voice called from the next cave. Tell him to leave it on the table. No, Dad, it's not a new hat, Ivy called back. There was a pause, and then some grumbling and shuffling noises. After a moment, a man appeared in the doorway and squinted across the room at Leaf. That's him, the dragon slayer, the only living man to ever kill a dragon, the mighty hero of the stories. Bit shorter than I expected, Imaginary Wren commented. The dragon slayer was barefoot and looked as though he'd been asleep. He had a tangled black beard and sleepy eyes and a gold earring shaped like a sword dangling from each ear. He looked like he ate more than Master Trout and moved as rarely as possible. He wasn't big, but all his limbs looked like bread dough. Who's this? The dragon slayer asked, scratching one of his feet. Dad, this is Leaf, Ivy said. We found him in the woods. He's come a really long way to see you. It's a great honor to meet you, sir, Leaf said. The dragon slayer cleared his throat and shot a look at Ivy's friends. Official dragon slayer audiences are held in the main hall once a month, he said. You just missed one, I'm afraid. Ivy, you know better than to bring him here. Violet and Daffodil exchanged significant glances. Sorry, Dad. Ivy said carefully. He has a kind of unusual request, so I thought it might be all right. Well, it isn't, he said. Find a place to put him, and I'll hear him at the next audience. Wait, sir, Leaf said, grasping at one straw that might catch his attention. I have a message for you from the indestructible city. He sensed immediately that this was the wrong thing to say. Ivy blanched and the dragon slayer's eyebrows drew together like a lowering storm front. You're from the indestructible city, the dragon slayer growled. Another one. Is your lord deaf? N no, Leaf stammered. I've never been there. I just met someone who said, they said to tell you the invincible lord is expecting you before the next crescent moons. The dragon slayer crossed the room in three large steps seized Leaf by his shirt, and lifted him into the air. Are you threatening me now? He snarled. I'm not, I'm not. Leaf instinctively did one of Rowan's twist moves to slip free and jumped away from the dragon slayer. That's what they told me. I don't know what it means. I thought it was just a friendly greeting between lords. The dragon slayer glared at his hands, then at Leaf, as if considering whether to grab him again but not wanting to look foolish if Leaf escaped once more. The presumptuous, pompous, self-styled, invincible Lord Jackanapes is not my friend. You can get out of my city now. But that's not why he's here, Ivy said. I swear, Dad, he just wants to learn from you. The dragon slayer had turned to eye Daffodil and Violet with suspicion. You brought him into the city, he demanded. We found him. Ivy said, trying to draw his attention to her. Dad, really, he's just another guy looking for a hero. He's not working for the Lord, I promise. We'll see, the dragon slayer muttered, tugging on his beard. Everyone get out. He stalked off into the other cave as Daffodil and Violet leaped to their feet. I'm so sorry, Leaf, Ivy said. She pushed up her sleeves and rubbed her face. I did that all wrong. He couldn't see anything that she'd done wrong. It was the dragon slayer who'd acted strange and unfriendly. And a little bit like a dragon mancer, Wren whispered ominously. And it was Leaf's own fault for being such an idiot. I'm the one who's sorry, he said. I had no idea the Invincible Lord was his enemy. I should, I should go apologize. No, don't, she said, jumping in his way. That's not a good idea. Not right now. But he's a man of honor and courage, Leaf said. Out of the corner of his eye, he caught Violet making a face at Daffodil, but he wasn't sure what it meant. Maybe she was mocking his sincerity, but he didn't care. He'll understand if I, 
Trust me, Ivy said, putting her hands on his arms and walking him backward to the front door. We need to get out now and wait for a better time. She looked truly sorry, as though she'd failed him, and so worried. He didn't want to make anyone feel as unhappy as she looked. He put his own hands over hers and stopped her momentum. I do trust you, he said. Don't be sad. I'm sure everything will be all right after I talk to him. In a month, I mean, he clarified quickly, at the next audience. She gave him a relieved smile. I think I know somewhere you can stay. He wanted to say, can't I stay with you? But it was pretty clear he wasn't welcome in the Dragon Slayer's cave. So he followed her without arguing to the cave of a man she called Uncle Stone, who looked like a taller, sadder, slightly less hairy version of the Dragon Slayer. Yes, fine, Stone said glumly. I have room, if he's not too loud. I imagine he sings in his sleep, Ivy said. But apart from that, the strong, silent type. Thank you, sir, Leaf said. I have to go give Foxglove my notes on the dragons and what happened out there, Ivy said. But I'll come check on you after that. Her smile almost made up for her leaving, except then Leaf was alone with her morose uncle. Stone looked him up and down, pointed at an extra straw pallet, and went into a corner of the cave to mash some vegetables. Leaf set down his pack and unbuckled his sword, wondering what he'd gotten himself into. Nice sword, Stone commented. Useless sword, Leaf said. Against dragons, anyway. Stone gave him a wry smile. Yeah, I wouldn't recommend trying that. I already did, Leaf admitted. It really didn't work. That's why I'm here. I'm hoping the Dragon Slayer will tell me how he did it. Stone let out a snort. Heath? Got lucky. That's what he did. Unlike some of us. Have you tried to kill a dragon? Leaf asked. He was slightly unnerved by the way Stone talked about the Dragon Slayer. I was there when it happened. Don't they tell that part of the story in faraway villages? Stone asked. Leaf suddenly, for the first time in years, remembered what his father had said when Rowan first told the Dragon Slayer story. Something about a partner had been left behind? But that couldn't be Stone. He was right here. You were? he said. What was it like? What did he do? I want to know everything. Stone's face hardened. Well, if you want worshipful stories of the great dragon slayer, you've come to the right place, he said. This place is full of zealots who'd love to tell you the great saga, but I'm not one of them. He dropped his masher, smacked his hands together, and moved toward the exit. Wait, no. That's not why I'm here, Leaf said. I promise, I want to know the truth. What really happened? Stone paused with his hand on the door and looked at Leaf for a long moment. No, you don't, he said, and disappeared into the tunnels. Chapter 26 Wren Wren and her ride arrived at the palace after dark which was Murder Basket's idea. He might be a bit of an idiot about human intelligence, but he was clearly an expert at skulking around. He approached on a quiet glide down from the clouds, avoided all the guards, and landed in a deserted courtyard. All right, Wren said, sliding off his neck. I'm impressed. You're welcome, he said, looking pleased. With myself, she said for picking exactly the right dragon for this job. He looked down his nose at her. Hmm, you're still welcome. You are also welcome, she said, for my excellent advice and for the part where I did not stab you with my dangerous weapon. You did stab me with your dangerous weapon, he objected. Oh, barely, she said. Imagine if I'd been doing it on purpose. He shuddered. I'd rather not. A distant roar cut through the silent night, and he turned his head toward it, then looked back down at her. Are you sure you want to be here? I definitely do not, she said, but I have to find Sky. 
and probably stab all the dragons who took him. In the eyeballs, they'll be sorry they stole my friend and made me walk all over the desert. Mostly the first thing. She pulled out her sword and brandished it at the shadows. Watch out, evil dragon eyeballs. Three moons, he said. I think you're the most violent dream I've ever had. And considering what I do for work, that's saying something. Your eyeballs are totally safe with me, she said, patting his claws reassuringly. The sword overbalanced in her hand and jabbed his talon membrane again in a different spot this time. He jumped away from her with a hiss, shaking a new drop of blood off. Okay, I'll admit that was terrible, Wren said. She put the sword away. This time I'm really sorry. He let out a small, disbelieving laugh. No one has managed to draw my blood in years, he said. And now a tiny scavenger has done it twice. I have this great idea. Let's both never, ever tell anyone about this. That is a good idea, Wren realized. She didn't exactly want gossip spreading about the sweet, fireless dragon she was going to steal back from the Desert Queen. Agreed, she said. Don't you ever tell anyone about me. No one would believe me anyway, he observed. I hope you find your friend, that you both survive this place, and that you never corner me in a dark alley again. Thank you, she said. I hope you decide not to kill whoever it is you're supposed to go kill. How did you? No, never mind. I don't want to know, he said. He spread his wings to go, and she stepped toward him, suddenly wishing he could stay, although she would never say so out loud. He was her new second favorite person, easily outpacing stupid undauntable. I mean it, she said awkwardly. Thank you, murder basket. Murder basket he muttered, shaking his head. He gave her an exasperated smile and then lifted off into the clouds, as silently as they'd come. Now I just have to find Sky, Wren thought, in a gigantic dragon palace. How hard could that be? She started as she did in every new place, by getting a sense of the geography. For one thing, there was a giant wall around the outside of the palace, specially designed to be impossible for humans to climb, as far as she could tell, which meant probably the only way she was getting out of here was on Sky. Also, she discovered in the morning, it had several dragon heads on spikes at the top of it. That was a little unsettling. Despite everything she'd read about dragons, she still believed they weren't as awful as humans, and she didn't like seeing evidence that they might be. She forced herself to check each of them for pale orange scales, but none of them were sky. Most of the palace was a labyrinth of winding hallways, lined with tapestries, which opened onto courtyards and enormous ballrooms and feasting halls. Here again, it was very easy to find food and survive on the dragon's crumbs and leftovers. The hardest part was actually moving faster than the mice and oversized ants who wanted to get to them first. Twice she found herself caught in an unfamiliar room with not enough hiding places when a dragon walked in. Strangely, though, each time the dragon barely glanced at her, muttered something about overwatered plants, Ren thought, grabbed whatever it was looking for, and left, even though she was sure it had seen her. Am I just a giant mouse to them? Not even worth eating or squashing? As she crept through the palace, she could hear a particular dragon roaring with fury, and she finally followed the sound to a tall tower that radiated creepiness. Someone was trapped in there, and they weren't afraid to let everyone know how displeased they were. Sometimes the prisoner roared words, I'll murder you all. You'll be sorry. I'm going to start with your tongue and eat you alive. And sometimes she just roared pure fury. Ren had initially been inclined to feel sorry for whoever it was, but the more violent her threats became, the more Ren felt like perhaps the world was better off with this dragon inside that tower. But it did make her wonder, was this where they kept prisoners? Could Sky be in there too? Trapped with the angry dragon? Probably with his talons clasped over his ears and his wings over his head, wishing he were a snail and had somewhere to hide. There were no windows 
so there was no way for Ren to get inside. But she found a safe spot to spy on the tower for a couple of days, and she studied the food that went in and out. It was almost all meat, and it was mostly all picked clean when the plates were removed. It didn't seem like enough for more than one dragon either. There would be only one bowl, for example, or a single tray of charred grasshoppers, or something like that. So if he wasn't in there, where else could he be? She scouted the palace until she found where most of the soldiers slept, and the low buildings nestled against the inner walls of the main entrance courtyard. Armored sand dragons went in and out of their barracks all day long, doing drills in the hot sun. Ren needed a spot where she could watch the soldiers, and she found it in a closet full of dusty linens that had a small hole in the back wall looking directly out over the courtyard. There was a strange monument out there, a tall black obelisk with carved words painted in gold on it. A large circle of sand surrounded the obelisk, but the rest of the courtyard was lined with white stones that reflected the glare of the sun. The closet was a good place to sleep and hide during the busiest parts of the day, while Ren waited for some sign of what the soldiers had done with Skye. Two days later, the loud giant appeared, whooshing in the front gate like a sudden thunderstorm in the mountains. Ren thought of him as the general, although she didn't know whether dragon armies had titles like that. He shook a vast quantity of sand off his wings and bellowed a name. Soldiers clattered in behind him, and he waved them off to the barracks, then shouted the name again. The name was something like what fires do when they're burning low. Smolder? Ren thought. I'll go with Smolder. Finally, a dragon came out of the central palace and slowly paced across the courtyard. He had black diamond patterns along his spine, like a snake, and a lot of keys and pouches on a ring around his neck. Ren noticed that he skirted around the circle of sand to reach the dragon who'd stolen Sky. Prince Smolder, the general said, inclining his head in a way that was somehow perfectly respectful, but also conveyed an ocean of contempt at the same time. Sandstorm, said the new dragon in a similar tone, eyeing the mess the soldiers had made coming in the gate. Anything to report? Nope, said the general. He puffed up his chest and lashed his tail. Any word from Queen Byrne? No, Smolder said with a sigh. But don't worry, I'm sure she'll be back soon, and you can give her your gift the moment she arrives. Yes, Sandstorm said with a smug grin. Still alive, is he? I think she'd like him better that way. For now, ha <laughs> ha! Smolder winced. Yes, he's fine. Why don't you have your dragons clean this up? and I'll go make sure food is ready for them. I want that cinnamon drink, Sandstorm bellowed after him. The new one from the kitchens, like last week. Tell them to make me another. Ren wasn't sure who was the boss of who here. She would have thought the prince would be in charge, but the general seemed very comfortable ordering him about. Prince Smolder turned back to the palace with an expression that suggested he had several thoughts about that question too. Unconcerned, or perhaps unaware, Sandstorm strutted over to the barracks to shout orders at some soldiers. Ren was sure they'd been talking about Skye, although she didn't know why he'd be considered a gift for the queen. But that meant he was alive, and he was here, and he belonged to Sandstorm, it sounded like, until this burn character returned. So surely Sandstorm would want to check on him as soon as he could. She thought for a moment, then slipped out of the closet and hurried down to the courtyard. By the time she got there, the general was done ordering the soldiers about and was striding toward a low door that led to some of the kitchens. Ren followed him, carefully, but as fast as she could. It was lucky that most of the doors in the palace were always open, covered by long, billowing white curtains to let the breeze through. She'd also found a few where she could crawl right under the door, but there were others that were too thick or too close to the floor, and a few that seemed to have special spiky anti-human flaps added on at the bottom for some mysterious reason. Sandstorm marched through the kitchens, 
laughing his annoying hearty laugh and shouting jokes at various dragons as he went by. Ren didn't think she was just imagining it. She was pretty sure from their eye rolls that they all found him annoying too. He yelled at someone to bring his drink to his room, and then he clattered on through and up a flight of stairs. Dragon-sized stairs were a pain, but better than the parts of the palace where dragons just flew from ledge to ledge and left no way for a human to follow. Each step was about as tall as Ren's shoulders, so she just had to pull herself up and then run to the next and do it again, one after the other. At the top, Sandstorm had disappeared, but she could hear his obnoxious voice chatting away in one of the rooms off the corridor. She tiptoed along the passage until she found the right one. The door was ajar. Ren peeked inside. Sky was sitting in a corner of the room, chained to the floor, with his wings puddling dejectedly around his talons, watching Sandstorm talk. He had on one of his hopelessly sweet expressions, the one that said he was sure he could befriend that angry grizzly bear if he smiled at it enough. Not much longer, Sandstorm was saying. The general dropped some of his armor with a clank that reverberated through the stones under Ren's feet. This will be so great. I've never brought her anything for her. Something Ren didn't understand. Bet this will get me a new command. But aren't we on the same side? Sky said. My tribe and your queen? For now, more or less, Sandstorm said with a snort. You weren't with any army, though. I'd wager you've never fought a day in your life. So I'm guessing your queen, or whoever is queen over there now, won't miss you too much. A sound on the stairs warned Ren that someone was coming. She slipped through the door, staying low so the bed would hide her from the general, and crawled under one of the loose blankets on the floor. One of the kitchen dragons came in, set a cup down on the table, bowed to the general, and went out again. Sandstorm drank it with a lot of loud smacking noises and then sauntered out the door. Ren waited until it was quiet in the corridor outside and Sandstorm's booming laugh had faded away. Then she threw off the blanket and ran over to Sky. Ren? He yelped, his eyes as wide as they'd been the day he found the turtle. She jumped over his chains, climbed up his leg, and threw her arms around his neck. He wrapped his wings around her, and they stayed like that for a long moment, together, the way they always should be. I'm sorry, Ren, he said. His voice trembled with tears. You were right about the Dragon City. No, don't be sorry, she said. It's these awful dragons who kidnapped you who should be sorry. Who will be sorry when I'm done with them? She let go of him and hopped down to examine the chains. How did you find me? he asked. I'm extremely clever, she said, and you're my best friend, so I was definitely going to find you eventually, no matter how long it took. How do I get these chains off you? He lifted one arm to display a wrist cuff and dropped it again. There's a key, but General Sandstorm always has it with him. What does that blowfish want with you anyway? Ren asked, kicking one of the chain links. It did not promptly collapse under the weight of her wrath, as she'd been hoping it would. The queen here collects weird things, Skye said mournfully. And apparently, I'm a weird thing, because no one else is this color, and sky wings are supposed to have fire. You're not weird, Ren objected. I mean, you are, but you're perfect weird, like me. She grinned at him, and he smiled back. Can I get the key while Sandstorm is sleeping? I don't think so, Sky said. It's around his neck. I'm afraid he'd wake up and kill you. Ren folded her arms and frowned at the chains. That windowless tower with the furious dragon? That was probably where the queen kept her weird things collection, or at least any live parts of it. Which meant she might put Sky in there, and then it would be even harder to rescue him. It would be better if she could get the key and free him now, as soon as possible, before the queen returned. 
and she could think of only one way to do that. Well, she said to Skye, then I guess I'm going to have to kill him first. Chapter 27 Ivy The arrests began while Ivy was asleep. It was Daffodil who woke her up, startling her out of a dream about dragons setting each other on fire. Ivy, Daffodil whispered. Ivy, help, Ivy, please wake up. She shook Ivy harder, sitting down on the bed next to her. I know I say this all the time, but it's a real, real emergency. I mean it now. Daffodil? Ivy sat up and rubbed her eyes. What's happening? Your dad is arresting wing watchers, Daffodil said. He has foxglove and squirrel and, and Ivy, he has violet. She started to cry. I was with her. I was in the other room. I was supposed to sleep over, but I guess they didn't know I was there. They burst in the front door and grabbed her, and Ivy, I didn't do anything. I didn't run out and fight them or anything. You did the right thing, Ivy said, taking her hands. Her own hands were shaking, but she tried to keep her voice calm. You didn't get arrested, and you came to tell me. So we can do something about it together. She climbed out of bed and started to get dressed. Her first instinct was to reach for her wing watcher uniform, but that might be exactly what her father's guards were looking for. She grabbed her charcoal gray tunic instead. What are we going to do? Daffodil twisted her hands together. Her hair was out of its ponytail, a tangled mess around her shoulders, and she was still wearing her pajamas, which were the last item of clothing she owned that her mother had managed to cover in bright yellow spots. Ivy grabbed a long brown cloak and threw it to her. Ivy, why is he doing this? Do you have any idea? I think he's afraid of someone taking his power away, Ivy said. Maybe he heard the same rumors about the wing watchers that Violet heard, or maybe he thinks they're, we're, working with the Lord of the Indestructible City. She'd felt the tension closing in around her home since Leaf arrived and delivered his ill-fated message. All her father's paranoia had been reactivated. He'd gathered his brutes to follow him everywhere, and more than once, Ivy had caught him staring at the pedestal where his treasure was hidden, as though he was considering grabbing it all and running away. Ivy had been waiting for him to calm down so she could talk to him about Leaf and try to explain but he hadn't calmed down. He'd gotten worse, more and more short-tempered and snapping at everyone, especially her mom. Last night, he'd broken a few plates in a rage in the kitchen while Ivy and her mother stayed in Ivy's room and pretended not to hear. It might be something else, Daffodil said. I heard one of the guards say they'd start searching once they'd arrested everyone. Ivy stared at her, rubbing the goosebumps on her arms. Do you think he discovered that the sapphire was missing? She whispered. She hadn't thought that he might go back to check on it. He'd moved the rest of his treasure here. She'd assumed he didn't take the sapphire because he didn't even want to see it. Daffodil's eyes widened. No matter what they're looking for, they'll find the sapphire in Foxglove's cave. She whispered. Ivy wasn't sure what the punishment would be for actually stealing the Dragon Slayer's treasure. But given what he did to Pine for just being near it, she had a bad feeling that it would be worse than banishment. We have to get it first, she said, heading for the door. She was startled to find her mother awake and pacing around the living room. She hadn't realized her mom must have let Daffodil in. Mom, Ivy said, are you all right? I'm just worried, her mother said. She had one of Heath's scarves in her hands which she kept winding through her fingers as she walked. I've never seen him like this. I don't know what to do to get him back to normal. He always calms down eventually, Ivy said, hoping she sounded more convinced than she was. Yes, usually, but Ivy's mom stopped and pressed the scarf to her face. I just don't know whether he, she stopped again, whether he might arrest you too. Ivy had had the same thought herself. If he was willing to arrest her best friend, and he knew how much time she spent with Foxglove, 
and he didn't trust any of the wing watchers. We need to check on our friends, Ivy said, taking Daffodil's hand. Stay out of your father's way, her mother said suddenly. She put the scarf around Ivy's neck and arranged Ivy's hair around it with fluttering hands. If you need to, go somewhere, just for a little while, I understand. Ivy hugged her fiercely, then tugged Daffodil out the door. They ran through the tunnels toward foxgloves. A cluster of guards were gathered at one of the turns, arguing with one another. Ivy whipped around and dragged Daffodil a different way to avoid them. They'd almost reached Foxglove's cave when another trio of the Dragon Slayer's goons came marching around the corner. Ivy shoved Daffodil through the nearest door, and they waited in a storeroom half full of dried fruit until the soldiers were gone. How many men does Dad have working for him? Ivy wondered. She knew he always had guards with him, and she knew there'd been more and more men she didn't know added on over the last few years. She'd even seen him handing out silver coins to the ones in charge, the only time she'd ever seen him pay real money for something. But she hadn't realized that he was essentially building his own army, loyal only to him. I don't think it's quite fair, Daffodil whispered, that you're the nicest one of the three of us and the most competent in a crisis. I feel like I should get to be at least one of those. You're the funniest, Ivy whispered back, and the best dancer, and the one everyone has a crush on. Ha, huh, no, Daffodil said, looking a little more cheerful. Not everyone. Leaf can't take his eyes off you. I hope Leaf's all right, Ivy thought. If this is about the Sapphire, Dad has no reason to suspect him. And he's not a wing watcher. And he's with Uncle Stone. They'll take care of each other. They reached Foxglove's door and discovered two of Heath's men posted outside, scowling. Which was bad, but hopefully meant they hadn't searched the rooms yet, Ivy told herself. You stay hidden, she said to Daffodil. I'll be right back. But, Daffodil started to protest. Shh, Ivy said. If they didn't start with me, I'm probably not on their list. But you might be, so stay here. Daffodil nodded, drawing back into the shadows. Be careful, she whispered. Ivy took a deep breath, aimed for the taller guard, and strode up to him, pretending she had all of Foxglove's confidence. Evening, she said to the guards. We need to do a sweep of these rooms. She pointed to Foxglove's door. No one's allowed in until it's time for the search, the tall guard grunted. Not even a dragon slayer's daughter, little miss. Very good, Ivy said, but that's the thing. We think there's someone already in there, a fugitive she was hiding or someone helping her. If we leave them in there, they could destroy the, uh, the evidence we're supposed to be looking for. The guards exchanged a troubled glance. I don't know, said the shorter one. We don't want to get in trouble. I'll take the blame, Ivy said. I know you're just following orders. You can stay out here or come in and help look, either way. I'll go in, said the tall one, tucking his sword away. You keep an eye on things out here, he said to his partner. She followed him into Foxglove's tiny cave, which she shared with another wing watcher. Ivy could see signs of a struggle in the small living space. There were chairs overturned, and a pot of bean stew spilled on the table, still dripping onto the stone floor. The guards must have taken both Foxglove and her roommate. From the shoes scattered by the door, she guessed they hadn't even let them put anything on their feet. She felt sick to her stomach. The guard looked around, frowning. I don't see how anyone could be hiding in here, he said. I'll check this room, Ivy said, pointing to the roommate's cave. You look in there. She pointed to Foxglove's cave, and the guard's eyes narrowed. No, he said. I think you should look in there. He pointed at Foxglove's cave and I'll check the other one. Ivy shrugged and went where she was told. As soon as she heard him stomp out of sight into the other room, she dove under Foxglove's mattress, poked through the straw, found the hole she knew was there, and wiggled the sapphire free. 
she tucked it into her sleeve and rolled out again, so she was standing upright a moment later when the guard came storming back in. There's nobody here, he snarled. Great, Ivy said. I didn't find anyone in here either. What a relief. I told Dad I was sure you guys had done an excellent, thorough job, but he was just worried, you know. Right, he said. Time to get out then. She nodded and slipped past him, thanking the other guard politely as she went by. The sapphire was clamped in her armpit, which was very uncomfortable. As she walked away, she kept expecting one of them to notice the lump and shout to call her back, but they were busy muttering to each other. Ivy rounded the corner and took her first real breath in a while. Now what do we do with it? Daffodil whispered. Get it out of valor, Ivy said. She wished they had time to go get Leaf too, but if they were caught with a sapphire, she and Daffodil would both be in the worst trouble of their lives. And she didn't want to drag Leaf into this. She had to hope he'd be safe for now. She secured the sapphire in her belt, took Daffodil's hand, and ran toward the nearest escape from the underground city. Chapter 28 Leaf Something woke Leaf just before the knock on the door. He wasn't sure what it was, some instinct for danger, perhaps, after his time with the dragon mancers and in the mountain palace. But his eyes popped open, and he was lying there with all his muscles tensed when the knock came. Stone wandered into the room, yawning. Leaf stood up quietly and Stone paused, sensing his alarm. Leaf pointed at the door and tilted his head, trying to signal, is this normal? In the middle of the night? Should we be worried? A slow frown creased Stone's forehead. He pointed to a large cabinet in the kitchen. Leaf slipped over to it, took out the bag of grains inside, and squeezed himself into the space as quickly as he could. Stone waited until he was well hidden, and then he opened his front door. What? he grunted. Leaf couldn't see anything, but he could hear the shuffling of feet in the corridor and shouts echoing from some distance away. We're looking for the stranger, growled the voice at the door. What for? Stone asked, equally surly. To arrest him, said another voice. For conspiracy to murder the dragon slayer. Leaf managed not to gasp, but his heart felt as if it was flipping inside out. Murder the dragon slayer? Why would I do that? I came here for his help. I've worshipped him my whole life. There was a muffled oof, as though the first man had elbowed the second. We know he's here, said the original voice. Hand him over, and we'll go peacefully. He is here, Stone said, and Leaf's heart stopped again. I just sent him for water. He'll be back any minute. Water, at this hour, said the second voice. Yeah, he used up my whole supply. Stone grumbled. Pain in my neck. Glad you're taking him off my hands. Should we go look for him at the lake? Asked another guard. Nah, just wait out here, Stone said. It'll be along soon and you can grab him. You three go to the lake, ordered the first voice. The rest of us will wait. Wonderful, Stone said flatly. I'm going to bed. If he doesn't show up soon said the second voice threateningly. We'll be arresting you instead, old man. Sounds fun. Can't wait, Stone said, and shut the door in their faces. A moment later, he yanked open the cabinet and beckoned to Leaf. Leaf crawled out, quietly lifted his pack and his sword, and tiptoed after Stone into the back bedroom. He hadn't been in here, even though he'd been staying at Stone's for days now. He hadn't wanted to be nosy or aggravate his host. It was spartanly furnished, like the outer room, but there were large tapestries covering each wall, all of them dark green and woven with patterns of roses in pink, white, and red. Stone crossed to one of these and pulled it aside to reveal a narrow tunnel leading into the wall. Leaf raised his eyebrows, but Stone gestured impatiently for him to climb in, so he did. He heard Stone grab something that clinked softly, and then follow him. Leaf crawled along the tunnel as fast as he could. 
It curved upward through the earth for a long time, and it wasn't very wide. Lee felt as though the dirt was pressing in on him, dark and smothering. He'd always thought he would die in a dragon's jaws. He'd never imagined he might die buried alive, suffocated by dirt. He reached to the end well before a stone. In the dark, all he could feel was dirt all around him, crumbling and soft. Here, Stone panted, tapping his foot with something. Leaf reached back and felt him press a large spoon into his hand. Dig up and dig fast. Leaf did as he was told. He tried to remind himself that climbing the cliff over the dragon feast was worse than this. Being held in dragon's talons was worse than this. Sitting in a pit with his friends waiting to be eaten was worse than this. Earth rained down into his hair, and he felt worms squirming around his hands as he dug the spoon in again and again. For a moment he thought they'd drown in the dirt before he broke through but then he felt the spoon dislodge a chunk that came with a gust of cold air. He dug faster, widening the hole, until there was enough of a space for him to wiggle out into the open. He was on the side of a hill, just above the tree line. He could see the forest stretching out below him, toward the mountains, lit by the silvery moons. Stone grunted behind him, and Leaf turned back to make the hole bigger. After a few minutes of digging, he was able to reach down and pull the older man through into the air. Thank you, Leaves said, clasping Stone's hands. Bah, Stone said, shaking him off. I was saving my own skin, too. First they come for the strangers. Next they come for anyone else Heath feels threatened by. I've been digging that tunnel since I got back to Valor a year ago. He jerked his thumb at the hole behind them. Figured I might need it eventually although I hoped I wouldn't. He kicked as much loose dirt into the tunnel as he could, blocking it up again, and then started down the hill toward the trees. You made that in case you needed to escape the dragon slayer? Leaf asked, confused. He jumped from boulder to boulder, keeping up. Your own brother? He's been paranoid ever since we stole the treasure, Stone said, always thinking someone would try to steal it from him looking for enemies in every corner. He built his power on the story of how great and brave and special he is. It stands to reason he'd eventually have to take out the one person who might tell everyone he's a fraud. You, Leaf said. Why? What would you tell everyone? Stone sighed and paused for a long moment. Finally, he said, I could admit that I'm the one who really killed that dragon. I realized it years later. It was my spear in her eye. He rubbed the back of his neck as Leaf stared at him, disbelieving. And I'd tell them all about Rose. Some of them already know, but many of them don't. Heath just wrote her out of the story, over and over again. Rose, Leaf said, remembering his father's voice again. Is she the one who got left behind? You do know something, Stone said in surprise. Yes, our sister, long dead, braver and better than either of us. He fell silent, and Leaf got the distinct feeling that he shouldn't ask any more questions for a little while. They traveled quickly through the forest, keeping one eye on the sky and one ear out for any sounds from Balor. Where are we going? Leaf asked finally. There was an odd smell in the air, like wood fires and burned applesauce. The old village. Stone answered. Rumor has it, that's the place to go if you need help after the dragon slayer banishes you. Leaf remembered Ivy saying something about banishment too. He thought about that, the idea of the dragon slayer sending villagers who disobeyed him out into the world, unprotected. It was the opposite of everything Leaf had always thought the dragon slayer would be. The whole point of slaying dragons was to help people, to save them to be the one standing in front of the fire and the teeth, making sure nobody else got hurt. That was how he'd always thought of it, at least. Why did you all go fight the dragons? Leaf asked slowly. You, Heath, and Rose. Heath's idea, Stone said. For the treasure, of course. The plan was to get in and out without seeing any dragons. The dragon slayer is not a hero after all. 
Leaf's whole understanding of the world shuffled around like a deck of trick cards in Cranberry's hands. He wasn't protecting anyone. He's just like the dragon mancers and everyone else, a lying, treasure-grubbing thief. Who, let's not forget, arrests random strangers on made-up charges, Wren piped up cheerfully in his head, and scared his own brother into building an escape tunnel. Hey, I think he might be terrible. Have you thought about that? That he might be terrible? Yes, Wren, Leaf argued. I'm thinking about it now. Shh, Stone said suddenly, grabbing Leaf's arm. Leaf froze, hit with a sudden memory of Rowan doing the same thing during training, as they both tilted their heads to listen for dragons. She may have lied to me, but she always took care of me, he thought. Someone's coming. Stone pulled Leaf down to the ground, and they lay in the leaf mulch, small insects crawling past their noses. Soft footsteps were hurrying through the trees nearby. Someone in a hurry, and trying not to be heard. Could it be more guards, coming after them? A shape moved through one of the slivers of moonlight, and Leaf recognized the way she moved. It's Ivy, he whispered to Stone, standing up. Wait, Stone said, trying to pull him back. She's Heath's daughter. We don't know if, but Ivy had already seen them. She skidded to a stop and came running over. Daffodil was right behind her. To Leaf's surprise, Ivy threw her arms around him. He thought of Rowan again, and the one hug she'd ever given him. Wait, there was another, he remembered. The night we found out about Wren. She found me outside when I couldn't sleep, looking up at the stars, and she gave me a hug then. Nobody else had. Even that awful day, hugs were rare in his family. He put his arms around Ivy and breathed the peach-scented smell of her hair brushing over his arms. He felt safe, for once, and peaceful, like he could exist in this moment for a long time. What are you doing out here? Ivy asked. Heath sent men to arrest him, Stone said. You? Ivy pulled back looking into his eyes. Why? I thought they were only arresting wing watchers. Wing watchers, Stone said sharply. What's that about? Some kind of conspiracy, Daffodil offered. I guess the one Violet's been trying to find out about, because they took her too. I thought it was about the treasure, Ivy said. I thought maybe Dad realized the sapphire was missing, but he can't possibly think you have it, she said to Leaf. She was still holding his hands. Sapphire? Leaf echoed. If he's worried about a conspiracy, anyone could be under suspicion, Stone said. Even you, Ivy. And me. She glanced back toward Valor. I'll find out more when I go back, she said. First, we have to hide the sapphire and you guys. You can't go back, Leaf protested, as they started to hurry through the woods again. Stone just said you could be arrested too. Agreed, agreed, very much agreed, Daffodil said. You absolutely, definitely cannot go back to Valor. But how can we rescue Foxglove and Violet and the others without more information? Ivy asked. Some way that doesn't end up with us having to also rescue you? Daffodil suggested. They stepped suddenly onto a path that was clearly a path between shapes that were not trees. Leaf had been thinking about the danger back in Valor. He was startled to discover that they were out of the woods, surrounded by the husks of burned-out buildings. Whoa, he said, looking around. What happened here? I mean, dragons, obviously. Sorry, stupid question. No, it's not, Ivy said. She told him the whole story of what the dragons did after Heath and Stone rode back with the treasure. They walked through the ruins, and he imagined something like this happening to Talisman, the entire village in flames. Would the dragons have done this to Talisman if he'd succeeded in killing one of them? He felt cold all over. Why hadn't anyone told him this part of the story? He'd always thought the dragon was the threat, and the Slayer had gone after it to protect his village. It changed the story quite a bit if you mentioned that the Slayer went after the dragon first, and then the dragon's relatives came for his village. 
I had no idea, he said, stopping near the bell at the center of town. Daffodil and Stone had gone to find someone called Pine, who Daffodil said would help them hide. I could tell, Ivy said. When I heard the way you talked about my dad, I had a feeling you'd only gotten part of the story, especially once you told me about your sister. She'd be so mad, he said. He looked down with a smile. Wren hated incomplete stories. Sometimes I'd start telling her a story and then stop before the end, just to drive her crazy. She didn't like liars or smug people or grown-ups who acted like they knew everything either. Ivy laughed. She sounds awesome and a little intimidating. She sat down on the tumbled pile of rocks around the burned-out bell, and he sat next to her. It was almost morning. The sun was rising over the mountains. She was. Leaf shoved his hands in his pockets. I wonder what she'd want me to do next. There was no answer from the wren inside his head. He felt like his destiny plan B had been shredded into tiny pieces and scattered to the wind. The dragon slayer was just a liar, a con man, and a thief. Nothing Leaf had believed in had turned out to be true. Maybe you could help us, Ivy said. We have a kind of sort of plan that we think will make the world a better place. Really? We were thinking there might be a way to get the dragons to stop attacking villages, she said. I mean, maybe it's impossible. But Violet and Daffodil and I thought, what if we gave the treasure back? Maybe the dragons need it for some reason. Maybe they'll forgive us. Forgiveness, Leaf thought. From giant flying sharks, really? An image flashed in his mind of the brown dragon who had helped him. I know, Ivy said. It's silly. They'll eat us before we can even shout, Hello, please don't eat us. Maybe not, he said, if we find the right dragon. He told her about what had happened to him inside the mountain palace. By the time he was done, there was sunlight all around them. Wow, Ivy breathed. She hadn't said a word the whole time he talked. She closed her eyes and took a breath. I can't believe you've been there, inside the dragon palace. I wonder if we could find that brown dragon again. He must live in the swamps, right? Maybe he could help us. Or at least we could try to communicate with him. Can you imagine communicating with dragons? I don't know if I'm quite ready for that yet, Leave said wryly. He hesitated. Um, do you know that your dad isn't really a dragon slayer? Ivy tipped her head at him. What do you mean? He's not the one who killed the dragon, Leaf said. It was Stone. He just told me. My uncle? Ivy blinked several times. Stone? Killed the Sand Dragon Queen? Not on purpose, Leaf said. They were there for treasure, not to fight any dragons. But then, why does he let my dad tell everyone he's the Dragon Slayer? Ivy demanded. I think he doesn't want the attention. And Heath definitely does want it, Leaf pointed out. But you might want to ask him yourself. I will, Ivy said. Moon's above. That fits so much better with everything I know about my dad. I always wondered how he managed to do one brave, dangerous thing and then spend the rest of his life being the exact opposite of that person. If he didn't even do that, it kind of all makes sense. She rested her chin on her hands and her elbows on her knees. So even the founding story of Valor is a lie. I guess that makes sense, too. Leaf saw Daffodil waving from one of the ruined buildings. Daffodils summoning us. Let's go tell her your story, Ivy said. I have approximately a million questions. For you, and also for Uncle Stone. As they climbed down the rocks, Leaf saw movement in the trees. He pulled Ivy behind a wall, and they both crouched, peeking through the gaps. A dragon stepped out of the forest. Leaf felt Ivy shiver beside him, but when he reached to put his cloak around her, he realized that she wasn't scared. She was suddenly radiating excitement. Oh, wow. I've never seen a dragon that color before, she whispered to him. This could be a whole new kind that isn't even in the guide. Her fingers twitched. I wish I had something to draw with. 
he looked back at the dragon. It was small, smaller than the brown one who'd rescued him, but much bigger than the baby in the kitchen. It had golden yellow scales and greenish eyes, and it was looking around with an open, curious expression. I think I saw one that color, he said, in a cage over the dragon feast in the palace. Oh, Ivy said, in a cage? So they must be enemies with the mountain dragons. The golden dragon took a few steps into the village, then lifted into the air and flew in a circle overhead, as though it was studying the ruins from the sky. Leaf pulled his cloak over both himself and Ivy, and they flattened themselves against the wall, trying to look like an uninteresting pile of dirt. After a while, they heard the dragon land again, near the old bell. Ivy pushed down the cloak and leaned over to study the dragon some more. It was wandering around the village square, poking through the ashes, and making little, hmm, noises. It's really cute, she whispered to Leaf. I've seen lots of amazing dragons, but none I'd call cute before this one. Um, no. Chipmunks are cute, he answered. You are amazing. And a little bananas. Dragons are neither cute nor amazing. Dragons are terrifying. She smiled, but she kept her eyes on the dragon until it finally flew away. A whole new species of dragon and a story about the inside of the mountain palace, she said when it was gone. Leaf, isn't everything incredible? Except the part about your dad arresting your friends, he reminded her, and then felt terrible as her face fell. Sorry. Right, she said. But that's probably a misunderstanding. I can fix it. I'll talk to him and fix it once he calms down, I'm sure. As they headed toward Daffodil in the bright morning sunlight, Leaf wondered if she was right. Was there any chance the dragon slayer could be talked out of his paranoia? Could Ivy convince him to let everyone go? Leaf was afraid the answer was no, and that they'd never see Violet or Foxglove or the inside of Valor ever again. Chapter 29 Wren There were a few possible ways to kill a dragon. The classic approach, with all the stabbing and shouting and blood and gore, seemed a little too obvious and a lot too messy and complicated to Wren. I'd have to find a longer, better sword, I think, she said. Then wait till he's sleeping and stab him in the eye. But he'd have time to wake up roaring, maybe kill both of us, and definitely alert the whole palace. There's no way I'll get to steal the key and sneak away with you if there are 80 dragons in here sliding around in his blood and shrieking about a human attack. Especially after the last one, Sky added helpfully. A human killed the last Sandwing Queen, so they're extra super paranoid about you here. Really? Wren said. How did she do that? I'm not sure, Sky admitted. The stabby way, I think? Huh. Wren thought about that for a moment. That didn't mesh with her experience wandering around the palace. The two dragons who had caught a glimpse of her hadn't reacted like she might be dangerous. They'd carried on as though it wasn't weird at all to run into a human in their cupboards. She also wondered why a human would go to the trouble of killing a dragon queen. Maybe the dragon had threatened her village? Wren didn't think she would kill a dragon to save Talisman or any of the mean, horrible people who lived there. But there was a small part of her that hoped killing General Sandstorm would mean stopping the attack he was planning on the indestructible city. Not for Undauntable. Undauntable was stupid. But there were lots of other people in the indestructible city or trying to get into it, and possibly one or two of them were not awful. The kids she'd stuffed into the hidey hole with Undauntable during the last attack had seemed worth saving, she figured. If I want to do it quietly, she said, what are my options? Drop the ceiling on his head, Sky suggested. Wren gave him a look. How is that the quiet option, Sky? I don't know, he said. One brick at a time? Wren laughed. I wish you really had a snail army, she said. This would be an excellent time for an army of belligerent snails to help us out. She looked out the window to the desert beyond the wall, where a sandstorm was leading a squadron of soldiers in some aerial maneuvers. Maybe you could get some other dragons to help you, Skye said. Like the black dragon who flew you here. 
You could go say hello to some dragons around the palace and see if anyone would like to help you murder Sandstorm. Ooh, maybe the prince. He seemed less hostile than everyone else. As fun as that plan sounds, Ren said, and although I'm quite sure there are many dragons who'd love to see Sandstorm dead, I think I'm unlikely to find another dragon as helpful as Murder Basket. I don't think you're saying that right, Skye said, not for the first time. Maybe it's Death something? Death Warrior? Death Conqueror? No, it wasn't either of those, Ren said. Anyway, he was fine with Murder Basket. I wonder how he assassinates other dragons. He was incredibly stealthy. I can be incredibly stealthy, Sky said jealously, and quite incorrectly. Of course, sweetness, Ren said, patting his talons. Well, the stealthiest way I can think of to kill someone is poison, so I'll go work on that, and I'll be back soon. Poison, Sky said. Wait, where are you going? Don't leave me. I can't stay here, Ren said regretfully. He's finishing up out there, so he'll probably be back before long. But I'll come see you again as soon as he's gone. And hopefully, by then, I'll be all ready to slay a dragon. Be careful, Sky said, nudging her with his snout. His wings drooped as she patted his nose and started across the floor. I don't like it here, Ren. I don't either, Sky. We'll fly right back to the mountains as soon as those chains are off. All right? He nodded, and she waved goodbye before ducking out the door. She'd seen about a hundred mice scurrying about the palace, and she guessed that meant someone must be trying to get rid of them. In the absence of cats, surely that meant rat poison somewhere. Most likely, the kitchens. Don't eat that. Ren nearly fell off the counter. Was that a human voice? She whirled around, and in fact, there was a real, actual person standing behind her. A woman, hands on her hips, standing out on the kitchen counter as bold as a salt shaker. Ren stared at her. Now I'm having hallucinations. The woman was only a little taller than Ren, with long, messy, dark brown hair and a defiant expression on her face. Her outfit looked like it had been hacked off the end of the curtains and then tied together with bits of leftover string. Ren could tell she was a grown-up, but she couldn't guess her age. Holy dragon scales, Ren said. Who are you? I'm Rose, the woman answered. Are you here to steal treasure? Because, speaking from experience, I can't say I'd recommend it. Also, that's not treasure, that's mouse poison. Her gaze traveled to the net bag Ren had borrowed from a pile of oranges, which contained the first two poison pellets Ren had found. A slow frown of puzzlement crossed Rose's face. I'm not here for treasure, Ren said. What are you here for? I live here, Rose said, as though that were obvious, as though it were her palace and of course a human lived here among the dragons. Really? Ren said. This human was suddenly a lot more interesting than most. And nobody eats you? Not so far, Rose grinned suddenly like a flash of lightning in a rainstorm. Okay, I'm playing it cool, but I'm actually dying of curiosity. What are you doing? You can't tell anyone, Ren said. Rose threw back her head and laughed and laughed. I literally haven't spoken to another human being in decades, she said, when she could finally breathe again. There's no one I could possibly tell. Don't worry. You could tell one of the dragons, Ren said and I need you to not do that. These dragons do not pay attention to me, Rose said. Apart from my dragon, the others all reluctantly refrain from eating me, and they studiously ignore me. That's it. Oh, Ren said. That's why the two who saw me didn't freak out or kill me. They must have seen a human and thought I was you. Overwatered plants. Maybe they thought of Rose as a spoiled pet who had the run of the palace. Rose looked her up and down. See, and you don't look anything like me. That just goes to show you how little they pay attention to me. So, please tell me what you're doing. Tell me, tell me. All right, Ren said. There's this dragon I have to kill, the general, Sandstorm. So I thought maybe I'd poison him with these. 
She shook the bag of pellets, picked up the new one, and stuffed it inside. That's a decent idea, Rose said. But you'll need a lot more than that, she added skeptically. That's true, Wren said. So I'd better keep looking. Nice to meet you. Goodbye. Hang on, Rose said, following her behind the fruit bowl and down the stack of crates beside the counter. Maybe I can help. I've seen a lot of those around the stronghold. Wren reached the floor and turned to look at her. Asking a dragon for help was bad enough. Asking a human for help was more risky than she was up for. A dragon would be straightforward about eating her, at least, if it wanted to do that. A human might pretend to help and then betray her by pushing her into a dragon's jaws or something like that. That's all right, Wren said. I can handle it myself. She set off toward the fireplace. Oh, I'm helping you anyway, Rose said. Sorry, I shouldn't have made it sound optional. Did I mention the part where I haven't talked to a human in years? I'm kind of overexcited about the idea of a real conversation. Plus, check it out. There's one over here. She darted behind a basket of yams and emerged triumphantly with another poison pellet. See? Helping. Wren accepted the pellet warily. Rose might be all right. She seemed to prefer the company of dragons to humans, like Wren did. It was probably pretty interesting, living in a dragon palace. And Wren could stay on high alert and make a run for it if Rose did try to feed her to anyone. They made a circuit of the kitchens and surrounding feast halls and wound up finding nine poison pellets in all. The net bag was almost too heavy for Wren to carry by herself now, although she didn't let Rose see that. Rose chatted cheerfully as they went, asking questions about the world beyond the palace, but never getting too nosy, which Wren appreciated. Are you a prisoner here? Wren asked. Should I be offering to rescue you? She wondered. Not really, Rose shrugged. I mean, it's all a matter of perspective, right? They might think they're holding me prisoner, but I kind of like it here. I like my dragon. He's pretty adorable. Wren nearly admitted that she had her own dragon friend, too, but she wasn't quite ready to trust Rose all the way. It was sort of thrilling to find a human so much like her, though. Someone who understands that dragons are like us, but better. I hope this is enough, Wren said to herself, hefting the bag of pellets. I think it should be, Rose said. Wait, why do you have to kill this dragon? Tell me it's not for treasure. No way. Wren said. I would never kill a dragon for something as pointless as treasure. Rose laughed. I wish I'd been as smart as you when I was your age, she said. Although, I guess it worked out for me. But back then, I was totally excited about treasure. Or maybe I was just excited to help my brother, who was really excited about treasure. Wren thought of Leaf and the adventures she used to drag him on. She wondered how quickly he forgot her. Within a week? A month? A year? Did he ever think of her now? Probably not, which is fine. They don't need me. I don't need them. Anyway, I made it into the treasure room and out of the palace twice, Rose said, with all the excitement of someone who'd done something amazing but didn't have anyone to tell about it for 20 years. But then the dragon queen caught us. So that was bad. The dragon queen? Wait, the one who got killed by a human? Wren asked. Was that you? No, that was my other brother, Rose said. Kind of an accident, though. Anyway, they rode off into the desert, but I'd hurt my leg, so I hid in a sand dune. That's where my dragon found me. I knew he wouldn't eat me. He has kind eyes. She thought for a moment. Okay, that's not entirely true. I spent the first couple of years expecting him to change his mind or, like, eat me in his sleep or something. Wren laughed. Well, Sandstorm does not have kind eyes, she said. He's been threatening the indestructible city. I figure if I get rid of him, it'll keep the city safe. This was true, and seemed like a safer explanation than telling Rose about Sky. Which one is Sandstorm? Rose asked. And how do you know his name? Or did you just make that up? I heard the prince say it, Wren said. Sandstorm is the big, loud soldier commander with the annoying laugh. 
He's been booming around the palace for days, bragging about the prize he brought back for the queen. Now Rose looked extremely confused. She studied Wren for a long, thoughtful moment. Wren, she said slowly. You said all that as though you understand what dragons are saying. Wren had sort of assumed that if Rose lived here, she must also speak and understand dragon. But all the next few questions led straight back to Sky. Oh, um, Wren said. I was just guessing. Anyway, I have to go. You know, dragons to slay. Thanks for your help. She tossed the net bag up onto the first step and heaved herself after it. I'll come keep watch for you, Rose said cheerfully. And then you can tell me how you understand dragon. She hauled herself after Wren and flung the pellets up another step. I don't, Wren said. That would be so weird. Humans can't understand dragon. No, no. Look, I'm sure you have other things to do. I guess I could steal some more cheese, Rose said. Or draw on my dragon's wall some more. But, hmm, I can do that anytime. And how often do I get to interrogate a girl who understands dragons? I do not, Wren said, putting her hands on her hips. Oh, admit I can be helpful, Rose said. Don't you need a lookout while you poison this loudmouth dragon? He's out on patrol, Wren said. I can't poison him until he comes back tomorrow morning, so you can't help me right now. Rose blinked at her again. I suppose you're going to tell me you're guessing that too, she asked. About patrols and when they'll be back? Sure, Wren said. A bell rang somewhere nearby soft and silver and twinkling. Oh, never mind. I'm being summoned, Rose said. Probably means I'm going back in the tower for a bit. The tower? Wren asked. Where the queen keeps her weird things? Are you one of her weird things? Oh no, not at all, Rose said. I stay far away from the queen. My dragon watches out for me. And sometimes the tower is the safest place to put me. Like... If the palace has a lot of visitors who might eat me, or the queen is on a rampage, or anything like that. The bell rang again, closer now. Rose took a reluctant step away from Wren. So, good luck with your dragon slaying. Thanks, Wren said. Good luck with the tower. Rose jumped lightly down the steps and pattered away into one of the feasting halls. Wren was surprised to feel a little pang in her chest like she kind of wanted Rose to stay and keep talking to her. A human who made her laugh, who understood that dragons were complicated, just like people, whose life story was as interesting as Wren's. Wren hadn't thought anyone like that existed. She knew Sandstorm's patrol would be gone for a full day, probably returning early in the morning, which meant she had that long to find a good hiding spot in his room. Then, she just had to wait for one of the servants to bring in his cinnamon milk and hope there was time to poison it before the general burst in. The hiding place wasn't too hard. Sandstorm had an end table beside his bed with a single drawer, but it was poorly made, so there was a gap at the top of the drawer. Wren climbed down into it and found the drawer half empty, with enough room for her to squeeze herself and the pellet bag into. It was highly uncomfortable and she did not want to know what all the odd random things were that were poking her in the dark, but she could handle it for a little while. She left the bag there and spent the day keeping Skye's spirits up. He was worried about everything about this plan, and he was especially worried about something bad happening to Wren. They took turns dozing during the night, each of them listening for the sound of the general approaching. Wren was the one awake and watching out the window when the patrol came flying in from the north. She darted over to the table, shimmied up the leg, and squished herself into the drawer before Sky was even fully awake. A short while later, a server dragon from the kitchens came in and left a cup on the table where Wren was hidden. As soon as he was gone, Wren scrambled out and hauled her net of pellets up after her. The cup of cinnamon milk was nearly as tall as she was, but standing on tiptoes, she could drop the poison into it. Splash, went the first one. Dissolve, dissolve, Wren prayed, shaking the glass. She could see white powder swirling around inside. In a moment, 
it disappeared into the milk. She hefted another pellet into the glass. Splash, shake, shake. Seven more, one after the other. Would it make the drink too chalky or change the taste? She had to pray that he wouldn't notice before he drank it all. I think he's coming, Skye whispered in a panic. Ran scooped up the net, gave the glass one last shake, and dove through the crack into the drawer. She wedged herself in the back of it, behind all the knickknacks and sand and odd little things Sandstorm had collected. Footsteps thumped into the room. Hey there, prisoner, Sandstorm boomed. Good news. Burn should be back today sometime. Ha ha! Isn't that great? I can't wait until she sees you. And then it's off to the weirdling tower with you, and I can finally have my room to myself again. I'm not that weird, Skye said plaintively. I'm just an ordinary dragon, like you or any of your soldiers. Couldn't you please let me go? Ridiculous, Sandstorm scoffed. You're nothing like us. You're less than a dragon. You're a fascinating beetle. Burn will love prodding you to figure out what's wrong with you, and then she'll probably kill you, stuff you, and put you on display. Ren could imagine the crestfallen look on poor Skye's face. Ren felt even less bad than she ever had about killing General Sandstorm, and she'd been at zero bad before. This dragon was the worst. Ah, good. Sandstorm thudded over to the table and picked up his drink. Just what I need, he chuckled, and then there were some very loud, gurgling, slurping noises. Yes, Ren thought triumphantly. Now lie down for a nap and never wake up. Sandstorm yawned loud enough to shake the table. What a day, lizard. You have no idea how important I am to Queen Burn. Wait until I find her treasure in that spiky human city. She'll probably give me a palace of my own. Ha ha! I'll burn all those humans to ashes. It'll be great. Ren heard creaking and rustling as he settled onto his cot. The general let out a sleepy grunt and a weird gurgling noise, probably from his stomach. Hmm, he grumbled to himself. Too sweet today. General Sandstorm, a dragon burst into the room. Help, help, we're under attack. It's the end of the world. Arr, calm down, camel. The general struggled back up again. His stomach made another ominous gurgling noise. Who's attacking? I don't know, sir, sand wings, but no one I recognize. They just appeared out of the sand. Any sea wings with them? Sandstorm demanded. Ice wings? No, sir. I don't think so, sir. But there are a lot of them, and they're very angry and scary, sir. Sandstorm snorted. Let's go kill them then. Ha ha! He staggered into the table. Die now, Ren thought frantically. Do one thing right and die now and here. But the general shoved himself up and stumbled out of the room with Camel. Wren rolled to the front of the drawer, wriggled out through the crack, and raced over to the window. From there, she could see Sandstorm leap into the sky from the nearest courtyard, wings spread wide, with a bunch of soldiers behind him. He roared and dipped sideways, then shot toward the desert outside the palace walls. Wren scrambled out the window. Wren, Sky protested. Where are you going? That's not safe. I'll be right back she called. Don't worry, everything's fine. That was decidedly untrue. Everything was far from fine. She wedged her toes into the cracks in the stone and clambered all the way up to the roof. From there, she had a view of the dragon battle down below. An awfully clear view of General Sandstorm plummeting into the midst of the fighting. He roared and swung his venomous tail in a dangerous arc. Dragons scattered out of his way. He spun and seized a small sand wing, wrapping his talons around the dragon's neck. With a grin, he started to lift the dragon up to choke him. And then General Sandstorm clutched his stomach and collapsed to the sand. 
The dragon he'd dropped stumbled back for a moment, then recovered and edged forward. He poked the general's body once, twice with his claws. Looking confused, but very pleased with himself, he finally swaggered off to fight someone else. With a shriek of terror, the dragon named Camel came pelting back toward the palace, probably to find backup. Ren dropped to her knees on the roof. She'd done it. She'd slain a dragon, and yet she'd still failed. General Sandstorm lay dead in the middle of the battle, out in the desert, outside the giant human-proof walls, with the key that Ren needed around his neck. Chapter 30 Ivy Heath's guards came through the old village the day after the arrests. They poked long spears through every leaf pile, peered up every chimney, and knocked over a few unstable walls. If Ivy's father had been with them, she might have tried talking to him. He was still her dad. Even if he was mad at her or suspicious of her, he'd still listen, wouldn't he? But he wasn't with the guards, and they all looked very angry. Daffodil said it wouldn't do any good for Ivy to get arrested for no reason, and that it would only make them search harder for the others who were hiding nearby, which was a good point. They weren't in the village exactly. Pine had taken them to the spot where most of the banished hid at first, a kind of ancient temple farther off into the woods. Two of the walls were missing, with only weathered marble columns left to hold up the roof on those sides. But at least there was a roof, and a mostly covered corner to tuck into, and a window to leap out of if anyone approached, though no one did. Ivy wished she could find out more about the temple. It was carved all over with dragons, flying, roaring, lounging on clouds, prowling through trees, snarling at each other. She would have liked to draw them. By the time the guards left, it was past midday, and Ivy's notion about going home was wavering. She'd been gone long enough now that her father could be sure she was with the fugitives, especially after the lies she'd told the guards in front of Foxglove's door. She wondered what her mother had said to him, too. She wondered whether he was also looking for Daffodil. She wondered whether she'd even be able to look at him now without giving away that she knew his whole Dragon Slayer story was based on a lie. Maybe she should give him a couple of days to calm down, but she couldn't stop worrying about Violet and Foxglove and the others. Would he punish them right away? What would he do to them? Then, the next day, an unexpected visitor appeared in the village ruins. Ivy and Daffodil were in a tree, watching for more guards, or the little gold dragon Ivy had seen, when they saw someone in a green uniform slowly picking his way through the rubble. That's Forrest, Daffodil said, surprised. It was, in fact, the goofy class clown and fellow wing watcher who had a crush on Daffodil. He looked a lot more serious than Ivy had ever seen him. He stopped in the center of the town square, shoved his hands in his pockets, and looked around mournfully. Maybe he can tell us what's happening, Daffodil said. Unless he's working for my dad, Ivy said, although she didn't want to. Daffodil stared at him for a moment. I don't think Forrest would betray us, she said. Do you? Really? Maybe now was the time to become a suspicious person, to watch everyone for signs of treachery, and keep her secrets well hidden. Violet would certainly tell them not to trust anyone. But wasn't that exactly how her father had ended up like this? Ivy didn't want to become paranoid and distrustful. Her instinct was to trust Forrest. That was the person she wanted to be. Let's go talk to him, she said, shimmying down the tree. Forrest's face lit up when he saw them waving from one of the fallen buildings. He hurried over and crouched behind the wall with them. Oh, man, he said. I'm so glad you're all right. You too, Daffodil said, hugging him. I thought maybe they arrested all the wing watchers. No, but most of them, he said, including my mom. Ivy gasped. Commander Brooke? Why? There was a big mandatory meeting today, Forrest said. The dragon slayer told everyone that there's a price on his head, 
and the wing watchers have been plotting against him for years. What? said Daffodil. What does he mean by a price on his head? Ivy asked. He said the lord of the indestructible city wants him dead. But he doesn't, Ivy said, puzzled. The lord wants dad to come work for him. He wants his own dragon slayer. He's sent so many messages about it. If he wanted dad dead, there have to be easier ways than trying to lure him to the indestructible city. Forrest spread his hands. I have no idea, but that's what he said. He said people have been trying to kill him for years, but never succeeded. So the Lord started scheming with the wing watchers, and finally, he sent an assassin to help take him out. After that, the wing watchers were going to take over. But that's not true, Daffodil said indignantly. The wing watchers aren't sneaks and murderers. Their conspiracy isn't an assassination plot. She caught Ivy's startled expression and added, I mean, um, if there were a conspiracy, and if I knew anything about it, which I certainly don't. Daffodil, Ivy said, smacking her shoulder. What do you know? Well, I might have tricked Violet into telling me a few things, Daffodil reluctantly admitted. Things I really, really promised not to tell you, because you wouldn't want to know. You don't need the stress, was my position on the situation. Such as, Ivy demanded. Daffodil squirmed for a moment, then covered her face and blurted, Okay, fine. The wing watchers wanted to organize a vote. They wanted to see whether the people of Valor might be interested in having a different leader, someone who actually fixed things, paid his or her debts, and never banished people. That's all, though. There was no assassination plot and definitely no conspiracy with some random faraway lord. You could have told me that, Ivy said. I would have helped you guys. I don't think my dad is a great lord either. Getting him to retire peacefully would be perfect. I mean, speaking of people who don't need the stress, he'd be so much happier without all that responsibility, I think. I'm not sure I should be hearing this, Forrest interjected. My mom has been trying to keep me conspiracy-free my whole life. Where are Violet and the others? Ivy asked. Are they all right? For now, he said. The Dragon Slayer wants to capture the assassin, so he can execute them all together. Daffodil gave a yelp and overbalanced. Execute? Ivy said faintly. He can't mean that. He wouldn't really execute my friends, and the other citizens of Valor wouldn't let him, would they? What assassin? Daffodil asked. Who is he talking about? That new guy, Forrest said. The one who's been wandering around Valor, asking lots of questions about the Dragon Slayer. Oh no, Ivy cried. Leaf isn't an assassin. He's never even been to the indestructible city. Forrest raised both of his hands, palms up. He could come back and try to explain that, if you know where he is. But he might be executed on sight. Dad's never executed anyone before, Ivy protested. What is going on? Isn't anybody trying to stop him? How? Forrest said hopelessly. He's got the guys with the weapons, and he sounds very logical when he talks about it. You know, he has to stop his enemies. It's part of keeping Valor safe, and so on and so on. I think half the people agree with him, and half of them are afraid if they say anything, they'll be accused of being part of the conspiracy. He glanced around. I mean, that's one of the things I'm worried about anyway. I don't see what I can do by myself. He ran his hands down his tunic, as if he was wishing it would change into a less dangerous color. We'll think of something, Ivy said. I should talk to him. Daffodil shook her head. Ivy, no. He's not in a listening mood. I have to go, Forrest said. I'll try to come back if there's any news. Thanks, Forrest, Daffodil said, squeezing his hand. You are doing something, you know. Coming to tell us all this? That was something. He gave her a wan smile and left. Ivy considered sneaking into Valor that night but it began to rain, 
and she didn't want to leave a trail that could be traced back to Daffodil and Leaf. It rained all that night while she thought about what she could say to her father, and all the next day. By evening, the rain had invited along some hurricane-style winds, and the roof of the old temple was doing a particularly pathetic job of protecting them. Leaf and Ivy and Daffodil sat huddled together with their cloaks over their heads, trying to brainstorm, since it was impossible to sleep, although apparently not for Stone, who snored on a blanket nearby. Ivy's feet were cold, even in her boots, and raindrops kept sneaking under the cloaks and smacking her in the face or dripping down her back. This was really not helping with her general feelings of hopelessness. Maybe Forrest was right, and there wasn't anything one person could do, or three people, or anybody. What if we go to the indestructible city, Daffodil suggested, and get the Lord to write a letter that says he doesn't know Leaf and isn't plotting with anyone? That would take a long time, getting there and back, Leaf pointed out, and I'm not sure the invincible Lord can be trusted either. If we go to him for help, he might use the situation to take over Valor himself, or something worse we haven't even thought of. Can we bargain with my dad? Ivy offered. She took the sapphire out of her cloak pocket and watched it glimmer wetly in the dark. We could tell him we'd give the sapphire back if he lets everyone go. I'm not sure he likes it enough to agree to that, though. And I still think you're right, and we should give all the treasure back to the dragons, Leaf said. I don't even think he likes being Lord of Valor, Ivy said. I think he'd be so much happier if he could just drink and hang out with his friends and tell tall dragon tales all day. She sighed. I wish the Wing Watchers had pulled off their actual conspiracy. Now, even if he lets them go, he'll never trust them enough to make a deal with them. Later that night, the rain finally stopped, and Leaf and Daffodil both fell asleep, propped against the wall. Ivy still felt restless, so she got up and walked through the forest to the ruins. Why does Dad keep hurting people? She wondered, running her hand along one of the blackened walls. The same thing changed both Dad and Stone, killing the dragon and losing Rose. So why did Stone become all sad and shut down, while Dad took more and more power and started using it to be terrible? She sat down on someone's old front step and took out the sapphire. It caught the moonlight like a trapped cobalt spirit, shimmering deep in the gem. She cupped it in both hands, closed her eyes, and rested her forehead on its cold surface. What do I do? Ivy asked it silently. How do I save my friends from my dad? How can I stop the dragons? How do I get everyone to stop fighting? She wondered if the little gold dragon was as kind as the brown one who'd helped Leaf. I wish I could get up closer and study it and find out what it was really like. She pictured the gold dragon in her head, each sunlit scale and perfect claw. And then suddenly, the dragon was in front of her, and she was standing in a desert. Whoa! Ivy yelped, jumping back. Her feet stumbled in the sand as the dragon let out a cry and took a step back, too. They stared at each other for a long moment. Am I dreaming? Just like that? Ivy wondered. When did I fall asleep? Something moved on the gold dragon's shoulder, peering around her neck. A person. There was a person on the dragon's shoulder, looking back at Ivy. She was about the same age as Ivy's mom, with long, tangled, dark hair, but there was something familiar about her face. She leaned forward to study Ivy and smiled. Ivy gasped. It's Aunt Rose! But not the Aunt Rose in the drawing. This Rose was twenty years older. The dragon took a step toward Ivy, and Ivy stepped forward too. She pointed at her aunt. Are you real? she asked. Are you Rose? Are, are you still alive? But Rose didn't answer. She patted the dragon's neck, and the dragon growled something, flicking its tail at the sapphire in Ivy's hand. The sapphire? What if it was magic? What if it was showing her the little gold dragon wherever she was right now? Wait, 
then it might be showing the dragon where Ivy was too, and that she was holding a piece of dragon treasure. Ivy clutched the sapphire to her chest with a yelp of alarm, and her eyes popped open. She was still in the ruins, alone. A cold, wet gray morning was slowly coalescing around her. There was no desert, no little gold dragon, no Aunt Rose. And yet, Ivy was sure it had all been real somehow. She looked down at the sapphire, turning it over in her hands to see if it had any magic words inscribed on it. Nothing that she could see. She tucked it into her belt and ran back to the temple. Uncle Stone, she cried, pelting up the steps and between the columns. She crashed to her knees beside him. Uncle Stone, wake up. I think Aunt Rose is alive. Chapter 31 Leaf Here's what we do, said Ivy. Steal horses, ride to the desert palace, rescue Aunt Rose, ride back, bring her into the city of Valor, show everyone that she's still alive. Everyone celebrates, everyone is thrilled. Dad is so, so happy that his sister isn't really dead after all. It fixes his whole brain. I say to him, hey, Dad, you don't really want to be Lord anymore, do you? And he's in such a good mood. He says, yeah, you're right. Let's free the Wing Watchers and let them elect a new Lord instead. And then we all live happily ever after. It's such a great plan. That sounds like one of my plans, Daffodil objected the kind Violet would heartily make fun of. Leaf didn't want to burst Ivy's bubble. Her face was all lit up for the first time since seeing the golden dragon, and she was so full of hope. But he couldn't imagine any single part of this plan actually working out. Ivy, Stone said, pouring cold tea into a cup. I know this feeling. Believe me, I had a dream about her too, remember? I sent myself on a pointless year-long quest as a result. But it's not possible. She's really dead. This wasn't a dream, Ivy said. This was magic. Look, in your dream, was she still the teenager you remember? Yes, he said slowly. In mine, which wasn't a dream, it was totally a vision. She was 20 years older. The age she really is now and she was with the golden dragon in the desert. I think the dragons have her out there. Stone handed her the tea and took the sapphire, examining it like a vegetable that might turn out to be poisonous. If she's with dragons, he said, why haven't they eaten her? I don't know, Ivy said. She was on the dragon's shoulder, as though she rode around on it all the time. Maybe they're keeping her there like, like... Like that parakeet Violet's dad's had for a while, remember? Or Daffodil's pet rabbit? Maybe the dragons think she's cute. Dragons don't keep pets, Stone argued. Humans are the only species who do that. Leaf tried to remember whether he'd seen any pets in the mountain palace. He could kind of imagine the little red dragon having a pet, but certainly none of the big scary ones who smashed goats with their talons. We have to go find out, Ivy pleaded. If there's a chance she's in that palace, still alive, don't we have to go see? Rrrr, Stone said, burying his head in his hands. Yes. What? Daffodil cried. I thought you were talking her out of this madness. I would have said more things if I knew she was convincing you. Ivy, what if the dragons don't think you're cute? and they end up eating you. I mean, obviously, I think you're too cute to eat, but dragons might not be smart enough to realize that. Also, the flaws in every other part of the plan, Leaf said. A, going back into Valor to steal horses. B, trying to get into the dragon palace. C, coming back to Valor and hoping the dragon slayer is happy to see you. All of these things sound kind of impossible, Ivy. I'll go get the horses, Stone said, standing up. He pointed at Ivy as she started to get to her feet. Alone. But you can't go to the palace without me, she said. I'm coming too. You have to promise you won't go without me. Or me, 
Leave said. I'm the only one here who's escaped from a dragon palace before. I can be useful. Also me, Daffodil said. I'm not at all useful, but I don't want to sit here wondering if you're all dead. Stone waved his hand at all of them. I will get what I can get, he growled and stomped off into the forest. What about the treasure, Ivy said. Should we take it with us? Maybe we can exchange it for Rose. I don't think there's any safe way to get it, Ivy, Daffodil pointed out. That was probably true. They debated it for a while longer, but even Ivy had to agree it was too risky. We can take them the sapphire at least, she said. Maybe that'll be enough. By nightfall, Stone still hadn't returned, and Ivy had practically paced a groove around the temple. We could walk to the palace, she cried. Who needs horses? I shouldn't have let him go. It would only take a few days to walk to the palace, right? Through the blistering hot desert, Daffodil pointed out. She was lying on a blanket with her arm over her eyes. With no water? That would be a very efficient way to die. Let's go back to the ruins, Leaf suggested. Maybe your friend Forrest has come back, or maybe we'll see Stone on his way. Yes, please. Daffodil said. You guys go. When Ivy's the one wearing me out, something is seriously wrong with the universe. Leaf lit a small lantern that Pine had left for them, and he and Ivy set off toward the ruins. What do you think about walking to the desert palace? Ivy asked. Let's give Stone a chance to come back with those horses, he suggested. I think it's pretty hot out there. I just feel useless, Ivy said waving her hands as though she was drawing a picture of all the nothing she was doing. I don't know how to stop my dad. I don't know how to get the treasure to the dragons. I don't know how to make everyone stop being angry. I feel like the only thing I can, maybe do, is go rescue Aunt Rose. Don't you think that would make everyone feel better? I like her, Imaginary Wren suddenly chimed in after days of silence. She's sort of ridiculous, and I am enjoying it. You have my permission to like her, too. I wasn't asking for your permission, he pointed out. Ivy led the way through the village to a set of stone stairs that had mostly collapsed. She sat down on one of the steps, and he sat on the one below it, setting the lantern down beside them. If Aunt Rose were still here, I bet Dad wouldn't be like this, Ivy said. She seems like someone who wouldn't let him be terrible. I mean... Maybe she'd be better at it than I am, don't you think? I wonder if you can stop people from being terrible, if that's who they choose to be, Leaf thought. Maybe all you can do is be the opposite of terrible, as hard as you can, to balance them out. I've wondered the same thing about Wren, he said. Would Talisman be different if she had lived? Would she have told everyone the Dragon Mancer's secrets? Maybe she would have stood up to them and they wouldn't be in charge anymore. Rawr, 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 said the dragon that stepped out of the shadows right in front of them. Leaf and Ivy both screamed and jumped off the stairs. All of Leaf's instincts kicked in, and he started to run, but when he looked over his shoulder, he saw that the dragon had moved to corner Ivy. Rawr, roar, rawr, the dragon shouted. Rawr, groof. Ivy tried to dart away, and the dragon threw its tail in front of Ivy, tripping her. Roarty, roar, roar, roar! The dragon leaped over and trapped Ivy between its claws, like a cat with a mouse. Leaf pelted back toward them, grabbed the lantern, and flung it at the dragon as hard as he could. Get away from her, he shouted. The lamp bounced off the dragon, and it roared again, sounding distinctly angrier this time. Leaf's legs were suddenly knocked out from under him, and he landed hard on his back. The dragon picked up Ivy and hopped back a step. It growled at Leaf and then at Ivy, who was struggling violently in its claws. I'm not going to let this happen. I can fight this dragon. I have to stop her from eating Ivy. Leaf shoved himself back to his feet, trying to catch his breath. The dragon made a very grumpy noise stomped over to a tall stone wall nearby and stuck Ivy up on top of it. 
Leaf was just picking up a rock to throw when the dragon snatched him up as well. He felt air whoosh by his face dizzily, and then he was suddenly on top of the wall next to Ivy. It was very tall, too high to jump off without breaking an angle, and then they'd be easy prey for the dragon to eat. Leaf clambered over to Ivy and put his arms around her. That was so much scarier than I expected, Ivy said, clutching him. Like, my whole body just went death from the sky and made me scream and run, even while a little tiny part of my brain went, oh, amazing, a dragon. But the scared part won. It's still winning. Why do you think it put us up here? Orgle, rorgle, ruffy growl, the dragon said in a strangely pleasant voice for a dragon. Rorble, gruff. Ivy looked at Leaf, then back at the dragon. That sounded like a question, didn't it? She whispered to him. Maybe it just wants to talk to us, he said, feeling like that was a highly optimistic view of the situation. The dragon picked up a tree branch, set it on fire with a single breath, and stuck it in the ground like a giant torch. Oh, Ivy said, seeing the color of its scales in the firelight. Leaf, look, it's the golden dragon, the one we saw, the one in my sapphire vision. The dragon cupped its front talons together in a bowl shape and rumbled something that also ended in an upward inflection. Another question, or the same one. She knows I have the sapphire, Ivy said. I think she's asking for it, don't you? How would she know that, he argued. Because she saw me holding it, in my magic vision that I totally really had, Ivy said. I told you guys it was magic. Isn't it possible she's just been hanging around the village, waiting for a human to come along with treasure? Leaf asked. Or maybe she's hungry. That could be a sign for food. I hardly think a dragon needs our help to find food, Ivy said skeptically. I'm just saying, if that's not what she's asking for, how is she going to react when you give it to her? What if she gets really mad and sets us on fire for being treasure thieves? Or maybe she can help us find Rose and stop the dragons from burning villages, Ivy said. It's not her treasure, though, right? He said, if we give it to her, we can't give it to the sand dragons. Ivy hesitated. She was in the desert when I saw her, though. Maybe she's working with them. Rarbo! Rar! 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 The dragon interjected. She reared up and put her open talons between them, palm up, as if waiting for something. Rar! 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 Ivy looked at Leaf for a moment, then reached into her belt and pulled out the sapphire. She dropped it into the dragon's talons, where it suddenly looked a lot smaller. The dragon made a delighted, approving noise and held it up to inspect it in the firelight. See, she liked that, Ivy said to Leaf. Barf, the dragon said. Rubble, rubble. They both stared at her. What is she asking now? Leaf whispered. Isn't that what she wanted? The dragon hummed a little impatiently. She put the sapphire on the ground, picked up another stick, and drew a big circle around it. She walked around the circle, adding stones to it, and pretending to pluck things out of the air to put in the circle too. Then she sat down and waved her wings at it. Rarble, rubble, she insisted. Roar! She picked up the sapphire and brandished it at them. See, I knew she'd be mad, Leaf said. Now she thinks we have lots of jewels and she wants all of them. Ivy pointed at the dragon's shoulder. We gave you the sapphire, she said. Now where is Aunt Rose? We want her back. The dragon tapped her chin thoughtfully, looking them over. Leaf didn't know what to think of that look. It could have been an, oh well, one jewel is enough might as well let them go, kind of look. Or it could have been an, I'm going to need some salt and seasoning for these two, kind of look. Maybe I can save Ivy, he thought. If I do something just a little bit insane, that's my purpose, isn't it? To save people? That's what I've always wanted. 
even if I was doing it wrong before. I can get you the treasure, he said to the dragon. Ivy grabbed his shoulder. Leaf, what are you doing? I'll go get it, he said. He pointed at the circle the dragon had drawn on the ground, then at himself and the dragon, who looked extremely curious about all this miming. Let us go, and I'll come back to give it to you. Ivy stamped her foot. Leaf, you can't. We already agreed there's no way to get back into my house. I can try, can't I? He said. And if she agrees, then at least you'll be safe. The dragon growled something in what Leaf was starting to think of as her friendly voice. She reached out and gently scooped Leaf off the wall. Yeah! He yelped, startled. Wait, what about Ivy? Get her down too. The dragon set him down and rumbled something, looking very pleased, then patted Ivy on the head. But she didn't lift her down. You have to let Ivy go, Leaf shouted. He pointed at her, and then the forest. Let Ivy go first, and then I'll go get you the treasure. Rubble, 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 the dragon argued back. She pointed at the forest, too, then waved to the sapphire, then pointed at Ivy. Oh, come on, Leaf cried. I can't leave her here with you. Roar, 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 growl, roar, said the dragon, pointing at all the things again, as though he might just be thick. I know what you're asking, he said. I'm just saying no, you have to let her go first. I don't think that's going to work, Ivy called, cupping her hands around her mouth. You'll have to go get the treasure unless you can convince her to switch me for you. No, I'll go, he said. I just don't really love leaving you alone with a dragon. It'll be fine, she said. I'll be safer here with her than you will be sneaking back into Valor. We'll make friends. I'll negotiate for Aunt Rose. Listen, the treasure is in a cabinet under the pedestal with a dragon tail on top. The combination is M-I-N-E. Mine. Be super careful, Leaf. Please don't get caught and executed. All right, he said, taking a step back toward the woods. You be careful, too. She waved, and then, hilariously, so did the dragon. Leaf turned and ran into the trees. Find the treasure. Find the treasure. His heart pounded. Don't get caught. Come back to save Ivy. He wondered what the dragon would do to her if Leaf did get caught and couldn't come back. Would she get angry and eat Ivy? He ran faster. It took him a little while to get his bearings and find Valor, but finally he recognized the hill he'd been on with Stone just a few nights ago. He scrambled back up it, climbing from boulder to boulder, until he reached the hole to Stone's secret escape tunnel. It looked untouched, half filled in, just the way they'd left it. Had the guards not found the tunnel? Had they even checked Stone's cave? Or had they assumed Leaf escaped some other way? There was no way for Leaf to know. He dug through the dirt with his hands until the hole was big enough to squeeze into again, and then he crawled back through the tunnel. It was slightly less terrifying this time, now that he'd done it once, without suffocating to death. He reached the tapestry and listened carefully but there was no sound from the other side. He lifted it and peeked out to be sure. No one in Stone's bedroom. No one in the next cave either, he discovered. And no one guarding the door when he chanced to glance outside. Leaf threw one of Stone's cloaks around his shoulders and pulled up the hood so he could hurry through the corridors unnoticed. No one spoke to him. Everyone seemed to be moving quickly, with their heads down, as though they were all afraid to catch the wrong kind of attention. He reached the tunnel outside Ivy's caves and hesitated. What if the dragon slayer was home? He certainly couldn't knock, and there was no back way to sneak in, or Ivy would have told him about it. Leaf hovered in the hallway for a minute, then ducked back around the corner and searched until he found a discarded basket nearby. He crouched beside it, just within sight of Ivy's door, pretending to arrange things inside the basket, a few rocks from the ground and nuts from his pockets, anything to make him look busy if someone came by. 
It felt like a painfully long time passed. Leaf kept thinking of Ivy, shivering on that wall, waiting for him. The Dragon Slayer's probably asleep, he thought. He's probably not coming out until morning. I can't lurk around here all night, but I can't just barge in there either. Yes, there were definitely some holes in this plan. In desperation, he finally walked past the door, knocked quickly, and then flew around the corner to hide. He heard the door open. Hello, said Ivy's mother's voice. Hello? Who is it? The dragon slayer bellowed from inside the cave. Nobody, as far as I can tell, she answered. Strange. She went back inside and closed the door. So he is there, and not asleep, Leaf thought, pressing his shaking hands together. What do I do? What do I do? Could he draw the dragon slayer out somehow, with a message? He wondered whether Ivy's mother would recognize him. They'd only met once, briefly, in the market on Leaf's third day in Valor. She'd been walking with Ivy, and Ivy had introduced them, but her mother had seemed distracted by the choices of vegetables, and their conversation had been short, and lit only by torches. Maybe she wouldn't recognize him. He didn't have anything to ride on, he was running out of time, and he didn't have a choice. Leaf took a deep breath, pulled up his hood, went back to the door, and tapped on it lightly again. This time he held his ground as footsteps approached. Who is it now? The dragon slayer's voice shouted from a back room as the door swung open. Ivy's mother was standing there, looking at Leaf in surprise. Oh no, maybe she does recognize me. He braced himself to run, ducked his head, and said, in as old a voice as he could muster, Trouble down by the lake, ma'am. They're asking for the dragon slayer to come as quick as he can. Maybe, um, maybe both of you better come, actually. Her eyebrows slowly lifted, and she looked at him for a moment in silence. She's going to grab me. She's going to call him and hand me over, and I'll have failed Ivy completely. Of course, she said instead. I will make sure he comes right away. She looked into Leaf's eyes again, then closed the door. He let out a breath and went back to his hiding spot, around the corner in the opposite direction from the lake, bending over his basket. He heard shouting coming from inside Ivy's cave. Why me? Crash, crash, crash. You didn't ask? And felt guilty for putting her mother in the path of the dragon slayer's anger. After a few moments, the door slammed open and shut, and Leaf heard the dragon slayer storming away, muttering curses to himself. Had Ivy's mother gone with him? Or was she still inside? Maybe she'd gone to bed. Come on, said a quiet voice above him, making him jump. Ivy's mother was standing there, beckoning. Um, I, he stammered. It must be important for you to risk coming back here, she said. He nodded and followed her into the cave. She shut the door and turned to watch him. You don't have long, she said. He's fast when he's angry, and he'll be very angry he was lied to. Is Ivy all right? Yes, ma'am, Leaf said, crossing quickly to the pedestal. He folded the cloth over the box and saw the cabinet Ivy had mentioned. She's safe, but I need to bring this to her for her to stay safe. It would take a long time to explain. He crouched and fiddled the combination to M-I-N-E. The door popped open and Ivy's mother gasped. There was so much treasure inside. Leaf had no idea how he was going to carry all this. Was this everything they'd stolen from the palace? Surely the dragon slayer must have spent some of it over the years. Ivy's mother appeared behind him, holding a canvas bag. She knelt down and started helping him transfer the treasure into it. It's so beautiful, she said. I asked him so many times if I could see it, but he always said it was hidden far away, somewhere safe. I had no idea it was right here, all this time. She lifted out a blue stone statue of a dragon. I just wanted to see it, just once. I guess he didn't trust me, 
same as everyone else. Leaf didn't know what to say to that, and she didn't say anything else as they finished filling the bag. She closed the door on the empty cabinet and reset the combination lock, then folded the cloth back over it. Hurry back to Ivy, she said. Tell her I love her and that it's not safe to come back yet. He wanted to ask her what was happening with the Wing Watchers and what she thought they should do about the Dragon Slayer, but there wasn't time. The bag was heavy on his shoulder as he checked out the door and found the corridor empty. Thank you, he said to Ivy's mother. Stay safe, she said, and closed the door behind him. He hid the bag under his cloak as he hurried through the halls, but he made it back to Stone's cave without running into anyone. He ducked inside, ran to the tapestry, and dragged the bag into the tunnel with him. I'm coming, Golden Dragon. Please don't eat ivy before I get there. Chapter 32 Ivy Ivy and the Golden Dragon regarded each other. After a long moment, the dragon said something that sounded very polite to Ivy, at least as far as a bunch of roars and growls could sound polite. I, too, find you very interesting, Ivy said. I wish I knew what you were saying, and I wish you could tell me where Aunt Rose is. Roar, roar, growl, roar, roar, the dragon said in the same conversational tone. Aunt Rose, Ivy tried shouting. Maybe the key was to be loud and dragon-like. Where is the person who was on your shoulder in my vision? She pointed to the spot where Rose had been sitting. Rose, where is she? The dragon tilted her head, as though she suddenly understood. Roar? Roar, Gorgon, roar? Yes, Ivy said firmly. I am looking for Rose. Rama, rama said the dragon with a shrug, and she suddenly reached out and seized Ivy in her talons. Ivy screamed instinctively, and the dragon jumped, nearly dropping her, then gave her a disgruntled look. To Ivy's utter and complete astonishment forever, the dragon lifted her up and set Ivy on her shoulder. There was a dip between her spine and her wings that was just the right size for a human to kneel in, with her arms around the dragon's neck. What is happening right now? Ivy shrieked as the dragon leaped into the sky. They were flying. They were flying. Ivy was flying on a dragon. Ivy hugged the dragon's neck, overcome with awe. They were up so high, surrounded by stars. The mountains went on forever, and there, over to the west, was the desert, and that went on forever, too. The world was so so much bigger than she'd realized. It was freezing up in the night sky, with the wind whipping Ivy's hair all around her face, but the golden dragon's scales were warm, like lying on sun-baked rocks in the summertime. I think I love you, Ivy said to the dragon, resting her cheek on the dragon's neck. They soared over the forest, over the hillside that hid all the entrances to Balor. The dragon glided in a wide circle, as if this was the simplest evening stroll for her, as if she was just popping down to Violet's cave and back, when in fact, she was taking Ivy three times as far as Ivy had ever been. Valor is just one city in this enormous world, Ivy thought. We are just one tiny group of people. All their heavy, insurmountable problems were like dandelion seeds up here. Ivy felt like she could blow them away with one breath. She didn't know how long they spent flying. Later, it seemed like a dream. But at some point, the dragon tilted its wings and arrowed down toward the blackened hole in the forest. The ruins got closer and closer, and then the dragon landed gracefully, and there was Leaf. He leaped back with a yelp of fright. Ivy, I thought she'd taken you and eaten you and... Ivy, you're on a dragon. You're sitting on the dragon, Ivy. I think she might notice. She put me there, Ivy said, sliding down the dragon's wing to the ground. The warm scales moved away from her, and her legs felt wobbly. It was her idea. Leaf, she took me flying. I have no idea why. That sounds very unsafe, he cried. I don't know why I'm shouting. 
but it was alarming to come back and find you gone. I can't believe you rode a dragon. It was everything, Leaf. I want to do it every day for the rest of my life. The dragon cleared its throat, reached over Ivy, and seized the bag that Leaf was holding. Oh, Ivy said, as the dragon carried it over to the torch. Oh, wow, you got it. Your mom helped me, he said. She says she loves you, and not to come back yet. Yet, Ivy thought, with a thrill of relief. That means she thinks we can sometime. And she helped Leaf. I wouldn't have guessed she'd do that. Oh, Mom, I love you too. The dragon emptied the treasure into an enormous glittering pile of gold, with gems the size of fists, each one more than enough for an entire family to become rich. Ivy remembered how her father talked about the treasure and how much he loved it. But he didn't need all this. It made him powerful, but it also made him paranoid and suspicious and furious all the time. Ivy watched the dragon sort through the gems, carefully at first, and then faster, with a look on her face that Ivy would have called distress if she'd been a human. She's looking for something specific, Ivy realized. Something she really needs. Maybe all the dragons are looking for it, and that's why they burn villages. Not for vengeance, but because they need it back. The golden dragon whipped around and roared at them. That's all of it, Leaf cried. It's all there, I promise. She roared again and lashed her tail, smoke rising from her snout. Roar! Roar, grr, roar, roar, roar. We're sorry, Ivy said. Maybe someone else has what you're looking for? Grrrumph, said the dragon, sitting down and glaring at the treasure. She seems less thrilled than I expected, Leaf said to Ivy. I can see that, Ivy said. The dragon started talking to herself in little growls and grumbles, as though she was listing all the things wrong with stupid treasure-stealing humans. Or possibly, she was trying to figure out where else to look. Or she might have been debating whether to eat them, since they'd disappointed her so much. Ivy couldn't really tell. Ivy edged closer until she was right at the dragon's feet. She reached out and patted one of the warm golden talons. It'll be all right, big scary dragon. Don't be mad. The green eyes looked down at her like the dragon actually understood her. We can communicate with dragons, Ivy thought. If we try harder, they're not all mindless, hungry monsters. At least some of them are like this. If dragons like this can convince other dragons to stop eating us, maybe one day we can all be safe. The dragon said something else, possibly to itself. I'd still like to know about Aunt Rose, Ivy said. She pointed to the dragon's shoulder again. What happened to the human? Where is she? Can we have her back? Roar, McGraw, the dragon said. She turned and swept the treasure back into the sack, including the sapphire. Then she made a little bow to Leaf and Ivy, spread her wings, and said something else in her growly way. Wait, don't go, Ivy said. This is an enormous breakthrough for human-dragon relations, and you have to help me find Rose. The dragon patted Ivy's head and then Leaf's, and then she leaped into the sky and soared away, carrying the treasure sack in her talons. Wait, Ivy cried waving her arms. Come back! The dark sky swallowed up the little golden dragon, and in a moment, she was gone. Ivy looked at Leaf. Leaf looked at Ivy. So wait, he said. Did that dragon just fly away with all our treasure? Um, said Ivy. Yes, but maybe she's going to give it back to the sand dragons? She went that way, Leaf observed, pointing east. The desert is in the other direction. True, Ivy said. True. Concerning, I'll admit. Do we think she's coming back with your aunt? Ivy gazed up at the empty sky. Maybe? But the dragon did not return. Not that night, not the following day. 
Ivy's new best friend, her best chance at establishing peaceful human-dragon coexistence, had apparently not understood one single word that she'd said and had flown away forever. That's just fine, Ivy said to Daffodil. Who needs her? I'll find a different dragon to change the world with me. No problem. At least you got to fly, Daffodil said indignantly. So unfair. I would obviously like to go flying too, all you friendly dragons out there. Come on. Stone appeared next to the temple, very literally, suddenly materializing out of thin air about an arm's length away from Leaf. Yay! Leaf yelped in alarm. What? How? Oh, your invisibility necklace, Ivy said. I forgot about that. Did you use it inside Valor? Did you see anyone? Daffodil asked. Like Violet or Foxglove? He shook his head. Got horses, he said. Ready to go? Ivy scrambled to her feet. Now? Yes, now, okay. I'm ready. Oh, wow. We're going to a dragon palace. Uncle Stone, wait until you hear what happened to us last night. Stone stopped Daffodil as she jumped up too. I could only get three, he said. Sorry, but a mob of humans showing up at the gate probably wouldn't go well anyway. I'm not a mob, Daffodil objected. Ivy's my best friend. Wherever she goes, I'm going too. Violet's your best friend too, though, Ivy said, taking one of her hands. She needs someone here, in case things go badly in Valor. You and Forrest might have to rescue her or something. Yes, Daffodil whispered, her eyes lighting up. A heroic rescue, and then she'll have to be grateful to me for forever. I am so up for that. Ivy hugged her. We'll be back as soon as we can. Hopefully with Aunt Rose. Stay safe. Um, you stay safe, Daffodil said. You're the one charging off into the dragon's jaws. But as she and Leaf and Stone galloped into the desert, Ivy thought of the golden dragon again, and she felt just a bit less terrified. They're not all monsters, she reminded herself. That means we have a chance. A chance to save Rose. A chance to bring her back and save our friends. Maybe even a chance to communicate with them. Whatever was waiting for them at the palace of the Desert Queen, they could face it. After all, Ivy told herself, now I'm a girl who's ridden a dragon. Chapter 33 Wren The palace was in an uproar, and Wren, for the first time, really did not know what to do. The dragons fighting in the desert had ended up inside the palace, and there was a lot of hubbub and commotion, and then some more fighting, and finally several dragons had flown away, but then a very short time later, more dragons had arrived, and one of them was apparently the queen everyone had been waiting for, which made absolutely all the dragons freak out. On the plus side, in all the chaos and commotion, everyone seemed to have forgotten about Skye, who was still chained up in General Sandstorm's room. Sandstorm had been saving him to be a special gift from the general alone, so nobody else apparently remembered or cared that there was a weird little dragon waiting to be handed over. For now but Ren was sure someone would remember him eventually. That prince, perhaps, or one of the kitchen dragons who had been assigned to bring him food. Nobody showed up for the whole day after Queen Burn arrived, but at some point, someone would go, oh right, wasn't there a gift for the queen around here somewhere? And maybe also, hey, I can take credit for that present now. And then they'd come for Skye, and her chance would be gone. His body is just... Lying out there, Wren said, pacing back and forth on the windowsill. They'll bring it inside the walls eventually, won't they? Sky asked. But when? She picked up one of the general's sparkly pebbles from his collection and threw it as hard as she could at the stupid, endless sand. What if they pick up his body, see the key, remember you, and come straight here? Or what if they decide to burn all the bodies out there and the key melts along with everything else? Yeesh, Skye said with a shiver. I don't know what this tribe does with its corpses, Wren said. She put her hands on her hips. 
I have to get to it. I'll have to climb over the wall or sneak through the gate. But she was worried about leaving Sky alone for however long it would take for her to do that. If someone remembered him while she was gone, he could vanish into the tower or somewhere else in the palace. Or worse. Ren remembered what the general had said about killing and stuffing her friend. She wasn't thinking about it. She couldn't think about that. I wish I had fire, Skye said disconsolately. Maybe I could burn up these chains if I did. Ren climbed down from the window and went to hug him. Skye hadn't said anything about wishing he had fire in years. She wished she could chop off the heads of every dragon who'd made him feel bad about it again. They wouldn't have left you in chains that fire could melt if you had fire, she pointed out reasonably. So don't even think about it. Can we break them some other way? Sky whacked his wrist cuff into the stone wall and winced. They tried everything. Ren found a large knife in Sandstorm's things and tried to pry one of the links open, but she only succeeded in nearly impaling herself. She jabbed several pointy things into the keyhole to see if she could pick the lock, but none of them worked. By nightfall, the chain was still on, and the body of General Sandstorm was still out in the desert. Maybe that human could help you, Sky said. The one who lives here? Ren rubbed her eyes, thinking about that. She didn't like the idea of asking a human for help. But then again, Rose wasn't like other humans. Ren would have to tell her about Sky. But if anyone could understand being friends with a dragon, it was Rose. I'll see if I can find her, Ren said. Good idea, Sky. He looked so delighted with himself. She couldn't resist hugging him again. Of course, it wasn't the easiest thing, finding another small human in a palace this size. Ren searched for part of the night and then decided to at least try scaling the giant wall from one of the empty courtyards. Ow! She leaped back with a hiss. Sharp spikes and glass were embedded in the wall all the way to the top. Its height wasn't the only thing that was human proof about it. Sorry, I should have warned you. Rose said, appearing from the shadows. It's pretty awful, isn't it? The new queen here, the one who took over after the one my brother killed, really hates humans. I can't even climb these walls, and climbing was always my thing. She ripped a strip of cloth off the bottom of her pants and took one of Ren's hands, wrapping the bandage around it with no particular skill or gentleness. She hasn't taken care of another human in a long time, Ren thought something we have in common. I'm fine, Ren said, pulling her hand back and rewrapping the bandage herself. What were all those dragons fighting about earlier today? Wasn't it exciting, Rose said. I mean, I missed a lot of it because my dragon put me in a room and tried to make me stay there, but I eventually found a place to watch some of the action. And, Ren said, who was attacking? Rose lifted her hands, palms up. Who knows? Other desert dragons, for some reason? I think they came to get this one prisoner, because they flew off with her. The one in the tower? Ren asked. Who was always roaring about killing everyone? No, Rose said, squinting at her again. The one who arrived two days ago, who was little and cute? I mean, for a dragon? She had sunshine yellow scales, kind of golden, and she looked a little bit like a sand dragon, but with no tail barb. I kept her company in the tower for a night. Poor little thing, she was so scared. I'm glad she got away. I don't think I saw her, Ren said. She realized she was walking back toward Sky without even thinking about it. It made her nervous to have left him alone for so long. The other prisoner left too, though, Rose said, falling into step beside her. They're both gone. Maybe the dragons who attacked wanted both of them, but they went in different directions. I don't know, it was confusing, but the queen was absolutely furious. What did she say? Ren asked. Rose looked at her sideways. Um, roar, and by the way, roar, and oh, wait, she also said, roar, roar, roar. Ren couldn't help laughing. She didn't know how Rose had lived with dragons all this time and not picked up some of their language, but that was still pretty hilarious. So what are you up to? Rose asked. Did you slay your dragon? 
and now it's time to go. Sort of. Yes and no, Ren said. They walked for a moment, and then Ren realized from the expectant look on Rose's face that she was waiting for more of an answer. Yes, he's dead, she clarified. But I need the key he's wearing, and his body is out in the desert. Oh, Rose said. You should have told me that in the first place. I know where there are a lot of keys. My dragon keeps copies of all the keys in the castle around his neck. Ren stopped and faced her. He does? Her mind was racing. Rose must be talking about Prince Smolder. He did have a lot of keys clanking around his neck. Sure. Rose pushed her hair back. What does it look like? I can get it, if you'd tell me where to find him, Ren said. But I can get it way more easily, Rose said. Come on, I haven't had a quest in years. I can be so helpful. Ren was surprised to realize that she believed her. Rose could be helpful. What is this weird feeling, she thought. Like being able to rely on someone else? Believing they will not betray you? Someone other than Sky? First murder basket, now Rose? Am I making friends? She kind of wanted to laugh at herself, and she kind of wanted to go build a snail shell of her own to hide in for a while. Sure, but maybe you don't have to, Ren said. Would you say Prince Smolder is a pretty reasonable dragon? They stepped back into the kitchens, where only a pair of older dragons were still awake, preparing breakfast for tomorrow at the far end of the room. The dragons didn't look up at the small patter of feet scurrying along the walls. Skye had said the prince was less hostile than the other dragons in the palace, and Ren herself thought Smolder seemed different from Sandstorm, not amused by the loud-mouthed dragon either. Perhaps she could bargain with him, or wave her sword at him, if all else failed. Who? Rose asked. Prince Smolder, your dragon, Ren said impatiently unless there's some other dragon around here with lots of keys around his neck. Rose pulled her to a stop and dragged her behind one of the baskets of lemons. You did not just guess a name like that, she cried. Is that real? Is his name really Prince Smolder? How can he be your dragon if you don't even know his name? Ren demanded. I've been calling him Ember all this time, Rose said. We sort of traded names at the beginning. He pointed to a picture of coals burning low in a fireplace. I guess he could have meant smolder. I thought it was ember. It's smolder, Ren said. She'd confirmed that with Sky, and also learned a few new dragon words, like weirdling and general. Sky had picked up a lot more dragon while he was with the Sandwing soldiers, although some of it was language that Ren did not care for. You do understand the dragons, Rose said. How is that possible? I've lived with them for 20 years, and I've only figured out a few words. How old are you, 14? Where did you learn it? Do I trust her, or don't I? Ren asked herself. She'd always, always kept Sky a secret, but if she wanted Rose's help, she had to take a chance. I have a dragon of my own, too, Ren confessed. His name is Sky, and he's chained up in Sandstorm's room. I'm trying to set him free before someone gives him to the queen. Sandstorm said she might kill him and stuff him. Oh, Rose said, her hands flying to her face. Poor little dragon. She really might. She's so scary. But we'll save him, Ren. Don't worry. You have me now. Could you take me to Smolder? Ren asked. Do you think he'd give the key to me if I ask nicely? Ask him, Rose said, clutching her head. You can speak it too? I mean, Ren said, not well. I always mix up my grrrs and my growls. Good heavens, Rose said. You do sound like them. Smolder would probably have a heart attack if you suddenly appeared speaking his language. He doesn't exactly love surprises or change. Listen, I'll get you that key right now, I promise. But can you please, please stay and teach me dragon? Oh no, I can't, Ren said, alarmed. That would take forever. We need to escape in a hurry as soon as we possibly can. Sky is in danger every moment he's in this palace. Teach me anything, 
Rose pleaded. I can help you both hide for an extra day. Even one day would be so helpful. Just teach me how to say, Smolder, stop putting me in places I can't get out of. Or, Smolder, I want a tangerine today, not another boiled fish. Ooh, or, Smolder, it is unreasonable that any creature should snore quite as loudly as you do. I could try to teach you a little, Wren said, rubbing her forehead. If I knew that Sky was safe. I'll get the key, Rose promised. Describe it to me and I'll go get it right now, and then we'll hide, and you can teach me for however long you can stay. Wren's instinct was still to try to get the key herself. But if Rose could get the key as easily as she thought she could, it would be the fastest way to save Sky. And meanwhile, Wren could stay with him to keep him safe. I could teach her a little bit before we go. One human. I just have to trust this one. All right, Wren said. Let's do it. Chapter 34 Ivy The Palace of the Desert Dragons was the biggest anything Ivy had ever seen. Bigger than the entire area covered by the old village ruins. Bigger than all the underground tunnels and rooms of valor put together. It loomed. That was a word Daffodil had always found hilarious, but it was exactly the right one for what this palace was doing. Looming out of the sand in the moonlight, like it was planning to squash any approaching humans beneath its giant talons. It looks different, Stone said. They'd reined in the horses on top of a dune, far enough away that Stone hoped they'd blend in with the cacti, if any dragons were watching from the towers. Also, this was as far as the horses would go. Even Ivy could smell the dragon fire and iron scent of blood in the air. It made the horses skitter and stamp their hooves. She slid off and helped her uncle tie them to one of the tall, multi-armed cactus plants. Different how? Leaf asked him. From the last time I was here, Stone said. He nodded at the palace. There's an extra wall now. Bigger, higher. I'm guessing that's exactly why they built it, to keep us out, if we ever tried coming back. That seems fair, Ivy said. We build stronger defenses against them all the time, and you did kill their queen. You, not my dad. That still felt strange, like her mind couldn't quite fit anyone else into the word dragon slayer. She wished they had the treasure. The plan was to sneak into the palace. But if they got caught, she would have liked to have something to offer the dragons. Something to distract them from the grand idea of eating them all. So how are we going to get inside? Leaf asked. He was looking at Ivy, but Stone answered him. I'll go in alone, he said, pulling the long, silvery black chain out of his pocket. With this. He looped it over his neck and disappeared from view. Oh, no, you don't. Ivy said, tackling the spot where he'd been. She collided with something heavy and warm that went, oof, and toppled over. Ivy, get off, Stone growled. Take that off first, she said, so we can make sure you don't run away. All right, all right. He reappeared, holding the necklace in his fist. Ivy stood up, but stayed near him. You can't go in by yourself, she said. Why not? he demanded. Because we want to go with you, Ivy said. She was not going to get this close to a dragon's lair and not go inside. And because we can help, Leaf added. That too. Besides, we might find Rose and you might miss something, she added. I can hunt through a giant palace just as well as you can, Stone said. Better, because there is one of me. I am quiet unlike you, and I am invisible. If you go in there alone and invisible, Ivy said, we are just going to follow you, together and uninvisible. Stone's jaw worked in silence for a moment. No, he said, and he leaned forward to drape the glittering chain over Ivy's neck. She looked down, surprised, and saw that she'd vanished. She could see right through her feet to the sand underneath. Wait, no, she said. I didn't mean to take this. You keep it. 
She started to take it off, and he stepped back, waving his hands. If you insist on coming, he said, then you have to wear that. For me, Ivy. I'm not losing another family member to this place. She let go of the chain with a sigh. She recognized this stubbornness. They could stand here arguing all night, or they could each take a half step sideways and move on. Well then, let me scout ahead, she said. She looped the extra length of chain around her shoulders a few more times. We'll get as close as we can, and then I'll check out the gate. They ran lightly down the dunes, closer and closer to the strangely silent palace. Ivy got a fright when she looked up and saw dozens of dragons staring down at them. But after a momentary heart attack, she realized they were not alive. Those were dragon heads, defeated enemies mounted on spikes at the top of the walls. Remember that for Daffodil, she thought. That was the kind of gruesome detail Daffodil would love. She wished Violet were here, too. Violet would definitely be able to think of a clever way to get them inside the palace. Stone and Leaf stopped a few lengths away from the wall and lay down behind a wave of sand. Ivy ran on ahead toward the gate, which was as tall and thick as the walls, and flanked by two enormous statues of dragons roaring. A pair of dragon guards stood outside the gate, twitching and stamping their feet. They kept looking back at the palace, as though they were more afraid of what might come from there than they were of anything out in the desert. Ivy crouched beside one of the statues and watched them carefully. She noticed that they held their wings tense and high, and they weren't speaking to each other. In fact, if she had to guess, she'd say they were in a fight, or at least very close to angry with the other one. They had all the signs she'd seen in her father, or when Violet and Daffodil were about to have a serious argument, the way one narrowed his eyes, the coiled flicker of the other's tail, the way one hunched her shoulders away from the other and quivered with rage when he coughed. Could she use that? Could she take her peacemaking skills and reverse them? Silently, she reached down and scooped sand and pebbles into the pockets of her cloak, she climbed as high as she could get on the statue, then took out a handful of sand and blew it into the face of the dragon on the opposite side. Roar! The dragon snapped, sneezing and shaking its head. It snarled something grumpy at the closer guard, who growled back. They turned away from each other, glaring out at the desert. Ivy took another handful of sand and did it to the closer dragon this time. As he whipped around to snarl at his partner, she threw a rock at the other dragon's ear as hard as she could. The guards started snarling furiously at each other. Each time one started to turn away, Ivy threw a rock to keep the fight going. Soon the dragons were face to face, hissing and lashing their tails. One of them roared something, turned to unlock the gate, wrenched it open, and stomped inside. To get a different dragon to guard in his place, Ivy guessed. He'd left the gate ajar behind him, as though he planned to return or send someone back in a moment. She leaped down from the statue and ran back to Stone and Leaf. I know what we can do, she whispered, making them both jump with her disembodied voice. Come quickly. She unwound the chain from around her shoulders, then draped one end around Leaf's head and the other around Stone's, with her in the middle. The chain was long enough to encircle all of them, and make them all invisible. Arm in arm, they raced back to the gate. It was still ajar, but they could hear shuffling and muttering in the courtyard beyond. A new dragon guard would be there soon. Ivy pushed Leaf ahead of her through the gate, and they bundled into the wide open space on the other side. A soldier was stomping toward them, so they had to scurry out of the way as fast as they could. Ivy thanked the universe that the dragon was too sleepy and grouchy to notice their footprints in the sand. She wished they could stop for a moment to stare around the courtyard. She wanted a closer look at the obelisk monument in the center. But Stone had moved ahead of them now, making a beeline for the palace doors. With the chain still linking them together, she and Leaf had to hurry to keep up with him. They stepped onto the marble floor of the old palace, between billowing white curtains, and Ivy looked up, up, up to the dome overhead. 
A mosaic of jeweled tiles glittered back at her, reflecting the moons and the torches in opal and flame. In the deserted room, Stone paused to resettle the chain around only Ivy. So you can run if you need to, he whispered. They crept through halls where dragons slept beside overturned tables, with half-eaten antelopes and spilled flagons of agave nectar scattered around them. They avoided the small rooms where they could hear pairs or trios of dragons playing games with tiny bones or hissing secrets to one another in the dark of night. They climbed long flights of stairs, with dragon eyes glaring down at them from the tapestries, and they tiptoed past a vast throne room where a dragon glowered alone over a giant map. The palace was so big, Ivy was starting to think they'd have to find a place to hide and stay for several days so they could search every corner of it. She could see the moons slipping across the sky every time they passed a window. It would be morning before long. They went down a tunnel and found themselves suddenly in a huge kitchen. Copper pots and pans hung from the ceiling, and ominous-looking jars lined the shelves all along one side of the room. Ivy saw something she thought was pears right next to something else that looked like eyeballs. Year, I pity the cook who mixes those two up. The room seemed empty, so they set out across the floor to the far doorway, but the room was not empty. A dragon was hunched over one of the counters, taking notes on a scroll, so absorbed and quiet that they didn't notice her until they were out in the open, and she suddenly looked up with a hiss. Ivy leaped forward and threw the extra length of chain around Leaf's neck. He vanished, as the dragon darted toward them, but before Ivy could reach Stone to make him invisible too, the dragon swooped him up in her talons. Oh no, Ivy whispered, clutching Leaf's arm. Roar, the dragon shouted. She shook Stone a little bit and waved her wings at the kitchen around her, roaring some more. Ivy half expected her to throw Stone into one of the jars or set him on fire on the spot. But instead, the dragon tossed him in a net bag, hooked the bag around her shoulders, and stormed out of the kitchen. Quick, Ivy whispered, nudging Leaf. They raced after the dragon, who was muttering and growling to herself as she charged through the halls. Around a few corners, across a courtyard, and up a few steps, onto a roofed terrace lined with mirrored mosaics. Here, the dragon stopped at a door covered in small, jewel-colored tiles and banged on it furiously. Leaf and Ivy caught up as the dragon waited for a response. They crept close enough to see Stone, upside down in the bag, and struggling to wrench one of the holes bigger. The dragon pounded on the door again, and it suddenly flew open. Roar, growl, roar, growl, roar, roar. The dragon holding Stone shouted at the dragon in the doorway. The new one was a sleek, sand-colored dragon with black diamond patterns on his scales and a ring of keys around his neck. He blinked at the other dragon with sleepy bewilderment. She growled something else and pushed past him into the room beyond. Ivy and Leaf sprinted over the tiles and skidded inside, into a lavishly furnished suite of rooms where everything looked expensive. Silk tapestries hung from the walls, most of them depicting dragon faces or dragons in flight over the desert. Emerald green pillows were scattered across the woven rugs and low couches. A warm glow lit the room from bejeweled lamps in the wall sconces. The first dragon brandished the bag with stone in it and waved it at the key ring dragon. Bra, ra, roof, she shouted, pointing at her hapless human captive. Hmm, said the sleepy dragon with all the keys. Ra, gruff. He gave a puzzled shrug and pointed to a large pile of pillows, surrounded by scraps of paper with drawings all over them. The corner was so cluttered, it took Ivy a moment to see what he was pointing at. But then it moved, standing up on the pillows and tilting its head, and she gasped. It was Rose, unmistakably Rose from the sketch, Rose, twenty years older, with longer hair, but with the same defiant spark in her eyes. She looked exactly the way she had in Ivy's sapphire vision. Ivy couldn't believe it. It was real, and she was right, and somehow Rose was actually completely alive. The dragon from the kitchen saw her 
and nearly jumped out of its skin. It flung the net bag away from itself as though it had just discovered it was holding a poisonous spider. Stone crashed into one of the pillows with an woof. The two dragons started arguing, but Rose sprang off her pillow and ran over to Stone. She pulled the net bag off of him and turned him over to see his face. No way, she cried, her eyes lighting up. Rose, Stone cried. He tried to sit up and reach for her. Rose, it, it can't be. Rose. He burst into tears and covered his face. She knelt to wrap her arms around him. The dragons finally noticed what the humans were doing. The one from the kitchen growled something in a warning voice and stalked out of the room again. The other one shut the door and regarded Rose skeptically. Rose looked up at him and growled something that sounded like the language the dragons had been speaking. The dragon made a low, chuckling kind of noise. Ivy gasped. Could Rose speak dragon? Rose looked around in surprise, and Ivy remembered that she was invisible. She took a step closer to the reunited siblings. Beside her, she could feel Leaf's warm arm brushing hers, but he was silent, and she couldn't see his face to guess what he was feeling. Why isn't that dragon eating us? Stone asked lifting his head and grabbing Rose's hands. Are you in danger? Not at all, Rose said with a little laugh. This is my dragon, Prince Smolder. Your dragon, Stone echoed. Well, he thinks I'm his human, Rose said. It's basically the same thing in the end. Why didn't the other one eat me? Stone asked. Rose laughed again. I think she thought you were me. She's driven me out of her kitchen more than once, and I think she's also yelled at Smolder about keeping me away from her food. She thinks I'm a mouse, basically, who's going to leave holes in all her cheese. I mean, fair, I do actually do that sometimes. Anyway, so she saw you, thought you were me, brought you over here to yell at Smolder, and then discovered that I was already here, which meant she'd picked up a wild human, which apparently gave her quite a fright. Ivy couldn't contain herself any longer. She dragged Leaf over to crouch beside them. What did you say to him? She whispered. Were you speaking dragon? Rose jumped and twisted around to search the room with her eyes. Um, she said. Stone, did you just hear another human voice? There are two others with me, Stone said. Can you make that dragon go away? Rose stood up, put her hands on her hips and said something bossy sounding to the dragon. He laughed again and pointed at Stone. She shook her head, stamped her foot, and repeated herself. Still laughing and shaking his head, Prince Smolder sauntered out of the room and closed the door behind him. Ivy whipped off the chain. Oh my gosh, you do speak dragon. Not really, Rose said ruefully. I only know a few phrases and apparently my pronunciation is abominable. Also, I'm pretty sure Smolder thinks I'm just an adorable mimic. He keeps laughing at everything I try to say, so I think I told him to get me some dried apricots, but we'll see what he actually comes back with. Who are you, by the way? I'm your niece, Ivy said. I'm Ivy. Not my daughter, Stone said as she turned to him. He looked a lot more relaxed with the dragon out of the room. Heaths. Rose's eyebrows shot up, and she laughed. Seriously? Heath had kids? Who was silly enough to marry him? Do you remember Lark? Stone said. Her. And just one kid. Just Ivy. Ah, Lark, Rose said. She could have done so much better. Heath is the lord of the town now, Stone said with a shrug. And he's the famous dragon slayer. It doesn't get much better than that. Rose snorted. You know what I mean. So, wow, I have a niece. Nice to meet you, Ivy. And who's this? I'm Leaf. He held out his hand to shake hers. This is wild, Rose said, grinning from ear to ear. I haven't seen another human being in 20 years. And suddenly, it's like the palace is full of them. We've come to rescue you, Ivy said. That's right, 
Stone said, taking one of Rose's hands in both of his. I would have come years ago if I'd known you were still alive, Rose. I thought you died that night. I don't know how you've survived in this palace for so long, but we can take you home now. Rose looked from Stone to Ivy and back. But I don't need rescuing, she said. I don't want to leave. That's ridiculous, Stone said slowly. Of course you want to escape this place. Of course you want to come home. I don't, actually, Rose said, disentangling her hand from his. Because of exactly that tone of voice, Stone. Why would I want to go back to the people who spent my whole life telling me what to do and who to be and what not to do and what was wrong with me? Dad had a husband all picked out for me, someone who could finally calm me down, in his own words. Someone who could trap me in a boring life in a boring little village, everything I didn't want. You want this instead? Stone asked, waving his hand to the dragon's room. Yes, Rose said. Life in a dragon palace, Stone. It's never, ever boring here. Who else can say they've lived with dragons? Ivy thought wistfully that she could see the appeal. She wished she could stay and explore and meet all of Rose's dragon friends, and maybe even learn dragon too. But we have to get back for Violet and Foxglove and Commander Brooke and all the others. Aunt Rose, you have to come home with us, Ivy said. You're my big plan for making peace between my dad and the Wing Watchers. I think if he sees you, if he finds out you're alive, He'll stop feeling so guilty and awful all the time. He'll be able to listen to reason, and he won't be so mad, and then we can fix all the things he's done. She rubbed the back of her neck. Well, not all the things, but the things he's doing now, at least. Heath feels guilty and awful, Rose said with a skeptical expression. About me? Um, Ivy said. She thought of the combination code on her dad's treasure, and the fact that he'd never mentioned Rose to her. But he must think of his sister. He must feel guilty and awful about losing her. Who wouldn't? I think so. Rose shook her head. You can tell him I'm alive, but I'm not coming back. Whatever's going on with him, it's not about me, kid. Heath never listened to reason, and he was always losing his temper over little things. Me being there won't change him. I'm not going back into a situation where he's the new boss of me, same as Dad, the old boss of me. But Rose, Stone said helplessly, it's too dangerous for you to stay here. Dragons can't be trusted. What makes you think humans can? Rose asked. Dragons are no worse than we are. Smolder has taken care of me for 20 years, and I'm happy here. These dragons destroyed our village. Stone said. They burned it down, Rose. We live underground now. Dragons are burning down human settlements all across the continent. They hate us. I don't know why they haven't killed you yet, but I'm sure they will at some point. They're burning villages? Rose echoed. She looked at Ivy, who nodded. I think they're looking for something, Ivy said. We met one who was searching for the treasure, but when we took Dad's and gave it to her, she clearly couldn't find what she wanted. She needed something specific that wasn't in the treasure Dad stole. Oh, Rose said. She looked toward one of the high windows, where a ray of moonlight was slipping through the glass. Huh. Maybe it was in one of the bags you left behind, Stone. Left behind, Stone echoed. You left two whole bags, Rose said. I went to all that trouble and you only took half of what I stole. She grinned at him, but he looked too heartsick to be amused. What happened to you? He asked. After we abandoned you. The queen knocked me into a sand dune, she said. I landed weird, and I must have sprained my ankle. There was so much fire and smoke and sand flying everywhere. Remember? It was hard to see anything. By the time I struggled back to the queen, she was dead and you guys were running for the hills. I knew I couldn't carry the rest of the treasure and follow you. I didn't even think I could catch up to you at all, especially since, like, 
A million dragons were coming out of the palace to see what all the noise was about. So I hid the treasure, in a most excellent place, if I do say so myself, and I buried myself in the sand, hoping they wouldn't find me. But they did find you, Stone said in a hollow voice. He dropped his head into his hands. Not for a while, Rose pointed out. And luckily, it was Smolder who dug me out. I didn't even realize he was a prince until a few days ago. I thought he just worked for the new queen, but it turns out he's her brother. Isn't that wild? My dragon is royalty. Can you get the treasure you hid? Ivy asked. And give it back to the dragons? You're, it would be real tricky, Rose said. She saw Ivy's expression and added quickly, but I can try. I will try. She gave Ivy a little smile. I'd have to stay here to do that, though, which is what I want to do anyway, big brother. Smolder is my friend, and I don't want to leave him, especially now that I know a little bit of the language, thanks to Wren. Beside Ivy, Leaf started and gave Rose a sharp look. Who? he asked. The girl who really speaks dragon, Rose said. She was here to save her dragon, and she taught me a little after I basically threw myself at her feet and begged. There's another girl with a dragon, Ivy said. Who can talk to them? Why am I living the completely wrong life over here? And her name was, Leaf prompted Rose. Wren, she answered. He put his hands to his head and gripped his hair for a moment, as though he needed to convince himself that he was still on the planet and everything really existed. There are probably lots of wrens, he said to Ivy. Right? It's not an uncommon name. Oh, Ivy realized suddenly. Your sister, she cried. Her name was Wren. But it's not. It couldn't be, he started. She did look a bit like you, now that you mention it, Rose said thoughtfully. She didn't say where she came from. About 14 years old? Curly hair? Extremely fierce? Leaf looked as though ghosts had suddenly burst through all the walls and started yelling in his face. He didn't seem able to speak. Where is she? Ivy asked Rose. She left earlier tonight, Rose said. On her dragon. They flew off east, toward the mountains. I'm so sorry. I don't know any more than that. Leaf grabbed Ivy's hand. I have to go after her, he said. Ivy, if that's really my sister, after all this time, I have to go after her right now. Chapter 35 Leaf The world around Leaf had suddenly come into bright, sharp focus as though he'd been underwater up until Rose said Wren's name and shocked him into this new place, as though maybe he'd been underwater since he was eight years old. It's probably not her, he tried to tell himself. Don't get your hopes up. How could it possibly be her? Because it's me, Wren shouted in his head. Of course I would survive being fed to dragons. I probably ate them. But if it was her? and she was really alive. What should he do? What could he do? He felt like he should be running, but which way, and how? This is my actual destiny, he thought. Finding Wren. This is what I should have been doing my whole entire life. I should have known she survived. I should have left home that same night and tried to find her. That was my true purpose. It is. I just had no idea. You said east, he said to Rose. How long ago did she leave? Long enough that you won't catch her on foot, Rose pointed out. On horseback, Ivy suggested. Our horses are pretty tired, but she trailed off as Rose shook her head. No, what you need, Rose said briskly, is another dragon. One that's faster than Skye, which is most of them, I suspect. I mean, he's cute but he's much smaller than Smolder. Yes, Ivy cried. You have to follow her on a dragon. Leaf's legs decided to stop working for a moment, and he sat down hard on one of the shiny green pillows. You two are both living in a fantasy world, Stone said, pointing at Ivy and Rose. 
where dragons can ever be cute or sweet or friendly. In the real world, dragons are monsters who eat people. A dragon will definitely eat this poor boy if you try to make him ride one. They are not monsters, Rose cried in outrage. And you did it yourself, Ivy interjected. Uncle Stone, you rode a dragon from the desert back to Valor. Remember? With your invisibility necklace on, Leaf could do the same thing. He frowned at her, working his jaws so his beard went up and down. I've also stabbed a dragon queen in the eye, he said. I wouldn't consider myself a role model. But that proves it can be done, Ivy said. Leaf, you'll do anything to get to Ren, wouldn't you? Even ride a dragon? Yes, he said. And then he stood up and said it again, this time in a voice they could all hear. Yes, I'll do it. Then I know just the dragon, Rose said, leaping off the pillows. I call her Sweet Face. She's one of the night patrols, and I think she's actually sort of fond of humans. So even if she realizes there's a human on her, with luck she won't eat you. Fond of humans, Stone muttered, as they followed Rose out of the room, through a fascinating little human-sized flap built into the door. For breakfast, maybe. I'd offer you Smolder, Rose said apologetically, ignoring Stone. But he's very stubborn and just a smidgen bit lazy. And there's no way he'll fly out into the desert in the middle of the night. She crossed the tiled terrace and jumped down into the courtyard. What makes you think this dragon is fond of humans? Ivy asked. The three moons were all high overhead as they crossed through more courtyards, winding back through the palace toward the outer wall. Well, she loves me anyway, Rose said with a laugh. She makes these hilarious cooing noises every time she sees me, like I'm an adorable baby rabbit or something. Sometimes she sneaks me treats, even though I'm pretty sure Smolder has grumbled at her about it. So you are a pet, Stone growled. Rose shrugged. I don't see it that way. Besides, even if I am, I'm a pet who gets to fly on a dragon, which is objectively awesome. Leaf will tell you I'm right when he gets back. If he gets back, Stone muttered ominously. Leaf was having a hard time concentrating on the conversation between freaking out about Ren and freaking out about being moments away from trying to ride a dragon. Do you have any advice? He asked Stone. Like, any tips on dragon riding? Number one, don't do it, Stone said, rather predictably. Number two, if you must be an idiot, hang on tight. Leaf caught Ivy and Rose doing matching eye rolls. I thought 20-year-old you was curmudgeonly, Rose said, elbowing him in the side. I had no idea how much worse you could get. Wait, he was like this even back then? Ivy asked. Like what? Stone demanded. Brooding, Rose offered. Overprotective? A little judgy? Yeah, definitely. Ivy giggled, and Stone gave Rose an offended look. I beg your pardon, he said. How am I supposed to be an intimidating authority figure to my niece if you keep making fun of me? Even through his nervousness, Leaf could see that being around Rose was bringing down some of the walls around Stone. Ivy thought finding Rose would fix her dad. But I think the person it's going to help the most is Stone, the real dragon slayer. They finally reached a tower not far from the outer wall, and everyone fell silent as they focused on climbing the spiral staircase inside. Several of the stairs were covered in drifts of sand that had blown in through the narrow windows. Leaf got the feeling the stairs were rarely used. He guessed most dragons would just fly to the top, and he wondered whether there were any who preferred the stairs, or why they'd been built in the first place. It was an exhausting climb, with each stair nearly as tall as they were, and by the end, he and Rose were helping pull Ivy and Stone up the last few steps. At the top, they emerged onto a huge stone circle high above the rest of the palace. There was no railing, nothing to stop a person from walking right off the edge, which gave Leaf a weird lurch of dizziness. He tried looking up instead, 
into the endless spray of stars that glittered overhead. A comet blazed in the center of them all, bright as one of the moons and nearly as big. The wind tugged at them, colder and clearer away from the stench of blood in the palace. There's nobody up here, Ivy pointed out. She'll be here soon, Rose said. She flies out to scout the desert a few times a night. You and Stone should hide, and I'll distract her so Leaf can climb on. She gestured to the invisibility chain. Ivy gently draped it over Leaf's head and looped it around his neck a few times. Her hands paused on his shoulders, and she pulled him into a hug. It's so weird to hug someone you can't see, she whispered. Thank you for helping me, he whispered back. I hope you find Wren. Her breath was warm against his neck. And bring her back, so I can meet her and her dragon. I mean, I hope you find her so you can see her again, not just so I can meet her dragon. I mean, that would be amazing, but that's not the only, you know what I mean. He laughed. I shouldn't take this, he said, touching the chain and moving one of her hands to rest on the links. You'll need it to get out of the palace. You need it more, she said. Besides, apparently we're friends with the Prince of the Sand Dragons, so I think we'll be okay. She hesitated, then slid her hands up his neck to cup his face. I hope you'll come back, though. I mean, I understand if you need to stay on her trail once you're out there, but if you don't catch her tonight, and Sweet Face brings you back here, I promise you, Leaf, I'll help you look for her. We'll find your sister, no matter what. I will come back to you, he promised, and I'll help you free your friends. She smiled. Hey, quit that. I'm the one making noble declarations about your destiny right now. But noble declarations are my whole thing, he said with a grin. She pulled his face closer and reached up to kiss him, but her lips landed awkwardly on the side of his nose, and she broke away with a laugh. All right. It is even weirder to kiss someone you can't see, she said, or mostly said, before he interrupted by kissing her back. Here she comes, Rose whispered. Ivy, hide. Good luck, Ivy said against his lips, and then Leaf's arms were empty, and she was vanishing down the stairs after Stone. He looked through his hands, feeling about a hundred million different things, and then he looked up and saw pale yellow scales and long curved claws descending toward him. He stepped back as the dragon landed in a gust of warm air and cocked her head at Rose. Just another dragon, he told himself. You should be an expert on these by now, Leaf. How many other humans have been carried around by four different dragons and still survived? If Rose is right, this one is like the brown one. Not terrifying at all. It wasn't an entirely convincing speech, though, with the massive dragon towering only a few steps away from him, her venomous tail coiled up like a scorpion's behind her. Rose waved up at the dragon and bounced on her toes a little bit. Hi, sweet face, she called. Who's a big, sweet dragon? The sand dragon's face cracked into a giant grin, and she lowered her head to Rose's eye level. Urgle, Sweet face warbled affectionately. This is my chance, Leaf realized. Rose made a little gesture with her hand, and he sprinted over to the dragon's front leg, which was bent in a crouch. He made a flying leap onto the smooth scales and scrambled up toward her shoulder. Raw? Sweet face made a puzzled noise and shook her leg, as if she'd felt an insect on it. Leaf had to throw himself up the last stretch grabbing her wing and tossing himself onto her back. At the same time, Rose burst into song and started dancing a busy foot-stamping dance in front of the dragon. Sweet Face swung her head back and stared at her for a moment with a delighted expression, then looked over her shoulder again to see what was on her back. Leaf lay still, wedged between the frill along her spine and the curve of her wing. Sweet Face shook herself all over, then twisted her neck around the other way, clearly confused about why she could feel something on top of her, but not see anything. Rose stopped dancing and patted one of Sweet Face's talons. The dragon looked down at her and smiled again, and then lifted her head, 
as a second sand dragon came whooshing in over the outer wall. The two dragons roared something at each other. And suddenly, Sweetface crouched, sprang into the air, and flung out her wings. Leaf was so startled by the jolt that he nearly slid right off her, but he managed to grab her spinal frill at the last moment. He held on for dear life as the dragon soared over the palace wall and out into the desert sky. I'm flying, he thought in a terrified daze. I'm flying. Ren, I'm on a dragon. So am I, he imagined her saying with a nonchalant shrug. And mine's cuter. The sand rushed past below him in a blur. In the moonlight, the dragon's scales were as pale and colorless as the desert below, flickering with shadows as her wings beat up and down, up and down. This is a terrible idea. Which way did Ren go? Even if I knew, I can't steer this dragon. Are we going east? I think we are. Yes. When he risked lifting his head, he saw a ridge of dark mountains on the horizon ahead. Sweetface shook herself and peered over her shoulder again. Leaf imagined being her. It must feel like having an invisible squirrel on you would feel to a human. Fairly unsettling, he was sure, but he was also in a spot too awkward for her to reach with her talons. He hoped her scales were less sensitive than skin, and maybe she would get used to his weight after a while. She flew straight toward the mountains for a long while, scanning the desert and the skies with sharp movements of her head. Leaf tried to search the sky, too, for any sign of a dragon up ahead. He couldn't hear anything except the rush of wind, the steady thrum of the dragon's wings, and the faint thump of her heartbeat. Was that something? A flicker of motion in the distance, flying over the silver ribbon of a river. Sweetface saw it, too. She whipped her head toward it, then tilted her wings to soar closer. Leaf held his breath as they approached. It was another dragon, as pale as Sweetface in the moonlight, flapping its wings with slow, concentrated effort. Leaf wasn't sure if he was imagining the dark shape curled on its back. They were close, nearly close enough to fly right over the strange dragon in a few more wing beats. When Sweetface checked herself in the air, made a non-committal noise, and veered back toward the palace. Wait, Leaf thought frantically. We were so close. He pressed his feet into the dragon's wing, trying to turn her around. She yelped and twisted in a circle, reaching for her back. He ducked her claws and threw his arms around her neck and leaned hard to the right. With another, more alarmed yelp, she flung her wings out and shook herself vigorously. She was as determined not to turn around as he was to make her turn, but she was probably a hundred times heavier than he was. Ren, Leaf shouted desperately at the top of his lungs. Ren, over here. He did not see Sweetface's tail come swinging out of the sky behind him. Suddenly, he felt the side of it smack into his chest, knocking him straight off her back. With his last coherent thought, he yanked the chain over his head as he fell. Chapter 36 Wren Wren would have ignored the commotion behind them. She was happy to lie on Skye's back, feeling the wind in her face as they left the desert and its creepy dragon queen in their dust. But Skye's ears were sharper than hers, especially when they were flying, and he paused to look back. What? Wren asked. I thought I heard someone shout your name, he said. Wren laughed. That seems literally impossible. Oh, wait, no. I do have another friend now. Is it Rose? She sat up and looked in the same direction. A sand dragon was in the sky behind them having some kind of mid-air seizure. It twisted and flared its wings and grabbed at its back and whacked itself with its own tail and generally seemed to have lost its mind. Yikes, Wren said. I think let's stay far away from whoever that is. Wait, Skye said. He pointed. Look, she dropped something. Wren squinted. There was something falling from the dragon. Something rather big, actually. What if you were right, 
she said. Sky, could that be Rose? Sky was already powering toward the shape as fast as his wings could fly. But that's not Smolder, Ren called over the rush of the wind. Why would she be riding a different dragon? She wasn't expecting an answer. Sky was putting all his energy into his wing strokes. I don't think we can make it, Ren thought with alarm. It was too far off and falling fast. Oh, I hope we're wrong. I hope that's not Rose. She'd only really spent one day with the other woman, but Rose had found the key to save Sky, and she'd understood everything Ren had never expected another human to understand. The strange dragon gave herself one last shake and stopped writhing. She looked down, saw Sky soaring toward her, saw his talons reaching out, saw the shape below her plummeting toward the sand. She gave a yell of horror and dove after it. Ren leaned forward with a gasp. They were close enough now that she was sure it was a person, arms and legs flailing in the air. The other dragon's claws caught him a few heartbeats above the ground. Sky landed beside her a moment later, just as the dragon was gently setting the human on his feet. Ren slid off Sky's back and floundered through the sand. Rose, she called. The human turned toward her. It was not Rose. It was a boy, around Ren's age, with short dark hair and a sword strapped to his back and an oddly familiar dumbfounded expression. Ren, he said. She stopped short and stared at him. He said, Ren, and then he said it again. Ren, it is you, isn't it? And it didn't make sense because nobody knew her. Nobody said her name like they were looking for her. Nobody was out there thinking of her. Except here was somebody who said, Ren, like she had actually been missed by someone. All these years, after all. He came toward her through the sand wobbly and awkward, as though he'd just flown on a dragon for the first time. There were tears in his eyes. It's me, he said. Your brother. It's Leaf. Ren found herself looking down at the sand just to see if it was still there, and then at the dragons. Yes, they were there too, watching curiously. She was not somehow back in Talisman, and she was not dreaming. Well, that's surprising, she said. He laughed, a kind of bark of relief, and then he was suddenly hugging her, and three moons. Human hugs were nothing like dragon hugs. Ren couldn't remember if this had ever happened to her before. Had her parents ever hugged her before they fed her to dragons or any of her sisters? No, only Leaf, long ago, when I was small and lost the snail he carved for me. Ren, he said. I just rode on a dragon and fell off and nearly died. I have to sit down. He dropped onto the sand, shoved something in his pocket, and rubbed his face. Clumsy of you, Ren said. I ride a dragon, like, all the time, and haven't nearly died even once. She sat down next to him, next to her brother. Her brother who remembered her name, who'd ridden a dragon to find her. I thought you were dead, he said. All these years, mother and father said you'd disobeyed the dragon mancers, and so the dragons got you. I knew they would say that, she cried. I told you they would, didn't I? She turned and looked at Skye, who nodded sympathetically. That's such a total lie, those lying liars. I can't believe I believed them, Leaf admitted. Rowan finally told me the truth not too long ago. When I think about all the people who lied to me, who knew exactly what the dragon mancers did to you, but did nothing to help you, it makes me so angry, Ren. Welcome to my life, she said. How funny that it was Rowan. She wasn't even there. I always wondered whether any of our sisters knew the true story. She tried to stop them, actually, Leaf said. They ended up locking her in the cellar while they took you. Rowan tried to stop them? Ren tried to wrap her head around that. Rowan had never paid one iota of attention to her littlest sister. On some days, Ren would have guessed that Rowan didn't even know her name. On others, 
she knew she'd annoyed Rowan enough that she'd have happily fed Wren to the dragons herself. She would never, never have imagined Rowan trying to fight for Wren's life. Leaf took a deep breath. He lifted a handful of sand and watched it pour through his fingers. The truth is, she thinks she's the reason you were sacrificed. Mother found one of the books you stole from the Dragon Mancers, and Rowan told her you took it. Oh, she would, Wren cried. I mean, I guess that's fair, though, since I did. Do you remember what was in it? Leaf asked. I figure you must have read some awful secret about them, and that's why they decided to get rid of you. Wren remembered the feel of those books in her small, seven-year-old hands, heavy and smooth and crisply important smelling. She barely remembered anything inside them, though. Lots of columns of numbers, she thought. Do you think that's really why? She pulled her legs into her chest and wrapped her arms around her knees. I thought they just decided I was annoying and loud and awful, and they didn't want me there anymore. I thought maybe... Maybe everyone agreed with them. Oh, Wren. Leaf put his arms around her again. It was different from having wings around her, but still comforting. She rested her head on his shoulder. Not me, he said. I missed you so much. You have no idea. I never stopped thinking about you. Really? She said. Not really. I mean, you were only eight. Yeah but you were my favorite sister, he said, and my best friend. I just, I didn't know how to be without you. I felt like I couldn't figure out who I was, or what to do with myself, or who to trust, or what was real. I could tell you those things, Wren said. I'm pretty clear on all that. I know, he said. I missed that. It was awful without you. I decided to be a dragon slayer. Can you imagine? She couldn't. Leaf, as she remembered him, had been a quiet, obedient kid who followed the rules and never caused trouble. She would never have pictured him with a sword or chasing after dragons. Why a dragon slayer, she said. The only one I've heard of sounds like a jerk, I have to say. Because of you, he said simply. I had this whole plan to avenge you. Rowan was training me, and I was going to kill the dragons who ate you. We got all the way to the mountain palace. But guess what? It turns out it's really hard to stab a dragon. Eh, she shrugged her shoulders under his arm. Not that hard. I've done it a couple of times. By all three moons, of course you have, he said with a laugh. Have you managed to kill one too? Yes, actually, she said. But he really had it coming. Are you serious? He pulled back to stare at her. Long story, she said. Go back to yours. He told her all about his time in the mountain palace, the dragons who nearly ate him, and the dragons who saved him, and Rowan and her friends, and how they were looking for treasure, and then his quest to find the dragon slayer, who really was a jerk, she was right about that, and a city of valor, and ivy, 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 and looking for Rose, and how she didn't want to be rescued which made perfect sense to Wren, and how he had ended up flying on a strange dragon in the middle of the night. Wow, she said when he finished. It sounds almost as exciting as my life. Not quite, but close. He grinned at her, and she had a flash of being seven again, back when her primary goal every day was to prove that she was just as smart and brave and tough as her big brother. I can't believe you wrote a dragon just to find me, she said. She wouldn't have thought there was a human in the world who would do that for her. I would have ridden a different wild dragon every day to find you, if I'd known you were alive, he said. I really should have known. My first thought when they told me was, Wren would never stay still long enough to be eaten by dragons. And what dragon would be dumb enough to try to eat her? Wren laughed. So how did you survive? He asked. Tell me everything about your life. Everything I missed. I actually want to tell him, Wren realized. She'd always kept her life with Skye so secret, it was strange to think of sharing it all with someone else. First Rose, and now Leaf. What was happening to her? Well, she said, 
Let me introduce you to the most important part. Behind them, the two dragons had been chatting quietly. From the snatches of conversation she'd overheard, Ren gathered that the sand dragon was asking Skye about where he'd found his human pet and how often he had to feed her. Ren had decided not to be outraged about this, since the dragon had saved Leaf from falling to his death after all. Skye, she called. Come meet my brother. Brother, Skye echoed in human, bounding over to them. Hello, brother. Leaf's eyebrows made her run for his hair, and his mouth dropped open. Did that dragon just talk? He asked. He can talk? They can all talk, Goober, Ren said. But he's the only one who speaks our language, because he's a perfect genius. This is Skye. She put one hand on Skye's snout. He leaned into her palm, his cold scales like river pebbles under her fingertips. One of his wings folded around her back, shielding her from the desert night wind. He's my very best friend. Skye, this is my brother, Leaf. Leaf, Skye said. The name sounded a little odd in his voice, but also quite right. She could see that Skye was trying to make a good impression, perhaps to prove her perfect genius description. Using only human, he said, It is most beyond wonderful to meet you. It is most beyond wonderful to meet you, too, Leaf said. Skye stuck out one talon, and Leaf gravely rested one hand on it for a moment. Thank you for taking care of my little sister. Oh, heck no, Ren objected. I take care of him. It is quite difficult, Skye said seriously to Leaf. She is always getting into trouble. Really? It's very lucky that I... He dissolved into giggles and fell over on the sand. You are an extremely silly turtle face, Ren told him affectionately in their hybrid language. Ivy would love to see this, Leaf said. She believes that humans and dragons could get along instead of fighting. I think that's true of most dragons, Ren said. And some humans, maybe. Can I take you to her? He asked. The sky was turning a pale orange the color of Skye's scales as the sun rose beyond the mountains. I should take this back to her so she can get out of the palace. He took out the invisibility chain and held it so it gleamed in the sun. Sky made an ooh sound and touched it with one claw. I don't want to take Sky back into the desert palace, Ren said. I'm worried about that queen. We avoided her before, but we might not be so lucky a second time. But maybe this dragon with the adoring expression can take you back and get you all out of there, and then I can meet you somewhere safe. She turned toward the sand soldier and switched to dragon. Hey friend, could you do us a favor? The dragon looked enormously delighted. She makes dragon noises, she said to Skye. You've trained her so well. That's the cutest thing I've ever seen. I don't just make dragon noises, Ren said crossly. I speak dragon. That's so impressive, Sweetface said, still talking to Skye. Wow, I didn't know they could do that. I don't think Smolder has his trained nearly so well. What else can she say? I can say, hey, stop being a dimwit and listen to me, Ren shouted. Oh, my goodness, sweet face cooed. I love her. I want to snuggle her and put little hats on her. Ren threw her hands in the air. Sky, would you please ask this ridiculous dragon to fly Leaf back to the palace safely, and then to hop him and Ivy and Stone back over the wall to their horses before anyone catches them? Sky relayed those instructions with a wickedly amused expression. Ren had a feeling she'd be hearing about little hats for years. Sweetface, whose real name turned out to be Sirius, but Ren rather thought the name Sweetface suited her better, was delighted to be helpful to the adorable scavengers and thrilled to give Leaf another ride. A safer one this time, she chortled. What a clever little squirrel he is. Invisible, so cute. We'll meet you back in the forest below the mountains, Leaf said. He described the burned village to Ren, 
and where it was in relation to the twin peaked mountain at the southern end of the range, and who she might run into once she got there. We traveled down there a couple of years ago, Wren said. We didn't stay long, but I probably walked right over Valor and didn't realize it was there. Ooh, I can add it to my map, which, incidentally, is much bigger and more detailed than your little mountain palace map. I'm sure it is, Leaf said with a laugh. So, see you in a couple of days. You promise you'll be there? He was holding one of her hands, like he was afraid it might vanish if he let it go. If I'm not, Wren said, just hop on another dragon and fly around until you run into me. I will, though, he said. You'd better be there, or I'll tear up the whole continent looking for you. She punched him lightly in the shoulder. Deal. He climbed back onto Sweetface, with a lot of ineffectual help and little boosts, and enchanted baby talk from the sand dragon. Wren leaned against Sky and waved as they took off into the sky and arrowed west toward the palace. That dragon was goofy, she said to Sky once they were gone. I had no idea there were dragons as silly as my sister Bluebell. She hadn't thought about Bluebell in years, or Rowan, or anyone else in Talisman. Only Leaf, when she couldn't stop herself, and the dragon mancers, when she couldn't keep the nightmares at bay. I had no idea there were other humans as marvelous as you, Sky said. Almost as marvelous, Wren said. He missed me. Did you hear that part? He actually cared that I was gone. She felt like her heart was doing what Sky's wings did when they caught a new air current, rising up and out toward the sun. Of course he did, said Sky. You're Wren. You're extremely lovable. He cast her a sly, sideways look. Of course, you would be more lovable in a little hat. You're the one who's going to wake up in a little hat one day, Wren yelped climbing onto his outstretched talon. Just you wait. I'll make you one shaped like a snail, and then you won't be able to resist it. Like a snail, he breathed, his eyes shining. Wren settled onto his back and looked up at the comet, still faintly visible as the sunlight spread toward it. Leaf was kind of like that comet, hurtling into her life like a new extra moon out of nowhere. Wren, Sky said before he lifted off, I'm very glad you have found some humans who are almost as marvelous as you. Me too, Ren answered, surprising herself. Me too. Chapter 37 Ivy Ivy met Ren and Skye in the ruins of the ancient temple, in a forest glittering with raindrops from the storm the night before, and her first thought was, this is going to change my life and everybody's lives, forever. Sky was a mountain dragon. She could see that immediately from his bone structure and the size of his wings, even though his scales were much closer to peach than red or orange, and his eyes were tranquil, pale blue. He was lying in the grass at the foot of the temple steps, his wings folded gently behind him, watching a caterpillar as it climbed a dandelion. On the steps, Daffodil was sitting with a teenage girl, with wild, dark curls and freckles all across her nose and arms. They were both laughing as Ivy, Leaf, and Stone rode out of the woods. Ivy! Daffodil shrieked, making Sky's wings flare up with alarm. She leaped down and pelted over to Ivy's horse, catching Ivy in a hug as Ivy slid off. Guess what? She cried, before Ivy could say anything. I rode a dragon! Me! Remember how Violet said I never, ever would? Well, ha, I totally did. This is him, the very best dragon in the world. Isn't he handsome? She flourished her arms at Sky, who rolled onto his back and beamed at them both. And this is Wren, Leaf said, smiling at his sister. Ah, yes, Stone said. The other lunatic who befriends dragons. Nice to meet you. He tipped his head gathered the reins of the thirsty horses, and walked them off to the nearest stream. Skye watched them go with a delighted expression. Half, horses, look at their amazing manes, they're so cool. And half, I traveled the same distance and I'm not tired.
you silly animals. Hi, Ren, Ivy said. I hope she likes me. Leaf talks about you all the time. Hi, Ren said. You must be the magical Ivy. I never said magical, Leaf objected, looking embarrassed. Well, I thought that would be less embarrassing for everyone than all the things you did say about her, Ren offered. Ren, he yelped. Oh, wow, Daffodil said, giving Ren an awestruck look. You've missed out on so many years of being a little sister, but you're a natural. Stick with me, and I will teach you all my terrorizing ways. So, you're doomed, Ivy said to Leaf with a grin. He clutched his head in mock despair. Ivy's grin faded as she turned back to Daffodil. Has there been any news from Balor? She asked. Has my father done anything else terrible? She was scared that they'd been away too long, and she felt horribly guilty that they'd had an amazing dragon riding adventure without bringing anything back that would help their friends. Rose was probably right about my dad, she admitted to herself. And she understood why Rose would want to stay where she was, probably more than anyone but Wren would understand. But now, how is Ivy going to save Violet and Foxglove and the rest of Valor? She had one idea, but it involved asking an awful lot of someone she didn't even know. Daffodil shook her head and crouched beside Skye to scratch his chin. Forrest came by yesterday. He said things are still mostly the same, except more people are getting restless and upset with the dragon slayer the longer he spends searching for leaf. The wing watchers have been protectors of the village since before Heath was even born, back before we were underground. It's hard for everyone to see them as the enemy, Forrest said. But he also said that means your dad might not wait much longer. If he thinks he's losing control of valor, he might start executing people, even if he doesn't have the assassin from the indestructible city to hold up as proof. So we have to do something soon, Ivy said. Wren told me Rose said no, Daffodil said. Right, Ivy sighed. It was maybe not the most well-thought-out plan. Rather like giving all the treasure to a strange dragon? because you thought she was adorable, Leaf suggested. I'm going to find her one day, Ivy said, and it'll turn out that it was really useful and important for us to give her the treasure. I bet you anything. You wait and see. So what you need, Wren said suddenly, is some way to stop the dragon slayer, right? Right, Ivy said. We want him to free everyone he arrested, and ideally step down from power so someone else can run Valor. It's hard to imagine anything that would convince him to do that, though. Well, I'm no fan of humans who stab dragons for treasure, Wren said. And the dragon slayer has caused problems all over this continent. If there's anything I can do to help take him down, sign me up. Ivy twisted her hair around her finger and glanced at Daffodil. I did think of one possibility, she said slowly. But it's kind of risky. Ren looked over at Leaf and took his hand. I trust anyone Leaf trusts, she said. Tell me your idea. What is this plan? Skye asked, as the three of them hiked toward Valor. Ivy, Ren, and the dragon. He nearly ran into another low branch and made a hilarious grumpy face at it. Ivy couldn't stop watching him. She had this constant impulse to babble at him about how perfect he was, and she was repressing it with great difficulty. Explain it to me again. We're going to terrorize a town, Wren said. We're going to strike fear in the hearts of all the puny villagers, just like every little dragon dreams of doing. Do they? Skye asked. We? Dragons? Did you say terrorize? Really? Us? Mostly you, she said, whacking aside a large fern with a stick. Mwahaha! Cower in terror, all you cowards who send your enemies into the jaws of dragons. Mostly me, Skye said. Have you met me? I don't think I should try to scare anyone. No, no, definitely don't try, Wren said. Just stand there and frown a little bit. Yes, like that. 
But let's try a bit more angry, a bit less confused. All you have to do is look terrifying. I'll do all the talking, Ivy promised. I'm confused. Sky spread his wings and tipped them from side to side to catch the sun on his scales. The main thing to remember, Ren said, is don't speak human in front of them. Only dragon. I'll translate for Ivy if you need to say anything. And do not smile at anyone. No picking up snails or cooing at kittens. There will be kittens there? Sky cried, his face lighting up. No, no, not that face, Ren protested. She batted at his wings as they got in her way. The opposite of that face. Sky mustered a small frown, and Ren sighed. I hope this works, she said to Ivy. We're working with exactly the worst dragon for the job, I'm afraid. I'm right here, Sky said indignantly. Yes, but you know this about yourself, Ren pointed out. The people of Valor won't know any different, Ivy said. All dragons are scary to them. She led the way to the biggest entrance to Valor, the one built for horses, hidden by a net of branches. Ivy noted that no one was guarding it. She'd have expected to find one of her dad's mercenaries, but it didn't surprise her that he'd keep his goons with him instead. With most of the wing watchers and Commander Brooke locked up, was anyone protecting the town? We'll have to make this bigger, Ren said, studying it. It was still not quite big enough for a dragon, even a small one. I know, I feel guilty about this, Ivy said. People worked hard on these tunnels, but we need to get you in there, so whatever you have to do. Sky stepped forward and clawed the top of the tunnel opening. Dirt and earthworms and beetles rained down as he made the entrance bigger and bigger, until finally there was a gaping hole in the side of the mountain. Inside, the tunnels widened enough for him to wiggle in if he folded his wings in close. Ivy led the way, with Ren walking behind Sky's tail. I'm home, she thought. But after flying on the golden dragon and creeping through the desert palace and living in the forest temple, somehow nothing about Valor felt like home anymore. All the familiar tunnels and caves seemed like uncomfortable tunics that no longer fit her. As she walked deeper and deeper, it felt like climbing back into a box after finally escaping from it. The first people who saw them screamed, dropped their baskets, and ran. That brought other people out of their caves, setting off a chain reaction of commotion and panic. Into the main hall, Ivy shouted. This dragon has a message for us. If we listen, he may leave peacefully. She nearly crashed into Forrest, who was standing frozen in the middle of the tunnel, gaping up at Sky. Sky blinked pleasantly down at him, then seemed to remember his instructions and plastered a weird scowl on his face. Ivy, what are you doing? Forrest said in a hoarse voice. Saving everyone, she said. I hope. It's complicated. Get everyone to come to the main hall. He turned and ran, and she beckoned Sky forward. The tunnel ended at the central gathering hall, a huge natural cave studded with rock formations and laced with crystals, white and pomegranate pink and lime green melting into one another. The ceiling was high enough for Sky to stand on his hind legs and stretch his wings. Ivy saw Wren hop onto his tail and balance along his spine until she was standing on his shoulder. About three quarters of the people in Valor were packed into the farthest corner of the cave, huddled together in fear, staring up at the dragon. Sky let out a pleasant growl. All of them screamed and fell over one another, trying to get farther away. Don't worry, one of the men at the front shouted. The dragon slayer is coming. He'll save us. Tell him to hurry, Ivy said, grabbing the man and pushing him out into the tunnels. Tell him the dragon is holding me hostage and the citizens of Valor need him. She thought for a moment. If that doesn't work, tell him the dragon is holding an enormous ruby. But there's no, the man sputtered, looking at Skye's empty talons. Just tell him, Ivy said. He bolted away, shouting, Heath, Heath, dragon slayer, help. 
There's a person on top of that dragon, one of the women murmured, and they all looked up at Wren. Ivy knew Wren must hate the feeling of everyone staring at her, but the other girl just folded her arms and leaned against Skye's neck like she could wait all day. Finally, they heard scuffling in the corridor, and after a long moment, a whole group of the armed mercenaries came in, pushing Ivy's dad in front of them. Did he get smaller? Ivy thought. She was so mad at him, but she also felt a stab of pity. He looked terrified. Heath was holding the sword he always carried around, but it was shaking like a branch in a hurricane, and his feet didn't seem to be working entirely properly. The guy behind him was nearly propping him up. Ivy glanced back at Wren and pointed to her dad. Wren nodded and nudged the dragon. That's your cue, Sky. Roar! Sky bellowed. The roar echoed off every corner of the small space, and several people clapped their hands to their ears. Even Ivy, who'd been expecting it, and who knew Sky would never hurt any of them, felt a wave of terror along her spine. It was a perfect roar. The dragon slayer shrieked, dropped his sword, and crumpled to the ground. I'm sorry, he shouted. I'm sorry. The other men with swords stared at him, then up at Skye's stern face. Or, to be more accurate, his trying to be stern face. But this was the closest these men had ever come to a dragon, and they had no practice reading dragon expressions. Roar! Skye hollered again. He gave Ren a, how was that? Look, and she patted his neck reassuringly. Ivy raised her voice so everyone could hear her. Citizens of Valor, this dragon has come to seek the man who murdered his queen. She knew only wing watchers would notice that Sky wasn't a sand dragon, and all the good ones were locked up. But it wasn't me, Heath wailed. I'm not the real dragon slayer. It was Stone. Stone is the one who killed her. He's the one you want. A gasp ran through the crowd followed by ripples of shocked murmurs. The men around Heath drew away from him, some of them with disgusted expressions. That's it, Ivy thought. He burned his own throne down. They'll never follow him again. But she had to make sure. His tribe demands justice, Ivy shouted. His tribe demands vengeance. Take him, cried one of the guards throwing down his sword and pointing at Ivy's father. He's right there. You can have him. Just please spare the rest of us. Yes, shouted several others, also flinging down their weapons. Ivy had expected and hoped for this, but she still wasn't impressed with their loyalty. Then again, her father had lied about killing a dragon, stolen treasure, banished subjects to the dangerous wilderness, and locked up anyone he thought might be a threat. He didn't exactly deserve any loyalty. Don't feel sorry for him, Ivy reminded herself. Not now. Stay focused. That is not enough, Ivy said. The dragons who captured me made their demands clear. They will destroy all of Valor unless... What? Someone shouted. Anything, called the woman who'd first noticed Wren. Unless we return the treasure he stole, Ivy said pointing at her father. The dragon slayer groaned with despair. And choose a new lord for our city. Everyone started talking at once. Where is the treasure, Heath? The men around him demanded. No, no, Heath wailed. It's mine, it's mine. I know where it is. Ivy's mother stepped between Heath and the angry guards. She rested one hand on Heath's shoulder for a moment then looked up and met Ivy's gaze. I can get the treasure. Lark, no, Heath cried. He started to stand up, but Skye growled lightly, and he curled into a ball again. Then run, the guard said to her. Go get it. Only if you free the wing watchers, Ivy said to him. Bring them all here. The guard nodded at two other men, who ran into the tunnels, Ivy cupped her hands around her mouth and called up to Skye. They're getting the treasure now. Please don't eat anyone. 
Ren nudged Sky and he roared again, although with a bit less gusto. He was clearly feeling sorry for the little worried humans. Very soon, Lark was back, carrying a large, mysterious sack. Ivy took it from her and checked inside. Her mother had filled it with all of the knickknacks Heath had gathered over the years, particularly the ones Lark disliked, including a particularly dreadful set of garishly painted plates. But from the outside, it looked like a believable sack of dragon treasure. Here is the treasure, Ivy called up to Sky, dropping the bag carefully at his feet. Sky made an ooh noise, peeked inside, and looked disappointed. Luckily, the crowd was distracted by the arrival of the guards, with several blinking prisoners in green uniforms behind them. I knew you'd do something, Violet said to Ivy, as Ivy hugged her fiercely. Didn't I say Ivy would do something? She said to Foxglove. Yes, but you didn't say she'd bring a dragon into valor, Foxglove whispered. Ivy, what is happening? Tell you later, I promise, Ivy whispered back. She stepped around Violet and took Commander Brooks' hand, pulling her out to stand in front of everyone. The commander's shoulders were tense, and her eyes were flicking rapidly between the dragon's claws and teeth. Trust me, Commander, Ivy said, squeezing her hand. She held it high and turned to face the rest of Valor. And here is our new lord, she called. What? Me? Shouldn't we have a vote? Commander Brooks said to Ivy, but her voice was drowned out by Violet shouting, Yes, Commander Brooke! And then the rest of the wing watchers, and then what sounded like the entire cavern, Commander Brooke, Commander Brooke! Sky gave an approving nod, picked up the sack of treasure, and awkwardly twisted himself around to head back into the tunnels with Wren. The crowd let out a cheer and surged toward the commander. Brooke raised her hands with a giant grin, trying to calm them down so she could speak. Ivy quietly stepped back from the celebrating townspeople. Her dad was huddled near the exit, his face buried in his hands. She edged through the crowd and knelt beside him. It's going to be all right, she said. It's going to be much better, actually. I'm nothing now, he said in a broken voice. I'm nobody. You're still my dad, she said, if you want to be. He reached out blindly, and she took his hand. She felt her mom come up behind her and hug her. Thank you for helping, Ivy whispered to her. You were extraordinary, Lark whispered back. Heath, don't overreact. You'll be happier this way. Being the Lord of Valor was never right for you. But my treasure he muttered sulkily. If losing your treasure is the worst punishment you get for everything you've done, Lark said, you'll be more lucky than you deserve. Let's go home. She hesitated. Ivy? Ivy shook her head. I'm sorry to leave you, she said, but I can't stay here. Not after everything I've seen outside. We're going to change the world, Mom. Now she knew it was possible. Dragons could learn to speak human. Humans could speak dragon. Ren and Sky proved that, and they were only the beginning. There were kind dragons out there. Thoughtful dragons. Dragons who liked humans. Dragons who were ready for peace. Ivy just had to find them. And with Ren and Leaf and Sky and anyone else who wanted to join them, she was going to try. Chapter 38 Leaf It was just a lovely coincidence that they arrived on Dragon Mancer Appreciation Day. The entire town of Talisman was gathered for the festival, awkwardly drinking apple cider and talking in loud voices about how wonderful the Dragon Mancers were, as they had to do every year. The sun was shining in a cloudless azure blue sky when Ren dropped into the town square on her dragon. Hello, she sang, sliding down his leg. I'm back. There was no screaming or running like there had been in Valor. In Talisman, the villagers stood petrified, their apple donuts halfway to their mouths. 
They stared at the dragonmancers, waiting for them to save them. Master Trout was caught by the food table with a mouthful of goat cheese. He blinked at the dragon in horror as Ren sauntered toward him. Hello, you very terrible person, she said. This is your last Dragon Mancer Appreciation Festival, I'm afraid. Remember me? No, he said in a choked voice. Yeah, you do, she said. She beckoned to Crow and Gorge, who were trying to sidle behind some of the bigger townspeople. Come on over and be appreciated, she called. In the trees, Leaf and Ivy darted around the outskirts of the village. They'd found Cranberry and Thyme two days earlier, hiding in one of the caves where Leaf used to train with Rowan. They told him that Rowan had gone back into the village on her own to bargain for Grove's life, and the dragonmancers had thrown her in jail. She'd refused to give them the treasure until Grove was free, and they'd refused to let either of them go until they had it. Because they won't actually let them go, Ren had said. They'll sacrifice them to the dragons as soon as they have it. She rubbed her hands together. But we're going to stop them. Are you sure you're up for this? Leaf asked her. I've been up for this for seven years, she pointed out. I just didn't think it would make any difference to anyone until you found me. And I didn't know what I knew until I was standing in valor, looking down at that treasure, and I realized what I'd read. Now that I do... I can't not do something. Leaf shimmied up to the top of the jail roof. From there, he had a clear view of Wren facing off against Master Trout. The dragon mancer looked old and pale, but every inch of him still radiated evil. He narrowed his eyes at Wren. You, he said slowly. Should be dead, she guessed. My dragon and I disagree. We think the world is better with me in it. Leaf smiled. He had started making a habit of telling Ren that every day. How? Master Trout started, and once again Ren jumped in to finish his sentence. Did I survive? She said. I used that temper and that bad attitude you were always complaining about. Listen, this conversation is going to take forever if we have to wait for you to complete a whole sentence. I'll just cut to the exciting part. Hey! Town of Talisman, did you know that your dragon mancers used to be treasure smugglers? They stole treasure from the Mountain Palace, probably more than once. But there weren't three of them back then. There were four. She held up four fingers and pivoted in a circle, making sure everyone's eyes were on her. Guess what happened to the fourth, Wren said. No, not you, Trout. We know you'll just lie. The fourth? Treasure smuggler, ladies and gentlemen, was the very first person our fine dragon mancers decided to sacrifice to the dragons. Why? Two great reasons. One, it was very dramatic. It established the dragon mancers as mystical visionaries who received messages from the dragons. Messages like, kill your friend for us, we're hungry today. Which are all lies, in case you're curious. But the second reason was more important, of course. The second reason was that with her dead, these three only had to split the treasure three ways. More treasure for them. Plus a town full of gullible idiots who worshipped at their feet. Two excellent upsides for just a tiny bit of murder. Lies, Crow hissed. You don't know anything, brat. Sky snarled at her and Crow staggered back into a table with a squeak of terror. He's doing a much better job of being scary suddenly, Leaf thought. This was the most ferocious he'd ever seen the gentle dragon look, because he's actually mad at these people. He knows what they did to Ren. And then some time passed, Ren went on, ignoring Crow. And they missed the treasure, but they were too lazy to go get more of themselves. Knew. Brilliant idea. Let's get some apprentices, train them up, use them as free servants for a while, and then send them off to the palace in our place. If they die there, no big deal. Just get another apprentice. But if they succeed and return with treasure, 
Wow, that's great. But then we have the dividing treasure four ways problem again. There'd be so much more treasure for the dragon mancers, plus a little useful fear in the hearts of the villagers, if we just had another sacrifice. Is that true? Called Leaf's old teacher. Did you send my nephew to the dragon palace? Is that how he really died? What about my daughter? Cried another. What happened to her? Now, now. Master Trout raised his hands with a superior, patronizing expression. Are you all seriously going to listen to the mad ramblings of a bitter teenager? Everyone knows teenagers are melodramatic and hysterical, especially the girls. Sky, eat this gross man, Wren said. Sky took a menacing step toward him, and Trout let out a shriek of fear, throwing his arms over his head. Wren held up her hand, and Sky paused. Just kidding. For now, anyway. Wren glanced around. I'm happy to show everyone the proof. Let's check the books. You know, the ones I read when I was seven, which made you decide a little girl was too dangerous to be allowed to live. Gorge, the keys to the Dragon Mancer's meeting house, please. Do not give them to her, Trout cried. The sky leaned forward with a growl, and Gorge quickly fumbled them out of his robe and tossed them to Wren. She lobbed them to Cranberry, who was already in place by the door of the meeting house. Cranberry unlocked the door, then removed the ring of keys and threw them up to Leaf. Hey, Gorge protested, as the Leaf vaulted off the roof and started sorting through the keys. You didn't say you'd be unlocking the jail as well. Surprise, Wren said. Let's think of it as payback for that one time when you didn't mention that you were feeding me to dragons. Lee found the right key and let himself into the damp, musty cell. Rowan was kneeling on the only cot, her eye pressed to a crack in the wall so she could see everything happening in the square outside. Her hair was matted, and she was thinner than before, but her face lit up like a sky full of lightning when she saw Leaf. It is you, she cried. I thought I was hallucinating. Am I hallucinating? I'm really here. Leaf said. He crouched to check on Grove, who was lying on the floor, looking ill. Grove gave him a weak smile. But out there, is that, it can't be, it is Wren. Leaf helped Grove to his feet. Rowan slung his other arm around her shoulders, and they all staggered back out into the sunshine. I can't believe it, Rowan whispered, staring at Wren. Her eyes drifted to the dragon then back to her long-lost sister. Cranberry emerged from the meeting house with three books stacked in her arms and carried them over to Wren. In a calm, ringing voice, Wren held up each one, explained the contents, and read a few passages. Lists of accumulated treasure, drafts of vision-related speeches and ceremonies, notes on each apprentice and how they died. The silence in the square was hollow, as though she read to a crowd of empty wax figures. She closed the last book and looked around. I don't care what you do with them, she said. That's up to you. But if I hear that any more kids are going missing in Talisman, we will come back, and we will burn all your houses down, and we will take the children away somewhere safe. Her eyes fell on a small boy. It was Butterfly, Leaf realized, not much taller than he had been when they hid in the cellar together six years ago. You be in charge of these, Wren said, placing the books in his arms. This is about all the glorious homecoming I can stand. Cranberry and Time came forward with horses and helped Rowan and Grove to climb on. They had a horse for Ivy and one for Leaf as well. Somebody moved, finally, in the frozen crowd. Leaf's father stepped forward, his hand outstretched toward his children. Wait, he called. Wren, no, she said to his face. No to you, and no to her. She nodded to their mother, close behind him. No, forever. She turned her back on them 
and climbed onto Sky. The dragon hissed at them, spread his wings, and vaulted into the air. Leave, his mother called. Rowan! Neither of them answered. They turned their horses and galloped away, following the trail of the dragon overhead. A long time later, Ren finally spiraled down to land by the river. She grinned at Leaf and Ivy as they rode up. Holy dragons, Ren, Ivy cried. You are so scary when you want to be. Eh, it was all right, Leaf said. I would have done a little more tugging on the heartstrings, maybe. Shut up, Ren said. Sky, splash this impertinent loudmouth for me. Sky enthusiastically whacked his tail in the river, dousing all of them as thoroughly as if they'd fallen in, including Ren. Ah! she yelped, holding out her drenched sleeves. Sky, naughty dragon. He chortled with delight and flapped his wings. Ren looked down and noticed Rowan, standing at Sky's feet and gazing up at Ren as though Ren might be a dragon herself. Leaf saw Ren hesitate before saying, Hey, Rowan. Ren, I'm so sorry, Rowan said. She reached up to touch Ren's foot and then pulled her hand back. I am so, so, so sorry I told on you about the books. I had no idea what would happen. Oh, that, Ren said. She thought for a moment. Hmm. No, I don't forgive you. Sky, eat my sister. Sky swung his head around and said something stern in their mixed up language. The only word Leaf caught was teasing. All right, all right. Ren leaned down and clasped Rowan's hand. I forgive you. For that, anyway. Not for making Leaf such a warrior, though. He's totally insufferable now. He forced me to, Rowan protested. He was driving me nuts about becoming a dragon slayer. Um, no offense she added quickly, glancing up at Sky. Thank you for not becoming a dragon slayer, Sky said to Leaf in human. Ivy started giggling at the astonished expressions on the others' faces. It would be very confusing to be friends with you if that was your job. I thought I had to slay dragons to protect people, Leaf said. I never thought I could actually work with a dragon to protect them instead. I'm very grateful, Rowan said and Grove nodded in agreement. What are we all going to do now? He asked. Well, Leaf said, you could take your stolen treasure and do something good with it. Like, build a town where people can actually be safe. People like the refugees living in the shadow of the indestructible city, Ren suggested. The ones whose villages have been burned, who need somewhere to go that will actually welcome them in and protect them. And tell them the truth about dragons, Ivy added. That we could communicate with them, if we try. That there's hope for peace. We could do that, Cranberry said. Dibs, I get to be mayor. But what about you three? Rowan asked. Don't you want to help build it with us? Maybe, when we come back, Ren said. We're trying out kind of a new idea for our destiny, Leaf added. He looked at Ivy, who smiled back at him. That's right, she said. We have a little golden dragon to find. Epilogue Undauntable From the window of the throne room, Undauntable could see half the world, and he found it all aggravating. There were the jagged teeth of the mountain range stretching north and south, full of dragons who might eat Wren. There was the blue-green river, winding away toward the sea, the one Wren always followed when she left. There was the forest, that was supposed to magically produce her again any moment, but there was no sign of her, and she kept not being there, moment after moment, day after day. It had been fifty-nine days since he'd proposed to her, and she'd stormed off. If she stayed away a full year again, that meant hundreds more days like this, long and boring and renless. But she can't, he thought to himself. She didn't get the supplies she needed. She doesn't have any books to read. So she has to come back sooner. 
It was not all right with him that she cared more about books than about seeing Undauntable, but at least she'd have to come back to the indestructible city. And maybe next time she'll stay. The spiked helmet was oppressively hot, and the spiky jacket was worse, jabbing him in weird places whenever he shifted his weight. He could feel sweat rolling down his back and gathering in his armpits. But he was only allowed to sit by the window if he wore his spikes, and this was where he had to sit if he wanted to see her coming. Sometimes Undauntable wondered what would happen if he decided to leave with her one day. What if he snuck away from his guards and followed her to wherever she went when she left him? He had no idea where that was. He'd always imagined a small village down the river somewhere, but sometimes she would say things or buy things that made him think she lived alone, traveling around instead of staying in one place. What would that be like? Seeing a new place every day instead of the same walls over and over again? It would be terrifying. Without the walls, the dragons could get you. Without the catapults and spikes and guards and weapons, you'd be the easiest prey they ever ate. Staying in the indestructible city was the only way to stay safe. Undauntable knew that was true. He was terrified for Wren all the time. Every time he heard a dragon overhead, he wondered if it had Wren in its claws. It made no logical sense to him that she'd survived all these years out there. It made even less sense that she would choose that life instead of safety with him. He heard movement behind him and turned to see his father entering the throne room with his usual entourage of counselors and sycophants. The invincible lord spotted Undauntable and beckoned imperiously. Undauntable sighed and took off his helmet. He knew his hair must be slick and disheveled and that his father was judging his appearance as he approached. The lord looked perfect. As always, each dark hair combed into a thick royal mane, rings on every long, thin finger, ruby red robes without a wrinkle in sight. They reached the throne in the center of the room at the same time, and Undauntable made a polite bow. Father, he said. Sit with me, boy, his father said, indicating one of the stools beside the throne. Apparently we have a visitor with a story worth hearing. Undauntable unbuckled the spiked jacket with some difficulty and handed it and the helmet to one of the servants, trying not to gasp for air as it came off. His own pale orange robes were crumpled and damp, but he smoothed them out as best he could as he sat down. Even when I'm not perfect, I have something no one else has, he reminded himself. No one else in the indestructible city wore dragon scales like the ones embedded in his earring, rings, and necklace. Wren's scales were completely unique. They made him special. Even when he felt alone and awkward and out of place and convinced that everyone hated him. The Lord seated himself on the throne in a swirl of scarlet robes and nodded to the guards by the door. Undauntable squinted at the man who strode into the room, all big shoulders and crooked teeth and rugged streaks of dirt everywhere. He had the aura of someone who would cheerfully kick anyone in the face for money. A mercenary, undauntable guest. Your invincible lordship, the man said grandly, bowing until his forehead nearly touched the floor. Bore, said undauntable's father. And it took undauntable a moment to realize he was saying the man's name, not commenting on how dull he was. Welcome back. How was the City of Valor? Very illuminating, sir. But nothing like as great as your city, of course. It was quite easy to get close to the Dragon Slayer. He was willing to hire anyone who'd promised to protect him from you. Father rubbed his chin and frowned. And what have you learned? Did you plant the stories I told you to? He asked. Is he coming here at last? Much more interesting news than that, sir, said Bor. As the Invincible Lord scowled, he hurried on. There was an incident in Valor, my lord. The Dragon Slayer is no longer in charge. In fact, 
he admitted in front of the entire town that he never killed that dragon after all. What? Undauntable could sense a new, simmering rage building under his father's skin. But there was a dead dragon. The last two spies said he has its tail. He does. But it turns out it was his brother who did the slaying, said Bor. But that one's a lost cause, your great and powerful lordship. And the dragon slayer has been utterly disgraced. Neither one is the hero you're looking for. Have you come to tell me that you are? Father said with enormous disdain. No, no, Bor raised his hands. That's not the interesting part of the story, my lord. The interesting part is that the dragon slayer confessed his lies because a dragon showed up in valor and demanded the treasure back. Demanded what? The lord growled. How could a dragon say anything? He didn't, exactly. But he had someone with him. Bor paused for dramatic effect. The room was deathly silent everyone listening with wide-eyed fascination. The dragon was working with a girl. A girl, the invincible lord snorted with disgust. Impossible. This girl was riding the dragon, Bor insisted. I saw it with my own two eyes. She stood up there on his shoulder, and she didn't say a word. But you could tell, she was the one who understood the dragon. She was the one who really brought the message. She made him roar when she wanted to. She told him when to leave, with the treasure, mind you. There is a girl, sir, who can control dragons. The Invincible Lord stared at him for a long moment. Undauntable tried to study his father's face without staring too obviously. It looked as though wheels were spinning in his mind gears clicking into place. Undauntable knew he was already figuring out how to use this to his benefit. Where is this girl now? He said in a smooth, silky voice. She left with the dragon, Bor answered. But she's out there, sir. She's the one you want. And she can't be too hard to find if she sticks with that dragon. I ain't never seen one that color before. It was a kind of light orange, like the mountain dragons, but all washed out. A shock, like lightning, ran through Undauntable's veins. Pale orange scales. A girl who rides a dragon. If there was anyone in the world he could imagine riding a dragon, it was Wren. Had she been bringing him scales from her very own dragon all these years? Hadn't she been nine when he met her? Had she had her own dragon? When she was nine years old? And could she really control them? He suddenly realized, with a cold, creeping feeling, that his father was staring at him. Everybody out, said the invincible lord. Boar, good work, and don't go far. I want every detail of this story. Undauntable stood, hoping to escape with the rest of the people in the room but his father caught his arm. You, stay. Undauntable could feel his heartbeat, like a panicked rabbit in his wrist. He was afraid his father could feel it too, thrumming through the fingers pressed into his skin. I can't tell him about her. I don't want him to take Ren away from me. But wouldn't he be thrilled? Wouldn't he be pleased that I could finally be of some use to him? that after all this time of doing nothing, it turns out I could bring him the one person he wants now. He looked into his father's cold, predatory eyes. This would finally make me the son he truly wants. And yet, when he tried to imagine what would happen to Wren in his father's power, his heart felt like it was shrinking into a little iron pellet. Wren would hate being father's puppet. She'd hate being trapped here or working for him. She'd hate me for giving her to him. And he would crush her. Ren was sunlight and wind and far-off horizons. She was claws and wings and bursts of flame. She was everything the indestructible city was not.
That's why I love her, he admitted to himself. Undauntable, his father said in his icy voice. The room was empty now, except for the two of them. That man described a dragon whose scales seem to match the ones you wear. I think it's time you told me where you've been getting them. His fingers tightened mercilessly on Undauntable's arm, cutting off the circulation so Undauntable's hand felt numb. An old woman, Undauntable blurted. I met her once in the market a long time ago. She had a small bag full of the scales, so I bought them all, because I didn't want anyone else to have them. I've just been adding them to my jewels one at a time for, for effect, because you said st style was partly about timing and... Stop sniveling, his father snapped. Undauntable fell silent. The Lord regarded him for a long, hooded moment. You're lying, he said at last. You're terrible at it. Undauntable had thought that was a rather good lie, actually, considering he'd only had a moment to think of it. I'm sorry, Wren. I'll try to protect you as long as I can. I will find this girl hissed the invincible lord, and Undauntable felt a stab of fear for Wren. I will find her, and her dragon, or dragons, if Bor's theory is correct. You can be of use to me, or you can be a stupid waste of space, as usual. But either way, one day I will control the girl who controls dragons, and then, then the whole world will be mine at last. A Wing Watcher's Guide to Dragons Night Dragons Description Purplish black scales and scattered silver scales on the underside of their wings, like a night sky full of stars, forked black tongues. Abilities Can breathe fire, disappear into dark shadows. Habitat Unknown Watch out for these rarely seen dragons could be mutations of other types or nearly extinct species, probably not very important. Desert dragons. Description. Pale gold or white scales the color of desert sand, forked black tongues. Abilities. Can survive a long time without water. Poison prey with the tips of their tails like scorpions. Bury themselves for camouflage in the desert sand, Breathe fire. Habitat, the vast desert west of the forest. Watch out for. Their venomous barbed tails, their teeth, claws, fire. Swamp dragons. Description, thick armored brown scales, sometimes with amber and gold underscales. Large, flat heads with nostrils on top of the snout. Abilities, can breathe fire. Hold their breath for up to an hour. Blend into large mud puddles. Habitat. The swamps, marshes, and boiling mud pools between the mountains and the sea. Watch out for. Often found hiding under the mud. Also, their teeth, claws, fire, the usual. Mountain dragons. Description. Red, gold, or orange scales. Enormous wings. Abilities, powerful fighters and flyers, can breathe fire. Habitat, the central mountain range. Watch out for the way they swoop out of nowhere at top speed. Also, their teeth, claws, fire. Sea dragons. Description, blue or green or aquamarine scales, webs between their claws, gills on their necks, glow-in-the-dark stripes on their tails, snouts, underbellies. Abilities can breathe underwater, create huge waves with one splash of their powerful tails. Habitat, the ocean, but possibly also large lakes and rivers. Watch out for swimming in any large body of water. Also, of course, their teeth and claws, but on the plus side, no fire. Ice dragons. Description. Silvery scales like the moon or pale blue like ice. Ridged claws to grip the ice. Forked blue tongues. Tails narrowed to a whip-thin end. Abilities. K-9 
can withstand sub-zero temperatures and bright light, exhale a deadly freezing frost breath. Habitat. The icy Arctic region of the upper northwest peninsula, we think. Watch out for their breath, which can freeze a human solid. Also, their teeth and claws. Rainforest dragons. Description. Scales that can shift colors, usually bright like birds of paradise. Prehensile tails. Abilities. Can camouflage their scales to blend into their surroundings. Rumor has it, they can also shoot venom from their fangs. Habitat. The mysterious, impenetrable rainforest east of the mountains. Watch out for, we have no idea. No recorded survivor encounters, so they're probably the deadliest and stealthiest of all dragons. This is Shannon McManus. We hope that you have enjoyed this production of Wings of Fire, Legends, Dragon Slayer by Tui T. Sutherland. This audiobook was produced by Dion Audio and directed by Idris Wardell. Executive producer, Melanie Gagne. Print edition published by Scholastic Press, an imprint of Scholastic Inc. Text copyright 2020 by Tui T. Sutherland. Production copyright 2020 by Scholastic Inc. All rights reserved.